Chapter 1 of Palos of the Dog Star Pack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Palos of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Giese. Out of the Storm. It was a miserable night which brought me first in touch with Jason Croft. There was a rain and enough wind to send it in gusty dashes against the windows. It was the sort of a night when I always felt glad to cast off coat and shoes, don a robe and slippers, and sit down with the curtains drawn, a lighted pipe, and the soft glow of a lamp falling across the pages of my book. I am, I admit, always strangely susceptible to the shut-in sense of comfort afforded by a pipe, the steady yellow of a light and the magic of printed lines at a time of elemental turmoil and stress. It was with a feeling little short of positive annoyance that I heard the doorbell ring. Indeed, I confess, I was tempted to ignore it altogether at first, but as it rang again and was followed by a rapid tattoo of rapping as a fists pounded against the door itself, I rose, laid aside my book, and stepped into the hall. First, switching on a porch light, I opened the outer door to reveal the figure of an old woman, somewhat stooping, her head covered by a shawl, which sloped wetly from her head to either shoulder and was caught and held beneath her chin by one bony hand. Doctor, she began in a tone of almost frantic excitement. Doctor Murray, come quick. Perhaps I may as well introduce myself here as anywhere else. I am Dr. George Murray, still as at the time of which I write, in charge of the state mental hospital in a western state. The institution was not then very large, and since taking my position at the head of its staff, I had found myself with considerable time for my study along the lines of human psychology and the various powers and aberrations of the mind. Also, I may as well confess, as a first step toward a better understanding of my part in what followed, that for years before coming to the asylum I had delved more or less deeply into such studies, seeking to learn what I might concerning both the normal and the abnormal manifestations of mental force. There is good reading and highly entertaining, I assure you, in the various philosophies dealing with life, religion, and the several beliefs regarding the soul of man. I was therefore fairly conversant not only with the Occidental creeds, but with those of the Oriental races as well. And I knew that certain of the Eastern sects had advanced in their knowledge far beyond our Western world. I had even endeavored to make their knowledge mine, so far as I could, in certain lines at least, and had from time to time applied some of that knowledge to the treatment of cases in the institution of which I was the head. But I was not thinking of anything like that as I looked at the shawl-wrapped face of the little bent woman, wrinkled and wry enough to have been a very part of the storm which beat about her and blew back the skirts of my lounging robe and chilled my ankles. I lived in a residence detached from the asylum buildings proper, but nonetheless a part of the institution, and as a matter of fact, my sole thought was a feeling of surprise that any one should have come here to find me, and despite the woman's manifest state of anxiety and haste, a decided reluctance to go with her quickly or otherwise on such a night. I rather temporized. But, my dear woman, surely there are other doctors for you to call. I am really not in general practice. I am connected with the asylum. And that is the very reason I always said I would come for you if anything happened to Mr. Jason, she cut in. Whom? I inquired interested in spite of myself at this plainly premeditated demand for my service. Mr. Jason Croft, sir, she returned. He's dead, maybe, I don't know, but he's been that way for a week. Dead, I exclaimed, in almost an involuntary fashion, startled by her words. Dead or asleep, I don't know which. Clearly there was something here I wasn't getting into fully, and my interest aroused. The whole affair seemed to be taking on an atmosphere of the peculiar, and it was equally clear that the gusty doorway was no place to talk. Come in, I said. What is your name? Goss, said she, without making any move to enter. I'm housekeeper for Mr. Jason, but I'll not be coming in unless you say you'll go. 
Then come in without any more delay, I replied, making up my mind. I knew Croft in a way, by sight at least. He was a big fellow with light hair and a splendid physique, who had been pointed out to me shortly after my arrival. Once I had even got close enough to the man to look into his eyes. They were gray and held a peculiar something in their gaze which had arrested my attention at once. Jason Croft had the eyes of a mystic, of a student of those very things I myself had studied more or less. They were the eyes of one who saw deeper than the mere objective surface of life and the old woman's words at the last had waked up my interest in no uncertain degree. I had decided I would go with her to Croft's house, which was not very far down the street, and see, if I might, for myself, just what had occurred to send her rushing to me through the night. I gave her a seat, said I would get on my shoes and coat, and went back into the room I had left some moments before. There I dressed quickly for my venture into the storm, adding a raincoat to my other attire and was back in the hall inside five minutes at most. We set out at once, emerging into the wind-driven rain, my long raincoat flapping about my legs and the little old woman tottering along at my side. And what with the rain, the wind, and the unexpected summons, I found myself in a rather strange frame of mind. The whole thing seemed more like some story I had read than a happening of real life particularly so as my companion kept pace with me and uttered no sound save at times a rather rasping sort of breath. The whole thing became an almost eerie experience as we hastened down the storm-swept street. Then we turned in at a gate and went up toward the large house I knew to be Crofts, and the little old woman unlocked a heavy front door and led me into a hall. It was a most unusual hall, too, its walls draped with rare tapestries and rugs, its floor covered with other rugs such as I had never seen outside private collections, lighted by a hammered brass lantern through the pierced sides of which the rays of an electric light shone forth. Across the hall she scuttered, still in evident haste, and flung open a door to permit me to enter a room which was plainly a study. It was lined with cases of books, furnished richly yet plainly with chairs, a heavy desk, and a broad couch, on which I saw in one swift glance the stretched-out body of Croft himself. He lay wholly relaxed, like one sunk in heavy sleep, his eyelids closed, his arms and hands dropped limply at his sides, but with no visible sign of respiration animating his deep, full chest. Toward him the little woman gestured with a hand, and stood watching, still with her wet shawl about her head and shoulders, while I approached and bent over the man. I touched his face and found it cold. My fingers sought his pulse and failed to find it at all. But his body was limp as I lifted an arm and dropped it. There was no rigor, yet there was no evidence of decay, such as must follow once rigor has passed away. I had brought instruments with me as a matter of course, I took them from my pocket and listened for some sound from the heart. I thought I found the barest flutter, but I wasn't sure. I tested the tension of the eyeball under the closed lids and found it firm. I straightened and turned to face the little old woman. Dead, sir? She asked in a sibilant whisper. Her eyes were wide in their sockets. They stared into mine. I shook my head. He doesn't appear to be dead. I replied. See here, Mrs. Goss, what did you mean by saying he ought to have been back three days ago? What do you mean by back? She fingered at her lips with one bony hand. Why, awake, sir, she said at last. Then why didn't you say so, I snapped. Why use the word back? Because, sir, she faltered, that's what he says when he wakes up. Well, Mary, I'm back. I I guess I just said it because he does, Doctor. I w was worried when he didn't come back, when he didn't wake up tonight, and it took to rain, and I reckon maybe it was the storm scared me, sir. Her words had, however, given me a clue. He's been like this before, then? Yes, sir, but never more than four days without telling me he would. The first time was months ago, 
but it's been getting oftener and oftener till now all his sleeps are like this. He told me not to be scared and to to never bother about him, to, to just let him alone, but I guess I was scared tonight when it begun to storm and him laying there like that. It was like having a corpse in the house. I began to gain a fuller appreciation of the situation. I myself had seen people in a cataleptic condition, had even induced the state in subjects myself, and it appeared to me that Jason Croft was in a similar state, no matter how induced. What does your employer do? I asked. He studies, sir, just studies things like that. Mrs. Goss gestured at the cases of books. He don't have to work, you know. His uncle left him rich. I followed her arm as she swept it about the glass-fronted cases. I brought my glances back to the desk in the center of the room, between the woman and myself as we stood. Upon it, I spied another volume lying open. It was unlike any book I had ever seen, yellowed with age. In fact, not a book at all, but a series of parchment pages tied together with bits of silken cord. I took the thing up and found the open pages covered with marginal notes in English, although the original was plainly in Sanskrit, an ancient language I had seen before, but was wholly unable to read. The notations, however, threw some light into my mind, and as I read them, I forgot the storm, the little old woman, everything, save what I read and the bearing it held on the man behind me on the couch. I felt sure they had been written by his own hand, and they bore on the subject of astral projection, the ability of the soul to separate itself or be separated from the physical body and return to its fleshy husk again at will. I finished the open pages and turned to others. The notations were still present wherever I looked. At last, I turned to the very front and found that the manuscript was by Ahmed, an occult adept of Hindustan, who lived somewhere in the second or third century of the Christian era. With a strange sensation, I laid down the silk-bound pages. They were very, very old. Over a thousand years had come and passed since they were written by the dead Amun's hand. Yet I had held them tonight, and I felt sure Jason Croft had held them often, read them and understood them, and that the condition in which I found him this night was in some way subtly connected with their store of ancient lore. And suddenly I sensed the storm and the little old woman and the silent body of the man at my back again with a feeling of something uncanny in the whole affair. You can do nothing for him, the woman broke my introspection. I looked up and into her eyes, dark and bright and questioning as she stood, still clutching her damp shawl. I'm not so sure of that, I said. But Mr. Croft's condition is rather peculiar. Whatever I do will require quiet, that I am alone with him for some time. I think if I can be left here with him for possibly an hour, I can bring him back. I paused abruptly. I had used the woman's former words almost. And I saw she noticed the fact, for a slight smile gathered on her faded lips. She nodded. You'll bring him back, she said. Mind you, doctor, the trouble is with Mr. Jason's head, I've been thinking. Twas for that I've been telling myself I would come for you if he forgot to come back some time like I've been afraid he would. You did quite right, I agreed. But the trouble is not with Mr. Croft's mind. In fact, Mrs. Goss, I believe he is a very learned man. How long have you known him, may I ask? Ever since he was a boy except when he was traveling, she returned. He has traveled? I took her up. Yes, sir, a lot. Me and my husband kept up the place while he was gone. I see, I said. And now, if you will let me try what I can do. Yes, sir, I'll sit out in the hall. She agreed and turned in her rapid putter from the room. Left alone, I took a chair, dragged it to the side of the couch, and studied my man. So far as I could judge, he was at least six feet tall and correspondingly built. His hair was heavy, almost tawny, and as I knew, his eyes were gray. The whole contour of his head and features showed what appeared to me remarkable intelligence and strength, 
the nose finely chiseled, the mouth well-formed and firm, the chin unmistakably strong. That Croft was an unusual character I felt more and more as I sat there. His very condition, which, from what I had learned from the little old woman and his own notation on the margins of Ahmed's writings, I believed self-induced, would certainly indicate that. But my own years of study had taught me no little of hypnosis, suggestion, and the various phases of the subconscious mind. I had developed no little power with various patients, or subjects, as a hypnotist calls them, who from time to time had submitted themselves to my control. Wherefore I felt that I knew about what to do to waken the sleeping objective mind of the man on the couch. I had asked for an hour, and the time had been granted. It behooved me to get to work. I began. I concentrated my mind to the exclusion of all else upon my task, sending a mental call to the soul of Jason Croft, wherever it might be, commanding it to return to the body it had temporarily quitted of its own volition, and once more animate it to a conscious life. I forgot the strangeness of the situation, the rattle of the rain against the glass panes of the room, and after a time I began speaking to the form beside which I sat, as to a conscious person, firmly repeating over and over my demand for the presence of Jason Croft, demanding it, nor letting myself doubt for a single instant that the demand would be given heed in time. It was a nerve-wracking task. In the end, it came to seem that I sat there and struggled against some intangible, invisible force which resisted all my efforts. I look back now on the time spent there that night as an ordeal such as I never desire to again attempt. But I did not desist. I had asked for an hour, because when I asked, I never dreamed the thing I had attempted, the thing which is yet to be related concerning the weird yet true narrative, as I fully believe, of Jason Croft. I had then no conception of how far his venturesome spirit had plumbed the universe. If I thought of him at all, it was merely as some experimenter who might have need of help, rather than as an adept of adepts who had transcended all human accomplishments in his line of research and thought. In my own blindness, I had fancied that his overlong period in his cataleptic trance might even be due to some inability on his part to reanimate his own body after leaving it where it lay. I thought of myself as possibly aiding him in the task by what I would do in the time for which I had asked. But the hour ran away, and another, and still the body over which I worked lay as it had lain at first, nor gave any sign of any effect of my concentrated will. It had been close to ten when I came to the house. It was three in the morning when I gained my first reward. And when it came, it was so sudden that I actually started back in my chair and sat clutching its carved arms and staring in something almost like horror, I think, at first at the body which had lifted itself to a sitting posture on the couch. And I know that when the man said, so you are the one who called me back. I actually gasped before I answered. <sighs> yes. Croft fastened his eyes upon me in a steady regard. You are Dr. Murray from the mental hospital, are you not? He went on. Yes, I stammered again. Mrs. Goss had said his sleep was like having a corpse about the house. I found myself thinking this was nearly as though a corpse should rise up and speak. But he nodded with the barest smile on his lips. Only one acquainted with the nature of my condition could have roused me, he said. However, you were engaging in a dangerous undertaking, friend. Dangerous for you, you mean, I rejoined. Do you know you have lain cataleptic for something like a week? Yes. He nodded again. But I was occupied on a most important mission. Occupied, I exclaimed. You mean you were engaged in some undertaking while you lay there? I pointed to the couch where he sat. Yes. Once more he smiled. Well, the man was sane. In fact, it seemed to me in those first few moments that he was far saner than I, far less excited, far less affected by the whole business from the first to last. In fact, 
he seemed quite calm and a trifle amused, while I was admittedly upset. And my very knowledge gained by years of study told me he was sane, that his was a perfectly balanced brain. There was nothing about him to even hint at anything else, save his extraordinary words. In the end, I continued with a question. Where? On the planet Palos, one of the dog star pack, a star in the system of the sun Sirius, he replied. And you mean you have just returned from there? I faltered over the last word badly. My brain seemed slightly dazed at the astounding statement he had made, that I, I had called him from a planet beyond the ken of the naked eye, known only to those who studied the heavens with powerful glasses, farther away than any star of our own earthly system of planets. The thing made my senses real. And he seemed to sense my emotions because he went on in a softly modulated tone. Do not think me in any way similar to those unfortunates under your charge. As an alienist, you must know the truth of that, just as you knew that my trance-like sleep was wholly self-induced. I gathered that from the volume on your desk, I explained. He glanced toward Ahmed's work. You read the Sanskrit? He inquired. I shook my head. No, I read the marginal notes. I see. Who called you here? I explained. Croft frowned. I cannot blame her. She is a faithful soul, he remarked. I can comprehend her worry. I have explained to her as fully as I dared, but she does not understand, and I remained away longer than I really intended to tell the truth. However, now that you can reassure her, I must ask you to excuse me, doctor, for a while. Come to me in about twelve hours, and I will be here to meet you and explain in part at least. He stretched himself out once more on the couch. Wait, I cried. What are you going to do? I am going back to Palos, he told me with a smile. But will your body stand the strain? I questioned, beginning to doubt his sanity after all. He met my objection with another smile. I have studied that well before I began these little excursions of mine. Meet me at, say, four o'clock this afternoon. He appeared to relax, sighed softly, and sank again into his trance. I sprang up and stood looking down upon him. I hardly knew what to do. I began pacing the floor. Finally, I gave my attention to the books and the cases which lined the room. They comprised the most wonderful collection of works on the occult ever gathered within four walls. They helped me to make up my mind in the end. I decided to take Jason Croft at his word and keep the engagement for the coming afternoon. I went to the study door and set it open. The little old woman sat huddled on a chair. At first I thought she slept, but almost at once I found her bright eyes upon me, and she started to her feet. He came back. I, I heard him speaking, she began in a husky whisper. He, is he all right? All right, I replied, but he is asleep again now and has promised to see me this afternoon at four. In the meantime, do not attempt to disturb him in any way, Mrs. Goss. She nodded. Suddenly, she seemed wholly satisfied. I won't, sir, she gave her promise. I was worried, worried, that was all. You need not worry any more, I sought to reassure her. I fancy Mr. Croft is able to take care of himself. And oddly enough, I found myself believing my own words as I went down the steps and turned toward my own home to get what sleep I could, since, to tell the truth, I felt utterly exhausted after my efforts to call Jason Croft back from the planet of a distant sun. End of chapter one. Read by Marns 007, Chicago, May 2022. Chapter two of Palos of the Dog Star Pack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Pelos of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Giese, A Country in the Clouds. And yet, when I woke in the morning and went about my duties at the asylum, I confess the events of the night before seemed rather unreal. I began to half fancy myself the victim of some sort of hoax. I did not doubt that Croft had been up to some psychic experiment when his old servant, Mrs. Goss, had become alarmed and brought me into the situation. But I felt inclined to believe that after I had waked him from his self-induced trance, he had deliberately turned the conversation into a channel which would give me a mental jolt before he had calmly gone back to sleep. I knew something of the occult, of course, but I was hardly ready to credit the rather lurid statement he had made. Before noon, I was smiling at myself and determining to keep my appointment with him for the afternoon and show him from the start that I was not so complete a fool as I had seemed. Hence, it was with a resolve not to be swept off my feet by any unusual fabrication of his devising that I approached his house at about three o'clock and turned in from the street to his porch. He sat there in a wicker chair, smoking an excellent cigar. No doubt, but he had recovered completely from the state in which I had beheld him first. He rose as I mounted the steps and put out a hand. Ah, Dr. Murray, he greeted me with a smile. I have been waiting your coming. Let me offer you a chair and a smoke while we talk. We shook hands, and then I sat down and lighted the mate of the cigar Croft held between his strong, even teeth. Then, as I threw away the match, I looked straight into his eyes. And believe me or not, it was as though the man read my thoughts. He shook his head. I really told you the truth, Murray, you know, he said. About Pelos? I smiled. He nodded. Yes, I was really there, and I went back after we had our talk. Rather quick work, I remarked and puffed out some smoke. Have you figured out how long it takes even light to reach the earth from that distant star, Mr. Croft? Light? He half knit his brows, then suddenly laughed without sound. Oh, I see. You refer to the equation of time. Well, yes, the distance is considerable, as you must admit. He shook his head. How long does it take you to think of Pelos, of Sirius? He asked. Not long, I replied. He leaned back in his seat. Murray, he went on, staring straight before him. Time is but the measure of consciousness. Outside the atmospheric envelopes of the planets, outside the limit of, well, say, human thought, time ceases to exist. And if between the planets there is no time beyond the depths of their surrounding atmosphere... How long will it take to go from here to there? I stared. His statement was startling, at least. You mean that time is a mental conception? I managed at last. Time is a mental measure of a span of eternity, he said slowly. Past planetary atmospheres, eternity alone exists. In eternity there is no time. Hence, I cannot use what is not, either in going to or returning from, that planet I have named. You admit you can think instantly of Pelos. I allege that I can think myself, carry my astral consciousness instantly to Pelos. Do you see? I saw what he meant, of course, and I indicated as much by a nod. But, I objected. You told me you had to return to Pelos. Now you tell me you had projected your astral body to that star. What could you do there in the astral state? He smiled. Very little. I know. I have passed through that stage. As a matter of fact, I have a body there now. You have what? As I remember, I came half out of my chair and then sank back. The thing hit me as nothing else in my whole life had done before. His calm avowal was unbelievable on its face. Impossible. A man with a double corporeal existence on two separate planets at one and the same time. 
A body. A living, breathing body. He repeated his declaration. Oh, man. I know it overthrows all human conceptions of life, but last night you asked me a question concerning this body of mine, and I told you I knew what I was doing. And I know you must have studied some of the teachings of the higher cult, the esoteric philosophies, if you will, and therefore you must have read of the ability of a spirit to dispossess a body of its original spiritual tenant and occupy its place. Obsession, I interrupted. You are practicing that up there? No, I've gone farther than that. I took this body when its original occupant was done with it, he said. Murray, wait, let me explain. I'm a physician like yourself. You? I exclaimed, none too politely, I fear, in the face of this additional surprise. Croft's lips twitched. He seemed to understand, and yet be slightly amused. Yes, that's why I was able to assure you I knew how long the body I occupy now could endure a cataleptic condition last night. I am a graduate of Rush, and I fancy fully qualified to speak concerning the body's needs, and... He paused a moment, then resumed. Frankly, Murray, I find myself confronted by what I think I may call the strangest position a man was ever called upon to face. Last night, I recognized in you one who had probably far from a minor understanding of mental and spiritual forces. Your ability to force my return at a time when I was otherwise engaged showed me your understanding. For that very reason, I asked you to return to me here today. I would like to talk to you, a brother physician, to tell you a story, my story, provided you would care to hear it. Most men would call me insane. Something tells me you, who devote your time to the care of the insane, will not. He paused and sat once more, staring across the sunlit landscape which, after the storm of the night before, was glowing and fresh. After a time, he turned his eyes and looked into mine with something almost an appeal in his glance. In response, I nodded and settled myself in my chair. I'm not going to deny a natural curiosity, Dr. Croft, I said, since, to tell the absolute truth, I was anxious to get at the inward facts underlying the entire peculiar affair. Then he said, in an almost eager fashion. I shall tell you the whole thing, I think. Murray, when Shakespeare wrote into one of his characters' mouth the statement that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of, he told the truth. Mankind, in the main, is like a crowd storming the doors of a show house sold out to capacity and unable to accommodate anyone else. Mankind is the crowd in the lobby, shut out from the real sights back of the veiling doors which bar their perception of what goes on within. Mankind stands only on the fringe of life, does not dream of the truth. Only here and there is there one who knows. It was one such who first directed my mind toward the truth. Murray. He paused and once more fastened me with his gaze. I am going to tell that truth to you. But first, in order that you may understand and believe if you can, I shall tell you something of myself. That telling took a long time, hours, the rest of the afternoon, and most of the following night. It was a strange tale, an unbelievably strange story. And yet, in view of what happened inside that same week, I am not sure, after all, but it was the truth, just as Croft alleged. What, when all is said, do any of us know beyond the round of our own human life? What do we know of those things which may lie outside the scope of our mental vision? There must be things in heaven and earth not dreamt of in the philosophy of Horatio. Here is the tale. Jason Croft was born in New Jersey, but brought west at an early age by his parents, who had become converts to a certain faith. Right there, it seems to me, may have been laid the foundation of Croft's interest in the occult in later life, since that faith contains possibly a greater number of parallels to occult teachings than any of the Occidental creeds. 
Of course, in all religions, there is the germ of truth. Were it not, they would be dead dogmas rather than living sects. But in this church, which has grown strong in the Western states, I think there is a closer approach to the Eastern theory of soul and spiritual life. Be that as it may, Croft grew to manhood in the very state and town where I was now employed, and in the home on the porch of which we sat. He elected medicine as a career. He went to Chicago and put in his first three years. The second year, his mother died, and a year later, his father. He returned on each occasion and went back to his studies after the obsequies were done. In his fourth year, he met a man named Gatua Kahan, destined, as it seems, to change the entire course of his life. Gatua Kahan was a Hindu, a member of an Eastern Brotherhood, come to the United States to study the religions of the West. One can see how naturally he took up with Croft, who had been raised in one of those religions. The two became friends. From what Croft told me, the Hindu was a man of marked attainments, well-versed in the Oriental creeds. When Croft came west after his graduation, Gatua Kahan was his companion and stopped at his home, which had been kept up by Mrs. Goss and her husband, then still alive. The two lived there together for some weeks, and the Hindu taught Croft the rudiments, at least, of the occult philosophy of life. Then, with little warning, Croft was assigned on a mission to Australia by his church. He got a letter from Box B, as he told me, smiling, knowing I would understand. The church of which he was a member has a custom of sending their members about the world as missionaries of their faith to spread its doctrines and win converts to their ranks. Croft went, though even then he had begun to see the similarity between his own lifelong creed and the scheme of things held before him by Gatua Kahan. For over two years he did not see the Hindu, though he kept up his studies of the occult, to which he seemed inclined by a natural bent. Then, just as he was nearly finished with his mission, what should happen but that, walking the streets of Melbourne, he bumped into Gatua Kahan. The two men renewed their acquaintance at once. Gatua Kahan taught Croft, Hindustani, and the mysteries of the Sanskrit tongue. When Croft's mission was finished, he prevailed upon him to visit India before returning home. Croft went. Through Gatua's influence, he was admitted to the man's own brotherhood. He forgot his former objects and aims in life in the new world of thought which opened up before his mental eyes. He studied and thought. He learned the secrets of the magnetic or enveloping body of the soul, and after a time he became convinced that by constant application to the major purpose, the spirit could break the bonds of the material body without going through the change which men call death. He came to believe that beyond the phenomenon of astral projection, the sending of the conscious ego about the earthly sphere, projections might be made beyond the planet with only the universe to limit the scope of the flight. At times, he lay staring at the starry vault of the heavens with a vague longing within him to put the thing to the test. And always there was one star which seemed to call him, to beckon to him, to draw his spirit toward it as a magnet may draw a fleck of iron. That was the dog star, Sirius, known to astronomers as the sun of another planetary system like our own. Meantime, his studies went on. He learned that matter is the reflex of spirit, that no blade of grass, no chemical atom exists, save as the envelope of an essence which cannot and does not die. He came to see that nature is no more than a realm of force, comprising light, heat, magnetism, chemical affinity, aura, essence, and all the imponderables which go to produce the various forms of motion as expressions of the ocean of force, so that motion comes to be no more than force refracted through the various forms of existence, from the lowest to the highest, as a ray of light is split into the seven primary colors by a prism, each being different in itself, yet each but an integral part of the original ray. He came to comprehend that all stages of existence are but stages and nothing more, and that mind, spirit, is the highest form of life force, the true essence, 
manifesting through material means, yet independent of them in itself. So only, he argued, was life after death a possible thing. And so, he reasoned further, could the mystery be solved. There was no real reason why the spirit could not be set free to roam and return to the body at will. If that were true, it seemed to him that the spirit could return from such excursions, bringing with it a conscious recollection of the place where it had been. Then, once more, he was called home by a thing which seems like no more than a further step in the course of what mortals call fate. His father's brother died. He was a bachelor. He left Croft sufficient wealth to provide for his every need. Croft decided to pursue his studies at home. He had gained all India could give him. Indeed, he had rather startled even Gatua Kahan by some of the theories he had deduced. He began work at once. He stocked the library where I had found him the night before, with everything on the subject he could find. And the more he studied, the more firmly did he become convinced that ordinary astral projection was but the first step in developing the spirit's power that it was akin to the first step of an infant learning to walk, and that, if confidence were forthcoming, if the will to dare the experiment were sufficiently strong, then he could accomplish the thing of which he dreamed. He began to experiment, sending his astral consciousness here and there. He centered on that one phase of his knowledge alone. He roamed the earth at will. He perfected his ability to bring back from such excursions a vivid recollection of all he had seen. So at last he was ready for the great experiment, yet in the end he made it on impulse rather than at any preselected time. He sat one evening on his porch. Over the eastern mountains which hem in the valley, the full moon was rising in a blaze of mellow glory. Its rays caught the sleeping surface of a lake which lies near our little city touching each rippling wavelet until they seemed made of molten silver. The lights of the town itself were like fireflies twinkling amid the trees. The mountains hazed somewhat in a silvery mist, compounded of the moon rays and distance, seemed to him no more than the figments of a fairy tale or a dream. Everything was quiet. Mrs. Goss, now a widow, had gone to bed and Croft had simply been enjoying the soft air and a cigar. Suddenly, as the moon appeared to leap free of the mountains, it suggested a thought of a spirit set free and rising above the material shell of existence to his mind. He sat watching the golden wheel radiant with reflected light, and after a time he asked himself why he should not try the great adventure without a longer delay. He was the last of his race. No one depended upon him. Should he fail, they would merely find his body in the chair. Should he succeed, he would have won his ambition and placed himself in a position to learn of things which had heretofore baffled man. He decided to try it there and then. Knocking the ash from his cigar, he took one last long, possibly farewell whiff and laid it down on the broad arm of his chair. Then, summoning all the potent power of his will, he fixed his whole mind upon his purpose and sank into cataleptic sleep. The moon is dead. In so much, science is right. It is lifeless, without moisture, without an atmosphere. Croft won his great experiment, or its first step at least. His body sank to sleep, but his ego leaped into a fuller, wider life. There was a sensation of airy lightness, as though his sublimated consciousness had dropped material weight. His body sat beneath him in the chair. He could see it. He could see the city and the lake and the mountains and the yellow disk of the moon. He knew he was rising toward the ladder swiftly. Then space was annihilated in an instant, and he seemed to himself to be standing on the topmost edge of a mighty crater in the full, unobstructed glare of a blinding light. He sensed that as the sun, which hung like a ball of fire halfway up from the horizon, flinging its rays in a dazzling brilliance against the dead satellite's surface, unprotected by an atmospheric scream. His first sensation was an amazing realization of his own success. Then he gazed about. 
To one side was the vast ring of the crater itself, a well of unutterable darkness and unplumbed depth, as yet not opened up to the burning light of the sun. To the other was the downward sweep of the crater's flank, done, dead, wrinkled, seamed, and seared by the stabbing rays which bathed it in pitiless light. And beyond the foot of the crater was a vast irregular plain, lower in the center as though eons past it might have been the bed of some vanished sea. About the plain were the crests of barren mountains, crags, pinnacles, misshapen and weird beyond thought. Yes, the moon is dead now, but there was life upon it once. Croft willed himself down from the lip of the crater to the plain. He moved about it. Indeed, it had been a sea. There, in the airless blaze, still etched in the lifeless formations, he found an ancient water line, the mark of the fingers of vanished waters, like a mockery of what had been. And skirting the outline of that long-lost sea, he came to the ruin of a city which had stood upon the shores a myriad years ago. It stood there still, a thing of paved streets and dead walls, safe in that moistureless world from decay. Through those dead streets and houses, some of them thrown down by terrific earthquakes which he judged had accompanied the final cooling stages and death of the moon, Croft took his way, pausing now and then to examine some ancient inscriptions cut into the blocks of stone from which the buildings had been reared. In a way they impressed him as similar in many respects to the Asiatic structures of today, most of them being windowless on the first story, but built about an inner court, gardens of beauty in the time when the moon supported life. So far as he could judge from the buildings themselves and frescoes on the walls, done in pigments which still prevailed, the Lunarians had been a tiny people, probably not above an average of four feet in height, but extremely intelligent past any doubt, as shown by the remains of their homes. They had possessed rather large heads in proportion to their slender bodies, as the paintings done on the inside walls led Croft to believe. From the same source, he became convinced that their social life had been highly developed and that they had been well-versed in the arts of manufacture and commerce and had at the time when lunar seas persisted maintained a merchant marine. Through the hours of the lunar day he explored, not, in fact, until the sun was dropping swiftly below the rim of the mountains beyond the old seabed did he desist. Then, lifting his eyes, he beheld a luminous crescent, many times larger than the moon appears to us, emitting a soft green light. He stood and gazed upon it for some moment before he realized fully that he looked upon a sunrise on the earth, that the monster crescent was the earth indeed as seen from her satellite. Then, as realization came upon him, he remembered his body, left on the porch of his home in the chair. Suddenly he felt a longing to return, to forsake the forsaken relics of a life which had passed and go back to the full, pulsing tide of life which still flowed on. Here, then, he was faced by the second step of his experiment. He had consciously reached the moon. Could he return again to the earth? If so, he had proved his theory beyond any further doubt. Fastening his full power upon the endeavor, he willed himself back and... He opened his eyes, his physical eyes, and gazed into the early sun of a new day rising over the mountains and turning the world to emerald and gold. The sound of a caught-in breath fell on his ears. He turned his glance. Mrs. Goss stood beside him. Hello, sir, but you sound asleep, she exclaimed. I come to call you to breakfast and you wasn't in your room, and when I found you, you was sleeping like the dead. You must have got up awful early, Mr. Jason. I was here before you were moving, Croft said as he rose. He smiled as he spoke. Indeed, he wanted to laugh, to shout. He had done what no mortal had ever accomplished before. The wonders of the universe were his to explore at will. Yet even so, he did not dream of what the future held. 
End of chapter two. Read by Marnes007, Chicago, May 2022. Chapter three of Palos of the Dog Star Pack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Palos of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Giese. Beyond the Moon. And now the Dog Star called. Croft had proved his ability to project his conscious self beyond Earth's attraction and return. And having proved that, the old lure of the star he had watched when a student in the Indian mountains came back with a double strength. No longer was it an occasional prompting. Rather, it was a never-ceasing urge which nagged him night and day. He yielded at last. But remembering his return from his first experiment, he arranged for the next with due care. In order that Mrs. Goss might not become alarmed by seeing his body entranced, he arranged for her to take a holiday with a married daughter in another part of the state, telling her simply that he himself expected to be absent from his home for an indefinite time and would summon her upon his return. He knew the woman well enough to be sure she would spread the word of his coming absence and so felt assured that his body would remain undisturbed during the period of his venture into universal space. Having seen the old woman depart, he entered the library, drew down all the blinds, and stretched himself on the couch. Fixing his mind on Sirius to the exclusion of everything else, he threw off the bonds of the flesh. Yet here, as it chanced, even Croft made a well-nigh fatal mistake. It was towards Sirius he had willed himself in his thoughts, and Sirius is a son. As a result, he realized none too soon that he was floating in the actual nebula surrounding the flaming orb itself. Directly beneath him, as it appeared, the dog star rolled, a mass of electric fire. Mountains of flame ran darting off into space in all directions. Between them, the whole surface of the sun boiled and bubbled and seethed like a worldwide cauldron. Not for a moment was there any rest upon that surface toward which he was sinking with incredible speed. Every atom of the monster sun was in motion, ever shifting, ever changing, yet always the same. It quivered and billowed and shook. Flames of every conceivable color radiated from it in waves of awful heat. Vast explosions recurred again and again on the ever-heaving surface. What seemed unthinkable hurricanes rushed into the voids created by the exploding gases. In this maelstrom of titanic forces, Croft found himself caught. Not even the wonderful force his spirit had attained could overcome the sun's power of repulsion. His progress stayed. He hung above the molten globe beneath him, imprisoned, unable to extricate himself from his position, buffeted, swirled about, and swayed by the irresistible forces which warred around him in a never-ceasing tumult such as he had never conceived. Something like a vague question as to his fate, rather than any fear, assailed him, something like a blind wonder. The force which held him was one beyond his experience or knowledge. He knew that a true spirit, a pure ego, could not wholly perish, yet now he asked himself, what would be the effect of close proximity to such an enormous center of elemental activity upon an ego not wholly sublimated, such as his? His willpower actually faltered, staggered. For the time being, he lost his ability to chose his course. He had willed himself here, and here he was, but he found himself unable to will himself back or anywhere else, in fact. The sensation crept through his soul that he was a plaything of fate, a mad ego which had ventured too far, dared too much, sought to learn those things possibly forbidden, hence caught in a net of universal law, woven about him by his own mad thirst for knowledge, a spirit doomed by its own daring to an eternity of something closely approaching the orthodox hell. Through eons of time, as it seemed to him, he hung above that blazing orb, surrounded by seething gases which dimmed but did not wholly obscure his vision. 
Then a change began taking place. A great spot of darkness appeared on the pulsing body of the sun. It widened swiftly. About it, the fiery elements of molten mass seemed to center their main endeavor. Vast streamers of flaming gas leaped and darted about its spreading center. It stretched and spread. To Croft's fascinated vision, it showed a mighty, funnel-like chasm, reaching down for thousands of miles into the very heart of their solar mass. And suddenly he knew that once more he was sinking, was being drawn down, down, to be engulfed in that terrible throat of the terrifying funnel, swept and sucked down like a bit of driftwood into the maw of a whirlpool, powerless to resist. Down he sank, down, between walls of living fire which swirled about him with an inconceivable velocity of revolution. The vapors which closed about him seemed to stifle even his spirit senses. Down, down, how far he had no conception. He had lost all control, all conscious power to judge of time or distance. Yet he was able still to see, and so at last he sensed that the fiery walls were coming swiftly together. For a wild instant, he conceived himself engulfed. Then he knew that he was being thrown out and upward again with terrific force, literally crowded forth with the outrushing gases between the collapsing walls and hurled again into space. Darkness came down, a darkness so deep it seemed a thousand suns might not pierce it through with their rays. Sirius, the great sun, seemed blotted out. He was seized by a sense of falling through that Stygian shroud, in which direction he knew not, or why, or how. He knew only that his ego, over which he had lost control, was swirling in vast spirals down and down through an endless void to an endless fate, that he who had come so confidently forth to explore the universal secrets had become a waif in the uncharted immensity of the eternal universe. The sensation went on and on. So much he knew. Still he was conscious. The thought came to him that this was his punishment for daring to know. Still conscious, he must be still bound by natural law. Had he broken that law and been cast into utter darkness to remain forever conscious of his fate? Yet if so, where was he falling? Where was he to wander and for how long? His senses reeled. By degrees, however, he fought back to some measure of control. His very necessity prompted the attempt, and by degrees there came to him a sense of not being any longer alone. In the almost palpable darkness, it seemed that other shapes and forms, whose warp and woof was darkness also, floated and writhed about him as he fell. They thrust against him, they gibbered soundlessly at him, they taunted him as he passed, and yet their very presence helped him in the end. He called his own knowledge to his assistance. He recognized these shapes of terror as those elementals of which occult teaching spoke, things which roamed in the darkness, which had as yet never been able to reach out and gain a soul for themselves. With understanding came again the power of independent action. Unknowing whither, Croft willed himself out of their midst to some spot unnamed, where he might gain a spiritual moment of rest to the nearest bit of matter afloat in the universal void. Abruptly, he became aware of the near presence of some solid substance. The sense of falling ended, and he knew that his will had found expression, in fact. Yet wherever it was he had landed, the region was dead. Like the moon, it was wholly devoid of moisture or atmosphere. The presence of solid matter, however, gave him back a still further sense of control. Though he was still enveloped in darkness, he reasoned that if this was a planet and possessed of a sun in its system, its farther side must be bathed in light. Reason also told him that in all probability he was still within the system of Sirius despite the seemingly endless distance he had come. Exerting his will, he passed over the darkened face and emerged on the other side, in the midst of a ghostly light. 
At once he became conscious of his surroundings, of a valley and encircling lofty mountains. From the sides of the latter came the peculiar light. Examination showed Croft that it was given off by some substance which glowed with a phosphorescence sufficient to cast faint shadows of the rocks which strewed the dead and silent waste. Not knowing where he was, loath to dare again the void, hardly knowing whether to will himself back to earth or remain and abide the issue of his own adventure, Croft waited, debating the question, until at length the top of a mountain lighted as if from a rising sun. Inside a few moments, the valley was bathed in light. He saw the great sun Sirius wheel up the morning sky. Peace came into his soul. He was still a conscious ego, still a creature in the universe of light. He gazed about, close to the line of the horizon, and shining with what was plainly reflected light, he saw the vast outlines of another planet he had failed to note until now. He understood. This was the major planet, surely one of the dog star's pack, and he had alighted on one of its moons. All desire to remain there left him. He was tired of dead worlds, of bottomless voids. As before on the moon itself, he felt a resurgent desire to bathe in an atmosphere of life. By now... Fairly himself again, the wish was father to the fact. Summoning his will, he made the final step of his journey, as it was to prove, and found himself standing on a world not so vastly different from his own. He stood on the side of a mountain in the midst of an almost tropic vegetation. Giant trees were about him, giant ferns sprouted from the soil. But here, as on earth, the color of the leaves was green, through a break in the forest, he gazed across a vast, wide-flung plain through which a mighty river made its way. Its waters glinted in the rays of the rising sun. Its banks were lined with patches of what he knew from their appearance were cultivated fields. Beyond them was a dun track, reminding him of the arid stretches of a desert, reaching out as far as his vision could plumb the distance. He turned his eyes and followed the course of the river, by stages of swift interest, he traced it to a point where it disappeared beneath what seemed the dull red walls of a mighty city. They were huge walls, high and broad, bastioned and towered, flung across the course of the river, which ran on through the city itself, passed beyond a farther wall, and beyond that again there was the glint of silver and blue in Croft's eyes, the shimmer of a vast body of water whether lake or ocean, he did not know then. The call of a bird brought his attention back. Life was waking in the mountain forest where he stood. Gay-plumaged creatures, not unlike earthly parrots, were fluttering from tree to tree. The sound of a grunting came toward him. He swung about. His eyes encountered those of other life. A creature such as he had never seen was coming out of a quivering mass of sturdy fern. It had small, beady eyes and a snout like a pig. Two tusks sprouted from its jaws like the tusks of a boar. But the rest of the body, although something like that of a hog, was covered with a long, wool-like hair, fine and seemingly almost silken soft. This, as he was to learn later, was the tabor, an animal still wild on Pelos, though domesticated and raised both for its hair, which was woven into fabrics, and for its flesh, which was valued as food. While Croft watched, it began rooting about the foot of a tree on one side of the small glade where he stood. Plainly, it was hunting for something to eat. Once more, he turned to the plain and stood lost in something new. Across the dun reaches of the desert, beyond the green region of the river, was moving a long, dark string of figures headed toward the city he had seen. It was like a caravan, Croft thought, in its arrangement, save that the moving objects which he deemed animals of some sort belonged in no picture of a caravan such as he had ever seen. Swiftly he willed himself toward them and moved along by their side. Something like amazement filled his being. These beasts were such creatures as might have peopled the earth in the Silurian age. They were huge, twice the size of an earthly elephant. 
They moved in a majestic fashion, yet with a surprising speed. Their bodies were covered with a hairless skin, reddish-pink in color, wrinkled and warded, and plainly extremely thick. It slipped and slid over the muscles beneath it as they swung forward on their four massive legs, each one of which ended in a five-toed foot armed with short, heavy claws. But it was the head and neck and tail of the things which gave Croft pause. The head was more that of a sea serpent or a monster lizard than anything else. The neck was long and flexible and curved like that of a camel. The tail was heavy where it joined the main spine, but thinned rapidly to a point. And the crest of head and neck, the back of each creature, so far as he could see, was covered with a sort of heavy scale, an armor devised by nature for the thing's protection as it appeared. Yet he could not see very well, since each Sarpelka, as he was to learn their Pelosian name, was loaded heavily with bundles and bales of what might be valuable merchandise. And on each sat a man. Croft hesitated not at all to give them that title, since they were strikingly like the men of earth insofar as he could see. They had heads and arms and legs and a body, and their faces were white. Their features departed in no particular, so far as he could see, from the faces of earth, save that all were smooth, with no evidence of hair on upper lip or cheek or chin. They were clad in loose, cloak-like garments and a hooded cap or cowl. They sat the sarpelkas just back of the juncture of the body and neck and guided the strange-appearing monsters by means of slender reins affixed to two of the fleshy tentacles which sprouted about the beast's almost snake-like mouths. That this strange cortege was a caravan, Croft was now assured. He decided to follow it to the city and inspect that as well. Wherefore he kept on beside it down the valley, along what he now saw was a well-defined and carefully constructed road, built of stone, cut to a nice approximation, along which the unwieldy procession made good time. The road showed no small knowledge of engineering. It was like the roads of ancient Rome, Croft thought with quickened interest. It was in a perfect state of preservation and showed signs of recent mending here and there. While he was feeling a quickened interest in this, the caravan entered the cultivated region along the river, and Croft gave his attention to the fields. The first thing he noted here was the fact that all growth was due to irrigation, carried out by means of ditches and laterals very much as on earth at the present time. Here and there, as the caravan passed down the splendid road, he found a farmer's hut set in a bower of trees. For the most part, they were built of a tan-colored brick and roofed with a thatching of rushes from the river's bank. He saw the natives working in the fields, strong-bodied men, clad in what seemed a single, short-skirted tunic reaching to the knees, with the arms and lower limbs left bare. One or two stopped work and stood to watch the caravan pass, and Croft noticed that their faces were intelligent, well-featured, and their hair for the most part a sort of rich, almost chestnut brown, worn rather long and wholly uncovered, or else caught about the brows by a cincture which held a bit of woven fabric draped over the head and down the neck. Travel began to thicken along the road. The natives seemed heading to the city to sell the produce of their fields. Croft found himself drawing aside in the press as the caravan overtook the others and crowded past. So real had it become to him that for the time he forgot he was no more than an impalpable, invisible thing these people could not contact or see. Then he remembered and gave his attention to what he might behold once more. They had just passed a heavy cart drawn by two odd creatures, resembling a deer save that they were larger and possessed of hoofs like those of earthborn horses, and instead of antlers sported two little horns not over six inches long. They were, in color, almost a creamy white, and he fancied them among the most beautiful forms of animal life he had ever beheld. On the cart itself were high-piled crates of some unknown fowl, as he supposed, some edible bird, with the head of a goose, the plumage of a pheasant so far as its brilliant coloring went, long necks, and bluish, webbed feet. 
Past the cart, they came upon a band of native women carrying baskets and other burdens strapped to their shoulders. Croft gave them particular attention, since as yet he had seen only men. The Pelosi and females were fit mates, he decided, after he had given them a comprehensive glance. They were strong-limbed and deep-breasted. These peasant folks, at least, were simply clad. Like the men, they wore but a single garment, falling just over the bend of the knees and caught together over one shoulder with an embossed metal button, so far as he could tell. The other arm and shoulder were left wholly bare, as were their feet and legs, save that they wore coarse sandals of wood, strapped by leather thongs about ankle and calf. Their baskets were piled with vegetables and fruit, and they chattered and laughed among themselves as they walked. And now, as the Sarpelkas shuffled past, the highway grew actually packed. Also, it drew nearer to the river and the city itself. The caravan thrust its way through a drove of the tabers, the woolly hogs such as Croft had seen on the side of the mountain. The hogs herds, rough, powerful, bronzed fellows, clad in hide aprons belted about their waists and nothing else, stalked beside their charges and exchanged heavy banter with the riders of the Sarpelkas as the caravan passed. From behind, a sound of shouting reached Croft's ears. He glanced around. Down the highway, splitting the throng of early market people, came some sort of conveyance, drawn by four of the beautiful, creamy, deer-like creatures he had seen before. They were harnessed abreast and had nodding plumes fixed to the headbands of their bridles in front of their horns. These plumes were all of a purple color, and from the way the crowds gave way before the advance of the equipage, Croft deemed that it bore someone of note. Even the captain of the Sarpelka train, noting the advance of the gorgeous team, drew his huge beasts to the side of the road and stood up in his seat-like saddle to face inward as it passed. The vehicle came on. Croft watched intently as it approached. So nearly as he could tell, it was a four-wheeled conveyance something like an old-time chariot in front, where stood the driver of the cream-white steeds, and behind that, protected from the sun by an arched cover draped on each side with a substance not unlike heavy silk. These draperies, too, were purple in shade, and the body and wheels of the carriage seemed fashioned from something like burnished copper as it glistened brightly in advance. Then it was upon them, and Croft could look squarely into the shaded depths beneath the cover he now saw to be supported by upright metal rods, save at the back where the body continued straight up in a curve to form the top. The curtains were drawn back since the morning air was still fresh, and Jason gained a view of those who rode. He gave them one glance and mentally caught his breath. There were two passengers in the coach, a woman and a man. The latter was plainly past middle age, well-built, with a strongly set face and hair somewhat sprinkled with gray. He was clad in a tunic the like of which Croft had never seen, since it seemed woven of gold, etched and embroidered in what appeared stones or jewels of purple, red, and green. This covered his entire body and ended in half-sleeves below which his forearms were bare. He wore a jeweled cap supporting a single spray of purple feathers. From an inch below his knees, his legs were encased in what seemed an open-meshed casing of metal, in color not unlike his tunic jointed at the ankles to allow of motion when he walked. There were no seats proper in the carriage, but rather a broad padded couch upon which both passengers lay. So much Croft saw, and then, forsaking the caravan, let himself drift along beside the strange conveyance to inspect the girl. In fact, after the first swift glance at the man, he had no eyes save for his companion in the coach. She was younger than the man, yet strangely like him in a feminine way, more slender, more graceful as she lay at her ease. Her face was a perfect oval, framed in a wealth of golden hair, which, save for a jeweled cincture, fell unrestrained about her shoulders in a silken flood. Her eyes were blue, the purple blue of the pansy. Her skin, seen on face and throat and bared left shoulder and arm, a soft, firm white for she was dressed like the peasant women, 
save in a richer fashion. Her single robe was white, lustrous in its sheen. It was broidered with a simple jeweled margin at throat and hem and over the breasts with stones of blue and green. Her girdle was of gold in color, catching her just above the hips with long ends and fringe which fell down the left side of the knee-length skirt. Sandals of the finest imaginable skin were on the soles of her slender, pink-nailed feet, bare save for a jewel-studded toe and instep band, and the lacing cords which were twined about each limb as high as the top of the calf. On her left arm she wore a bracelet, just above the wrist, as a single ornament. Croft gave her one glance which took in every detail of her presence and attire. He quivered as with a chill. Some change as cataclysmic as his experience of the night before above the dog star itself took place in his spiritual being. He felt drawn toward this beautiful girl of Pelas as he had never in all his life on earth been drawn toward a woman before. It was as though suddenly he had found something he had lost, as though he had met one known and forgotten and now once more recognized. Without giving the act the slightest thought of consideration, he willed himself into the coach between the fluttering curtains of purple silk and crouched down on the padded platform at her feet. End of chapter 3 Read by Marnes007 Chicago, May 2022「Four of Palos of the Dog Star Pack」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Paul Nelson Palos of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Giese Naya, Princess of Palos Croft, in his earth life, had never looked on a woman with the longing such as apt to possess the average healthy male at times. But in his studies of the occult, he had more than once come in contact with the doctrine of twin souls. That theory, that in the beginning the spirit is dual, and that projecting into material existence, the dual entity separates into two halves, a male and a female, and so exists forever until the two halves meet once more and unite. Sometimes, because he had never found a woman to appeal to him as he wished a woman to appeal, he had been half inclined to doubt. But this morning on Palos, he no longer doubted. He believed. More than that, he knew now why no earth woman had ever reached the center of his being with her soft attraction. He knew now why the dog star had always drawn him during his student days. That longing to span the miles between Sirius and Earth was explained. It was because, in the economy of the infinite, it had been seen fit, God alone knew why, to send his half of their original spirit to earth, and his female counterpart to this life on another sphere. This beautiful girl was his twin. He knew her. He had found her. A wonderful elation filled his conscious soul as he sat feasting his eyes upon her every graceful line and feature. But suddenly, his contemplation was followed by the bitterest despair. He had found her, yes, but to what avail? The mere fact that he saw her now and was unseen by either her or her father, as he judged the man with whom she rode to be, was proof that his finding her was in vain. She was a living, breathing woman, every cell of whose glowing body sent a subtle call to his spirit, such as only the true mate can send to its absolute complement. He felt love, a sense of protection, a desire for possession, spiritual uplift, and physical passion all in a breath. He felt a mad urge to cast himself at her side, there on the padded cushion, and gather her lovely form to his heart close within his arms. And he knew himself but a spirit, invisible to her, imperceptible to her, realized that should he follow his impulse, she would not know, or should she know even faintly would not understand. Croft knew himself but a sublimated shape, and nothing more and it was then he went down into the deepest depths of a mental hell of despair. The torture of Tantulus was his. He could see her, sense her youth, her beauty, her sweetness, every charm which was hers, 
experience every potent wave of her appeal. Yet he could not reveal his presence or make known his response to her spirit call. Could he have done so, he would have groaned in a crushing anguish too great to be endured. Yet even that expression was denied. The stopping of the Nupas, as he was to learn the half-horse, half-deer-like steers were called, brought him back from his introspection after a time. He could hear the driver shouting, and now quite oddly, these people being human, and thoughts being more or less akin to all thinking minds, he found he could understand the intent, even though the words were strange. Way! Way for Prince Lacon, counselor to the King of Afer! On the words, the girl opened her lips. There is a wonderful press of travelers this morning, my father. Croft gloried in the soft, full tones of her voice, even before Prince Lacon made answer. Aye, the highway is like a swarm of insects, Naya, my child. Naya, the sound was music in Croft's ears. He whispered it over and over to himself as the carriage once more advanced through the throngs of market people, carters, freighters, past a caravan of heavily loaded sarpulkas outward bound. Naya, the word fitted her, seemed oddly appropriate, was music in his ears. Naya, Naya, the other part of his soul. The word beat upon his senses through the shuffle of passing feet. I shall tell Kythron to drive directly to our home, Prince Lacon said. You will go on to confer with Uncle Jadkor from there? Aye, you will have most of the day to set the servants about the preparations for the coming of Prince Kyphalos. Spare no expense, Naya, in those preparations. Report hath it he is a hard young man to please. Such reports as I have heard would not confirm yours, my father, Naya retorted with a contemptuous curl of her crimson lips. What has come to my ears would prove him no better than a beast, far too easy to please, indeed. Prince Lacon shook his head. Child, he chided in a sibilant fashion. You must not speak such words of a prince of Tamaresia, Naya. But the maid replied more calmly, I speak not of him as a prince of Tamaresia, but as a man and his attitude toward women. Croft was rather surprised to see Lacon frown at his daughter's speech. He himself applauded her attitude toward a man he judged must be a profligate of national reputation. He set the man's facial grimace down to mere distaste for hearing any one of royal blood disrated, and as the prince made no reply, sat waiting what might happen next and watching Naya where she reclined. What brings him to Himira? she questioned at length. He comes on matters of state, Prince Lacon's reply was almost rudely sharp and short. As he ended his answer, he sighed and lifted himself to a cross-legged seat. Ah, here we are at the gate, Naya. There is nothing finer in all of Tamaresia than this. No, not even in Zitra itself. Whether he uttered the exact truth or not, Croft did not then know. But as he gazed from the coach between the curtains of fluttering purple, he was inclined to agree. They had come to a place outside the walls, those monster walls Croft had seen hours ago, shining a dull deep red in the morning sun. Now close by, they towered above him in their mighty mass, still red, a deep, ruddy red, with an odd effect of a glaze on the surface of what he could now perceive was some sort of artificial building block laid in cement. So far as he could judge, the wall rose a good hundred feet above the road and stretched away on either side strengthened and guarded, every so far by a jutting tower as far as his eye could reach. Where they now stood, the road came down to the bank of the river on a wide-built approach made of stone masonry, laid in cement, protected on the shoreline by a wall or rail, fully six feet wide across its top, which was provided every so far with huge stone urns, blackened about their upper edges as though from fire. Croft recognized their purpose as that of flaming beacons to light the wide stone esplanade before the gate at night. Beyond the wall was the river, a vast yellow flood, moving slowly along. It was at least a half mile wide where it met the wall, and the wall crossed it on a series of arches, leaving free way for the boats Croft now saw upon the yellow water, equipped with sails and masts, making slow advance against the current or driven perhaps by their crews at long sweep-like oars. 
He noted that each arch was guarded by what seemed gates of metal lattice, and that drawn up above each was a huge metal door, which could be let down in case of need to present an unbroken outward front above the surface of the flood. It was a wonderful sight, river, wall, and wide paved approach, as the Nupas drew the carriages swiftly toward the gates. Then it all vanished. Croft caught sight of two men, dressed something like ancient Roman soldiers, huge, powerful fellows, with metal cuirass, spear and shield, bare-legged, half up their thighs where a short skirt extended, their shins covered by metal greaves, their heads inside metal casks, from the top of which sprouted a tuft of wine-red plumes. They stood beside the leaves of two huge doors, fashioned from copper, as it seemed to Croft, things solidly molded, carved, graved, and embossed in an intricate design. These doors were open, and the carriage darted through, entering a shadowy tunnel in the wall itself. It was high, wide, and deep, the latter dimension giving the actual width of the wall itself. Croft judged it to be nearly as wide as tall. Then it was passed, and he found himself gazing upon such a scene as had never met mortal eyes perhaps since the days of Babylon. The great river flowed straight before him for a distance, so great that the farther wall was lost in a shimmering haze of heat. It flowed between solid walls of stone, cut and fitted to perfect jointure. From the lowest K of the banks sloped back in gentle terraces, green with grass and studded with trees and blooming masses of flowers and shrubs. Huge stairways and gradually sloping roadways ran from terrace to terrace down the river's course and back of the terraced banks there stretched off and away the splendid piles of house after house, huge, massive, each a palace in itself, until beyond them, seemingly halfway down the wonderful river gardens, there loomed a structure greater, vaster, more wide-flung than any of the rest. In the light of the risen sun it shone in almost blinding white. To Croft, at that distance, it appeared built of an absolutely spotless stone. As for the other houses, surely as he felt the abodes of the nobles and the rich, they were constructed mainly of red sandstone, red granites, and marbles, although here and there was one which glowed white through the surrounding trees, or perhaps a combination of red and white both. Yet aside from the monster structure in the distance, the majority were red. Indeed, he was come to know later that the word Himyra meant red in the literal sense, that in the Pelosian tongue, this was the Red City, just as he was to learn also that the name of the mighty river was Na, because of its yellow-colored flood. But this morning he knew none of that as he gazed down the terraced vista, bathed in the rays of Sirius, now rapidly mounting the sky. And there was much to see. Across from the vast white building on the other side of the river Na, he beheld a pyramid. He could call it nothing else in his earthly mind. It too was huge, vast, a monster red pile rising high above all other buildings in the city, until near the top was a final terrace or story of blinding white, capped with a finishing band of red, the whole thing supporting a pure white structure, pillared and porticoed like a temple on its truncated top. Even in the distance, it was a monster thing. How large he could not tell. Later, he was to know it was 2,000 feet square at the base and 300 feet in its rise above its foundation, ere the Temple of Zitu was reached. But then it struck him merely as vast. Indeed, the whole vista so impressed him, with its palaces, its mighty river, its terraces and parks, and the great white structure toward which they were rapidly dashing along a road before the massive dwellings, each surrounded by its own private park. Far, far ahead, he caught the dim outline of the farther city wall. He began to feel somewhat like Gulliver in the land of Brobdingnag, save that the city life which he had seen was little larger than that of its kind on earth. And now between the great white palace and the pyramid, a bridge grew into being before his eyes, while he watched span after span swung into place to form the whole. Already he had noted a series of masonry pillars in the stream, but had not comprehended what they meant. Closer examination was to teach him that each supported a metal span, mounted on rollers and worked by the tug of the current itself through a series of bucket-like bits of apparatus, 
which dragged the sections open or drew them shut. Also that at night the sections were open to permit free passage to boats. The things like the terraces and the roads showed a good knowledge of engineering as a characteristic of the Pelosian peoples. But from the fact that the terraces and the river embankment were studded at intervals with more of the stone fire urns, Croft decided that they were unacquainted with the use of electricity in any form. Nor did they seem to be possessed of a practical knowledge of the various applications of steam. None of the boats on the river, of which there were many, some plainly pleasure craft equipped with party colored sails, and others as plainly freight and commercial barges, but were propelled by sail and oar. Nor was the traffic of the streets other than by foot or by equipages drawn by nupas, such as Prince Lacon's driver was guiding down the well paved street. In fact, the more Croft saw of the city of Hamira, the more did he become convinced that civilization on Palos had risen little above the stage which had marked the Assyrian and Babylonian states on earth in their day. Prince Lacon spoke now to Kythron, a word of direction, and turned to his daughter again. I shall be with Jadkor the greater part of the day. You, Naya, as head of my household, must see to these preparations, since as counselor to the king, I must show a noble from Cather what courtesy I may, in an official capacity at least. Afer and Cather guide the highway to all outer nations. Those who would carry goods must pass through the gate and so up the Naw even to the region of Mazur. Cather is a mighty state. As is Afer, which holds the mouth of the Naw, the girl returned. Aye, together with Nodher, whose interests are Afer's interests, the three could place your uncle Jadkor on the imperial throne when the term of the Emperor Tamis shall expire. Croft pricked his ears, even as he saw a quickened interest wake in Naya's face. Plainly, Lacon spoke of various states of the country, and it was evident that the girl understood the full import of her father's words. Only Bither would be against him, she said. Hardly all of Bither. It lies too close to the lost state of Mazur for that, Lacon replied. There were seven states in the Tamarisian Empire, as you know, before the war with the Zolarians took one and gave Zolaria their first seaport on the Central Ocean through our loss. His face darkened as he spoke. Small good it did them, however, since there is still the Naw and our other rivers to which they pay toll if they wish to sail to Mazur or the other barbarian tribes. And as long as Cather and Afer guard the gate, small good will it do them. Zetemki, take them in all their spawn. As long as Cather holds... Naya exclaimed. Lacon nodded. Aye. Cather stands cut off from the rest of Tamarisia, as you know, by Majur's fall. Jadkor would see to it that Cather still stands, despite the fact, or Zolaria's plans, if she has them, as some of us fear. Tamis is a man of peace. So am I, if I may be, and Zitu sends it. Yet will I fight for my own. And Kyphlos comes in regard to this... this alliance? Prince Lacon nodded. I list you, Naya. Order Bazka to send runners to the hills to bring back snows on the eighth day from this. Kyphalos likes his wines cooled and will drink no other. In our own place, I have given orders for all fruits and fish and fowls to be made ready at the appointed time. See to it that the house is decked for his coming, that all things are made clean and fit for inspection. As for yourself, you must have a new robe. Spare no expense, my child. Spare no expense. Naya's eyes lighted as he paused. I should desire it of gold broidered in purple, she flashed back smiling, with purple sandals wrought with gold. And suddenly, as the carriage turned into a broad approach, leading from the main street to a huge red palace, Lacon laughingly remarked, ha, Have what you will, so long as it becomes thy beauty. Well, are you called Naya? made of gold. The carriage paused before the double leaves of a molded copper door. Kythron reached out and seizing a cord which hung down from an arm at one side, tugged sharply upon it to sound a deep-toned gong, which boomed faintly within. Hardly had the sound died than two leaves rolled back, sinking into sockets in the walls of the building itself, to reveal a vast interior to the eye and in the immediate foreground the figure of a man who gave Croft a start of surprise. 
He was as nude as Adam, save for a narrow cord about the loins, supporting a broad phalary of purple leather. And he was blue. From his shaven scalp, which supported a single stiff, upstanding tuft of ruddy hair throughout his entire superbly supple length, he was blue. And the color was natural to his skin. At first Jason had thought him painted, until a closer glance had proved his mistake. Aside from his surprising complexion, he seemed human enough, with dark eyes, high molar prominences, and a strongly bridged nose. He was indeed not unlike an American Indian, Croft thought, or perhaps a Tartar. He remembered now that in times long past, the Tartars had worn scalp locks too. The blue man bowed from the hips, straightened, and stood waiting. Lacon sprang from the coach and assisted Naya to alight. Vazka, he spoke in command, your mistress returns. Give ear to her words and do those things she says until I come again. He sprang back into the coach, and Kythron swung the equipage about. He cried aloud to the Nupas, and they dashed away back toward the road along the Na. Croft found himself standing before the open door of Prince Lacon's city palace with Naya and the strange blue man. Call thy fellow servants, the Pelosian princess directed as she passed inside, and Bazka closed the doors by means of a golden lever affixed to the inner wall. I shall see them here and issue my commands. She walked with the grace of limbs unrestrained toward the center of the wonderful hall. For wonderful it was. At first Croft had thought it paved, in part at least, with glass of a faultless grade. But as he passed by Naya's side toward the center of the half-room, half-court in which flowers and shrubs and even small trees grew in beds between the pavement, he saw it was in reality some sort of transparent, colorless crystal, cut and sent into an intricate design. Yet that the Pelosians made glass he soon found proof. Casting his eyes aloft, he saw the metal framework of an enclosing roof arching the court above his head. Plainly it was thrown across the width of the court to support shutters made of glass of several colors, some of them in place, others removed or laid back to leave the court open to the air. The court itself was two stories high, and from either end rose a staircase of some substance, like a lemon-yellow onyx, save that it seemed devoid of any modeling of veins. These stairs mounted to the upper gallery, supported above the central grand apartment on a series of pure white pillars, between which gleamed the exquisite forms of sculptured figures and groups. There was also a group done in some stone of translucent white at the foot of each great stair. One, Croft noted, depicted a man and a woman locked in each other's arms. The other showed a winged figure, binding up the broken pinion of a bird. Love and mercy, he thought. If this were a sample of the ideal of this people, they must be a nation worthwhile. So much he saw, and then Naya seated herself on a chair of wine-red wood, set beside a hedge of some unknown vegetation which enclosed a splendid central space of the crystal floor. Bazka had disappeared, but now came the sound of voices, and the servants appeared, emerging from a passage beneath one of the stairs. There were several members of both sexes in the group, and like Baska himself, one and all wore no more than a purple apron about the thighs. Croft was to learn in the end that the Pelosians wore clothing more as a protection against the elements than for any desire to conceal the form, and with that fact, he was to find them a highly moral people nonetheless. Now, though their apparel, or lack of it, was something of a shock to his sense of conventions, as the men and women of the Blue Tribe advanced to greet their mistress in her chair, and listened to those directions she gave, he found himself wondering if they were slaves. Indeed, he so regarded them until he knew more of the planet to which he had come. Then he knew slavery no longer existed among the Tamaresians, and that the blue men and women were the children of former slaves captured in wars, but now freed, given the rights of citizenship, and paid by those whom they served. In the end, Naya turned to one of the women and ordered her to go to a cloth merchant and bid him attend her at once, with fabrics from which to choose her gown. That done, she dismissed each to his or her task, rose, and moved down the court. Croft followed as she went, mounted one of the yellow stairs, and came out on the upper balcony, 
down which she passed over an inlaid floor, beside walls frescoed with what he took to be scenes of Pelosian history and social life. She paused at a door fashioned from the wine-red wood, set it open, and entered an apartment plainly her own. Its walls were faced with the same yellow stone used in the stairs. Purple draperies broke the color here and there. Purple curtains hung beside two windows, which she set open, turning the casings on hinges to let in the air. In the center of the floor, which was covered with woven rugs and skins of various beasts, was a circular metal basin holding water in a shallow pool. On one side was a pedestal of gold, supporting a pure white miniature of a winged male figure, poised on toes as if about to take flight. Beside the pool, Naya paused as she turned from opening the window. Her figure was reflected from the motionless surface. Croft recognized it as a mirror in purpose, similar in all respects to those the ancient Phoenicians used. For a time, she stood gazing at the image of her figure, then turned away to a chest made of the wine-red wood, heavily bound with burnished copper bands. Beside the chest, the room held several chairs and stools and a molded copper couch covered with rich draperies. Naya rummaged in the chest while Croft watched. She rose and turned with a garment in her hands. Gossamer it was, fine, soft, sheer, a cobweb of texture as she shook it out. It shimmered with an indefinable play of colors, transparent as gauze. She lifted a hand and unfastened the gown she wore from the heavy shoulder boss that held it in place. End of chapter four. Chapter 5 of Palos of the Dog Star Pack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Palos of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Geise. Pelosian Diplomacy. Taken wholly by surprise, Croft caught one glimpse of a glowing, pliant figure, cinctured just above the hips by a golden girdle. Then, Realizing that the maiden believed herself utterly alone, he turned to the open window and continentally fled. Light as a thistle down in his sublimated self, he emerged into the full Pelosian day. Yet he quivered in his soul as with a chill. Naya of Afur, princess of the Tamarizia nation, was a woman to stir the soul of any man. She was his. His! The thought blurred his senses as he rushed forth. His? A second thought gave him pause. His indeed, yet no more his now than always since their dual spirit had projected into the material world and had been lost to the other how many eons ago? His found now at last, yet unclaimable still, unclaimable. The thought was madness. Croft put it away, or tried. To distract himself, he wandered over the city of Himyara, stretched red in the Syrian ray, and as before, he knew it fast. From the river it stretched in its red and white collection of walls both ways. He visited each part, finding it poorer and poorer as he wandered from the river to the walls, until inside them, at all parts, save where the main avenue by the river reached the two principal gates, he found the poorest class of the people dwelling in huts of yellow-red brick. Yet Himura was a wonderful place. Croft visited the quays along the Na, farthest from the gate, where he had entered with Prince Lacone and his daughter hours before. They swarmed with life, were lined with boats, built principally of wood, though some were mere skin-covered coracles, more than anything else. They lay by the stone loading platforms, taking on or discharging the commerce of the Pelosian world. Men, white and blue, swarmed about them, tugging, sweating, straining at their tasks speaking a variety of tongues. From the loading platforms on the lower levels, tunnels ran up beneath the terraces on the surface to reach the warehouses above where the goods were stored. Within them, moving in metal groves braced to an equal width by crossbars fixed to the floors, small, flat-topped cars were drawn by whipcord-muscled creatures like giant dogs. Croft followed one such team to a warehouse and watched the storing of the load by a series of blueskin porters under the captaincy of a white Afurian who marked each package and bale with a symbol before it was carried away. 
This captain wore a tunic, metalwork cases on his calves, and sandals, and a belt from which depended a short, broad-bladed sword. He had seen his counterpart on the quays as well, and was well satisfied that Himura had a very efficient system of officers of the port. From the warehouse he went toward an adjacent section, evidently the retail mart of the town. Here were shops of every conceivable nature, open in front like those of some oriental bazaar. At this hour of the day business was brisk. More than one Pelosian lady had come in a nupa-drawn conveyance to see and choose her purchases for herself. A steady current of life, motion, and speech ran through the section. Blue attendants, male or female, as the chance fell out, walked with these matrons of Palos, shielding their heads from the sun with parasols woven of feathers, held above them on long handles while they examined, selected, and bought. Porters brought baskets of fruit and flowers, bolts of cloth, strings of jewels to the metal-built carriages behind returning women, and bowed their patrons away. Suddenly the sound of a vast mellow gong, a series of gongs, like an old-time carillon ring out. The bustle of the market stopped. As by one accord, the people turned toward the vast pyramid beyond the river, and stood standing, gazing toward it. It came over Croft that it was here that the great chime had sounded, that this midday cessation in the activities of life had something to do with the religion of the nation. Driven by his will, he reached the great structure where the topmost temple shone, dazzling in the noontime light. He found himself on the vast level top of the pyramid itself. Before him was a temple supported on a base, its doors reached by a flight of stairs. It was pillared with monster monoliths, crowned by huge capitals which supported the porticoed roof. A sound as of chanting came from within. Croft mounted the stairs and passed the doors, and paused before the beauty of what he saw. The temple was roofed with massive slabs of stone, save in the exact center, where an opening was left. Through that aperture, the light of the midday sun was falling to bathe a wonderful figure in its rays. The face of the statue was divine. The face of a man, superbly strong, broad-browed, and with purity and strength writ in its every line. The head and face were wrought in purest white, as were the bared left shoulder and arm. Below that, the figure was portrayed as clad in gold, which was also the material used in modeling the staff crowned by a loop and crossbar, grasped by the hand of the extended left arm. The man was portrayed as seated on a massive throne. Now as the sun's rays struck full upon it, it seemed that the strong face glowed with an inward fire. On either side of the statue stood a living man, shaven of head, wearing long white robes which extended to their feet. Each held in his hand a miniature replica of the stave held by the statue, a staff crowned by a golden crossbar and loop. Croft started. This was the Kronk Sansada of the ancient Egyptians in all outward form, the symbol of life everlasting, of man's immortality, and he found it here on Palos, on top of a pyramid. The chant he had heard was growing louder. It held a feminine timbre to his ears. At the rear of the temple, a curtain swept aside, seemingly of its own volition, and a procession appeared. It was formed of young girls, their hair garlanded with flowers, each carrying a flaming blossom in her hand. They advanced, singing as they came, to form a kneeling circle in front of the monster statue on its throne. They were clad in purest white, unadorned from their rosy shoulders to their dimpled knees, save for a cincture of golden tissue which ran about the neck, down between the breasts, back about the body, and around to fashion in front like a sash with the pendant ends, which hung in a golden fringe to the edge of the knee-length skirt. And as they advanced and knelt and rose, and cast their offering of flowers before the glowing statue, they continued to chant the harmony which had first reached Croft's ear. In it, the word Zitu recurred again and again. Zitu, then, was the name of the statue, the name of the god. He listened intently, and finally gained the purport of the hymn. Zitu, hail Zitu, father of all life. Who through thy angels give life and withdraw it? Into our bodies, out of our bodies. God, the one God, accept our praise. 
The chant died, and the singer turned back behind the curtain, which swung shut as they passed. Croft left the temple and stood on top of its broad approach, gazing across the river at the vast white structure which he had first seen at a distance that morning, and which now stretched directly before his eyes. It came to him that this was the capital of Afur, the palace of that Jedgor Prince Lakan had mentioned, brother of Naya's mother, as he was to learn. Bent on seeing the man who aspired to Temerizia's imperial throne at close quarters, he willed himself toward the far-flung white pile. It was built of stone he did not know, as he found when he came down to the broad, paved, esplanade before him. But the substance seemed to be between marble and an onyx, so nearly as he could judge. It stretched for the best part of an earth mile, and housed the entire working force of the Afur government as he came to know in the following days. Now, however, he gave more attention to his immediate surroundings, the vast towers on either side of the monstrous entrance, heavy and imposing, and each flanked by guardian figures of what seemed winged dogs, whose front legs supported webbed membranes from body to paw. Croft passed between them through the entrance were filled counter-streams of Pelosians on foot, or dashing past in Nupadron chariots, trundling on two wheels, and driven by men clad in cuirasses and belted with short swords. He entered a vast court, surrounded by colonnades, reached by sloping inclines and stairs, and paved with dull red stone. Here stood more of the chariots before the doors of this or that office of state. Blue porters moved about it, sprinkling the pavement with cooling streams of water from metal tanks strapped to their shoulders, and fitted with a curved nozzle and spraying device. It made a splendid picture as the sun struck down on the red floor, the gaily trapped gnupas, the metal of the chariots, and the flashing armor of the bodies of those who rode them, or the men-at-arms who stood here and there about the court, armed with sword and spear. This was the heart of a fur's life, Croft thought, gave it a glance, and set off in quest of a fur's king. He passed through vast chambers of audience, of council, or banqueting and reception, as he judged from the furnishings of each place. He passed other courts, marveling always at the blending of grace with strength in the construction of the whole. Also, he marveled at the richness of the draperies with which various rooms and doorways and arches were hung. Much of it seemed to possess a metallic quality and texture. It seemed like thin-spun gold. Yet it was everywhere about the palace as he passed. Finally he paused. He was getting nowhere. He decided there was but one means of attaining his desire. He put it into force. He willed himself into the presence of Jedgor without further search. Thereafter, he was in a room where, besides a huge wine-red table, two men sat. The one was Prince Lacone, who he knew. The other was an even larger man. Heavy set, dark of complexion, with grizzled hair and a mouth held so tightly by habit that it gave the impression of lips consciously compressed. His eyes were dark as those of a bird, his nose high and somewhat bent at the middle of the bridge. The whole face was that of a man of driving purpose, who would brook small hinges between himself and a predetermined goal. Aside from that, however, there was little of the king about him, since he was clad simply in loose white tunic, out of which his neck rose massive, below which his lower limbs showed corded with muscle and strong. Plainly, Jadgor was talking state business with his brother-in-law at ease. As Croft gained the room, he struck the table at which he sat with clenched fist. Cuthur must still guard the gateway with a fur, Prince Lacone, he cried. Let Solaria plan. Cuthur's mountains make her impregnable now as fifty years before. Had Mazur been other than a low-lying country, she would have never fallen victim to Zolaria's greed. But Cuthur must be assured in her loyalty to the state. Her loyalty? Prince Lacone exclaimed. What does a fur's king mean? What he says, Jedgor set his lips quite firmly. Scythus is king, a dotard. Kaifalos is what, a fop, a voluptuary, as you know, as all Tamarizia knows. When he mounts the throne, as he doubtless will, since there seem none to oppose him, what will Zalaria do? Cathur, since Mazur was taken, stands alone, secure in her mountains, it is true, but alone none the less. And Cathur guards the western gate to the inland sea. Fifty years ago, Zalaria meant to take Cathur as well, and she failed. The capture of Mazur, save the territorial addition to her borders, 
gave her nothing at which she aimed. True, she now has a seaport at Nero, yet to what end? We hold the gate, and the mouths to all rivers opening into the sea. Yet has Zularia ceased to prate of a freedom of the seas? You know she has not. With Caifalos on Cuthur's throne, will she seek to gain by craft what was denied to her arms? But Caifalos himself? Lacone objected as Jagor paused. Caifalos! The heavy shoulders of a furs monarch shrugged. Listen ye, Lacone. Zelaria is strong. Cathur stands alone. Cathur guards the gate. A fur cannot hold it alone. Think you our foemen to the north have ceased of their ambitions, or to plan or prepare, while Tamarizia, wounded by Mazur's loss, has licked her wounds for fifty years? And what now? Tamis, Zitu knows I mean no unjust criticism of a nobleman, is one who believes in peace. So too do I, if peace can be enjoyed without the sacrifice of the innate right of man to regulate his own ways of life. Yet were I on the throne as Zitra, do you think I would ignore the possible peril to the north? No, I would prepare to meet move by move should the occasion arise. And your first step? Lacone asked. To make sure of Cathur, Jidgor said. How? Jidgor leaned toward his companion before he replied. I would take a lesson from Zelaria herself. Lacone, we have lived each state too much in itself. Tamarizia is a loosely held collection of states, each ruled by what? A nominal king and a state assembly? And those assemblies in turn elect the central ruler, the emperor of the nation, to serve for ten Pelosian cycles. Zelaria is what? A nation ruled by one man and a cycle of advisers, whose word is ultimate law. How was that brought about? By intermarriage, by making the governing house of Zelaria one, bound wholly together by a common interest without regard to anything else save that. Hence, let us make the interests of Afur and Cathur one, and let us not delay. By intermarriage? Aye, with the right princess on Cathur's throne, Caiphalos might be swayed, and certainly nothing would transpire without our gaining word. You have such a one in mind? Lacone asked. Aye, I plan not so vaguely, Lacone. I would give him the fairest maid of Afur to wife. It would require such to hold a man of his type. Do you know that inside the last cycle he has been seen frequently at Nero, mingling with the Zelaria nobles who come to summer there? So I have heard rumored, Prince Lacone inclined his head. But this woman? Your daughter Naya, Jedgore declared. Naya? Your sister's own child? Prince Lacone half rose from his chair. Hilka, Jedgore waved him back. Stop, Lacone. She is beautiful as God, the mother of Azil. It is because of her Caiphalos comes to Himura now. I, Jedgor of Afur, sent him the invitation with this in mind for Tamarizia's good. The betrothal must be agreed upon before he returns. Lacone, I speak as your king. Prince Lacone's face seemed to croft to age, to grow drawn and somewhat pale as he bowed to his king's command. He looked to croft, indeed, as Jason knew he himself felt. Never had he seen Prince Caiphalos of Cathur, Yet he had heard him mentioned that morning in Lacone's coach. He had heard Naya's soft lips utter sincere disgust of the lecherous young noble. Now Naya, the woman he himself loved, was planned a sacrifice to policy of state. Every atom of his soul cried out in revolt. Not that! Not that! He might not win her himself, as he very well knew. Yet he had seen her, known her, loved her. A sick loathing evoked by Jedgor's plan waked in his soul. The thought of her surrender to the foul embrace of the northern prince roused within him a rebellion so vast that his senses whirled. Lacone rose slowly. His features were dull, and his voice a monotone of feeling too deep for an accent of expression. King of her, I shall inform the maid that she has chosen a sacrifice, he said. I know her mind. She loathes this prince of Cathur in her heart. Yet other women have sacrificed themselves to the nation in Tamarizia's history, Jador replied. I shall place the matter before her in that light, Lacone informed him, and turned to leave the room. Croft left too, flitting out of the palace, and once more taking up his own purposeless wandering about the town. Naya, Naya, Naya! His soul cried out within him, Naya! Made of his spirit, sweet, pure maiden of gold. Would that he had a body here on this planet of Palos. 
He would fight this monstrous step, he told himself, to the death. He would seize this golden girl and bear her away, somewhere, anywhere beyond the reach, the touch of the satyr prince of Cathur. He would prevent this intended sacrifice of all that was holy in human existence, or die in the attempt. Here and there he made his way among the life of Himura, torn by an agony of thought. Dimly he saw where he went, through the stables of the mighty caravans full of the ungainly sarpelkas, through what seemed a market of cattle, where were droves of the long-haired tabers and herds of other creatures, like monster sheep, save that they had huge, pendulous udders, evidently the source of the nation's supply of milk. He noted these things without being fully aware of the fact at the time. Only later did he recall them as objects beheld before. In a similar fashion, he came upon the barracks of troops guarding the various gates in the Great Wall, entered them, passed through them, found Himura's weapons no more than strong bows and swords and spears, her soldiery, sturdy-looking fellows clad in leathern tunics. Yet not for one instant did the tumult in his senses cease as he passed from scene to scene. Always was the thought of Naya with him. Always was his spirit hot in revolt against the plan of a fur's king. And so in the end, thoughts of Naya seemed to draw him back in a circuit to Lacone's palace, where was the girl herself. He reached it, and paused outside its doors. They were open. The copper-hued chariot drawn by the four plumed nupas stood before them, with Kaithar on back of the reins. Baska too stood between the open leaves of the portal, and across the crystal pavement leading to them. Lacone was leading Naya toward the coach. While Jason watched, a fur's prince and his daughter entered the conveyance, and the great doors closed. Kaithiron spoke to the Ganupas, and they sprang into their stride. Quite as he had done that morning, Croft entered the carriage and crouched on the padded cushion where Naya already reclined. Where they were going, he did not know, nor did he care so long as she lay there before his eyes. End of chapter 5 Read by Paradox 01, April 13th, 2022. Chapter number 6 of Pelos of the Dog Star Pack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Shashank Jakmola. Pelos of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Geisy. A Virgin's Prayer. For a time, as they turned toward the city gate, which they had entered that morning, silence held between Prince Lacken and his child. Lacken broke it himself at last. All is arranged as you thought best, my Naya, he inquired. I, my father, she turned her eyes. The messengers have departed to the mountains for the snows. The servants are cleaning. I have ordered the tables set in the crystal court, inside the hedge, and I have arranged for a band of dancers and musicians on the appointed day. And the robe? You did not forget the new robe. Lacken smiled. Naya shook her head, her eyes dancing. I am a woman, she replied. The makers came at my summons to take my measure. It will be ready on the seventh day from this. That is well, Prince Lacken said, but he sighed. And suddenly Naya's face lost its light and grew sweetly brooding. She stretched out a rounded arm and touched him on the breast. You are tired, my father. She spoke in almost crooning fashion, edging nearer to him. The day with Uncle Jatkor has left you weary. I somewhat, Lacken confessed. With a swift yet powerful gesture, he reached out and swept her into his arms, drawing her against his massive chest and sinking his cheek to touch her golden hair. Naya, my daughter, thou knowest that I love you well he said. Croft quivered in his being. It seemed to him he was looking into Lacken's heart and reading there 
all his lips held back the fatherly love the fatherly pain attendant on that scene in jatkar's apartment where he had spent much of the day it was that he felt inspired that sudden almost hungry clasping of the girl's supple figure to the father's breast that almost plaintive cry for her assurance of her faith in his love but naya seemed not to sense any deeper reason than the mere love between them expressed her red lips parted and she laughed softly as she lay against him lifting a hand to his grey shot hair know that you love me she repeated think you i could doubt it did you not give me my life do we not love what we create so long as it comes from ourselves she nestled her head in the hollow of his corded neck above that gold crowned head the man's face worked we were happy the day of thy birth thy mother and i he said now it seemed that at last the woman sensed some trouble unexpressed in the mind of the man very gently she released herself and sat up on the padded cushion her almost purple eyes looked full into those of her parent concerning what did you speak with uncle chatkor today concerning the lakan met the issue fairly now that it confronted him at last concerning me to craft every line of naya's figure stiffened i prince lakan sat up he spoke swiftly briefly and paused yet ere he paused he had fully outlined all king jadgar planned and while he spoke the eyes of the woman widened swiftly as the iris stretched to leave her pupil deep wells of horror then as lakan finished speaking she cried out no in swift instinctive protest and lifted herself upon her pink bent knees to poise so an instant before she flung herself once more upon her father's breast no she cried again clinging to him no no not that not that father and say it give me not to that beast hush prince lakan stayed her kaithron will hear your outcry kaithron she exclaimed not kaithron but all afer all tamarizia shall hear my outcry against what jatkar intends every woman in the nation shall give thanks to azil and ga that she stands not in my place naya her father spoke in a voice not wholly steady would you profane a shrine sully a temple defile a sacred thing she flared is a virgin's body a thing to be bartered and sold in afer does my uncle regard me as a shameless creature who sells herself for a price azil and his holy mother would veil their faces from such marriage rites think not i wish it her father said yet can i not deny the truth of jadgar's words on that the union of the houses of the two states would work for tamarizia's great good naya was panting tamarizia's she faltered now i did you not comprehend what i said concerning the welfare of a nation lakan asked she shook her head i i think horror must have dulled my understanding she said explain to me again long since they had left the city gates and were following a well-built road which led off toward those mountains where croft had first stood and viewed the pelosian landscape in the light of this waning day as he reached the end of his second exposition of the facts prince lakan turned and suddenly swept aside the purple curtain which draped the side of the coach he flung out an arm and pointed straight to where the dull red walls of himaira still shone in the afternoon rays behold himaira jewel on the breast of afer he cried there she lies think you i would have given ear to jatkar's plan save for that think you i 
would have sent you flesh of my loins to such a union safe for the good of the unborn souls to come. Think you were it not for Himaira, Afer, Tamarisia herself, I would have bowed my head to the words of Afer's king? Nay, if so, you are wrong. But for Tamarisia and that glory and honour which are hers and have been for a thousand cycles of our son, a true son of the nation must sink all thoughts of self, must live, if by living he can serve, or should it serve better, must die. Despite himself, Crop thrilled at the words, such as only a true patriot might speak in such tones of fire, tones which quivered and pulsed with emotion, one might not deny. In spite of his own sorry rebellion of spirit, echoed, as he now knew, in the soul of the gentle girl before him, some feeling akin to pity for this royal father of hers, crept through his mind. Prince Lacan was a man torn between parental love and the love of his nation, destined, as it seemed, to suffer no matter how this thing fell out. And while he spoke, the girl, his child, flesh of his flesh, crept to his side to kneel and gaze out at the distant walls of the city she knew as her own. Her expression changed. Some of the indefinable quality of girlhood seemed to fall from her and expose the deeper, firmer woman's nature, as though a veil had been torn aside. And I must live for her with Caiphalos, she whispered tensely as Lacan once more paused. If you can win him, hold him, sway him with Jatkur on the throne at Zitra, you will have made Tamirizia strong. I will have made Tamirizia strong. O oh, girl of gold, Croft's heart cried out as he caught her scanning speech. O oh, wonderful woman, so true to womanhood, so true now to the spirit of ultimate woman, ultimate sacrifice through which attribute of woman comes life itself. Unseen, unknown to her or the man who rode beside her, Croft approached and bent above her in that moment of struggle and decision. For, as she turned her eyes back to the interior of the coach, Croft knew she had decided, and that in deciding she had chosen the path which led against every personal impulse of her own clean spirit. What am I against Amaresia? she said. You are my daughter and I love thee, said Lacan, Afer's prince. I know. Naya crept to him and laid herself in his arms. I know, she murmured after a time of silence. Lacan's arms tightened about her as the coach swung along. Her arm crept up and stole about his neck. Silence came down again save for the patter of the Nupa's feet on the stone surface of the highway which had now left the plain and begun to scale the mountainside. Crouched invisible, Croft turned his gaze from the man and woman to stare out between the fluttering curtains. The road came to an end in a mountain valley, open toward the east and so unveiled a fresh scene of beauty to Jason's eyes. Here was a country palace, gleaming white above a series of terraced gardens which rose from the shores of a tiny mountain lake. Toward it, Kythron guided his steeds along a private drive which branched off from the highway they had traversed thus far. As though the turning had been a signal, Naya loosened the embrace which held her and sat up, still without speaking, before Kythron brought his team to a stand. Then, as in the morning, Prince Lacan helped her to descend and moved beside her up a low brought flight of steps to reach the portals of their home. At their heels, Croft followed on. His eyes swept the scope of the valley so far as he could mark it from the steps. Groups of the volley, sheep-like cattle he had seen in Himaira fed in the lush grass of mountain meadows. 
cultivated fields stretched out before his eyes. At the top of the steps, he turned briefly and looked off to the east. There, his eyes caught the glint of distant sun-kissed water, the central sea of which Prince Lacken had spoken, he now believed. Then the portals before which Lacken and Naya stood swung open, and once more a blue native appeared. Beside him was a monster beast, similar in all respects to those Croft had seen harnessed to the tiny trams in the cargo tunnels. It marked the advent of Lacken and Naya with a slow wagging of its tail and, suddenly rearing, laid its huge front paws, one on each of the girl's shoulders. She spoke to the creature softly, and when it dropped back at her command, she patted its head. Then turning to the man of Mazer, who stood waiting, she preferred a command. I am going to my apartments, Miltos. Send Maya to me there. You will attend me later, over our evening viands, her father asked. Hi, presently. She returned as she moved towards a stair at one end of the entrance court, which, in a smaller way, was not unlike Prince Lacken's Himaira Palace, save that here its pavement was laid in alternate squares of pale yellow and dull red. The treads of the stairway also were of yellow and red, as Croft saw while mounting, and the pillars which supported the balcony were yellow, while the balcony itself was red. Here too, as in the city, a group of white sculptures stood at the foot of the stair. It depicted a very Hercules of a man throttling a creature not far and like a tiger, while behind him crouched a woman holding a tiny figure of a child. All this he saw as Naya ascended without pause, reached a door guarded by a heavy golden curtain, swept it aside and entered into her own room. Here, as in Himaira, Croft found couch and chairs and windows, the mirror basin, the pedestal and the winged figure poised as though for flight. Once more the golden curtain was drawn back and a young Mazar woman appeared. Naya turned. Maya, how is the pool? It should be delightful, princess, the blue girl replied. All this day, Zitu warmed it with his light. Naya tapped with her foot. Procure fresh raiment and bring it thither, she said. The ride was tiresome and I will bathe. Five minutes later, accompanied by Maya, who bore fresh robes, she left the room and led the way to one end of the corridor and through a small door to an outer stair. Descending that, she passed through a sort of sunken garden laid out in odd geometric designs and planted with shrubs and trees and flowers, among which gleamed the white of ornamental urns, fire urns and statues toward a low white wall in which an opening appeared. Passing this, she turned about the angle of a protecting inner stone screen and stood on the margin of an open bath, its water clear as crystal and tinted a delicate ambler from the yellow bottom and sides of the peculiar onyx-like stone. Naya bathed. Refusing to spy upon her, Croft waited without the concealing wall, while twilight fell and the sounds of soft splashing came to his ear. The bath took a long time. Croft fancied the girl found some vague comfort in the soft, warm kiss of the waters, tempered all day by the sun, that to lie wrapped in their liquid caress soothed somewhat her spirit, torn by the revelations her recent journey had held. While he waited, twilight deepened, and after a time, a softer light stole through the garden. He lifted his gaze to the skies. Three moons hung there, casting their blended light over mountain and valley and plain. Vaguely, he wondered which of the three he had visited during the night before. That night, with its weird experience, 
ending on the edge of this day which after all had been but little less weird this day in which he had found and recognized and yielded to the one feminine counterpart of his nature only to find her destined to another less worthy than himself and to know himself unable to intervene between her and her fate while he sat there brooding the whole strange situation a man in all save material body a consciousness suffering all the pangs of spirit he was unable to physically express naya came forth and moved with her accompanying servant a pure white figure through the garden to the house like her shadow croft pursued her every step he stood beside her while she sat waiting for the evening meal he was behind her when she reclined on the couch beside the table opposite her father and date he dogged her steps when she once more sought the quiet of her room and bade maya leave her for the night hence he witnessed what no other eyes beheld as the flaring oil lamp with its guttering wick little better than a candle extinguished and the apartment flooded only by the light of the pelosian moons she knelt by the mirror basin before the winged figure on the wine red pedestal and he heard what no other ears save her own could hear as she lifted her hand to the figure before which she knelt the cry of her soul her womanhood's supplying prayer o oh, azil giver of life must this be forced upon me o oh, ga mother of azil ta virgin woman whom zitu ordained the one to give an angel life that he might speak to men of zitu himself and teach them how to live do thou intercede for me thou knowest woman guards the sacred flame which is life itself so that it burns clear and never ceasing must that flame in me be fouled ga the mother azil the son azil the angel hear ye my prayer she ceased and knelt on silent with hands clasped and lovely head bowed down and once more it seemed to croft that his senses went spinning eddying whirling around azil the giver of life ga the mother of azil the son a virgin and a child and zitu the father god she prayed to them this was the pelosian religion at least in part strange analogy to the earth creed croft found it to the creed in which he had been raised zitu was the one creative source here as elsewhere no matter by what name called the source to which the projected atoms of its thought looked back to whom they lifted their voices in praise or prayer what did it matter whether on earth or pelos life was then the same and the source was one place as another all embracing universal always the same and azil the angel of life was what a messianic spirit surely which had come to speak to the human atoms and tell them of the source what else and ga the medium through which spirit was translated into matter the eternal woman through whom life came to the incarnated man and to these this maid this other woman who had pledged herself as a sacrifice for her nation prayed alone here before the pedestal shrine of azil son of zitu she knelt and asked that the cup she had promised to drink might be divinely removed from her lips since all human hope of such a removal seemed to have died in so far as she could know should that prayer go unheeded or unheard could the pure cry of a clean spirit fail to reach the listening ears of the source no croft's spirit cried the word to his soul no no a thousand times no somehow some way he knew not how that prayer must be heard and answered he tore himself free from the spell of the kneeling figure and with no definite purpose in his going save to remove himself from a privacy he felt he must no longer intrude went blindly out of the room 
End of chapter 6. Chapter 7 of Palos of the Dog Star Pack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. Palos of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Gysi. Kyphalos and Calamita. Yet once outside the mountain villa, Croft knew where he wanted to go. It was back to Himira, back to the palace of Lacon itself, to be alone with his thoughts. To that point, therefore, he once more willed himself. The city swam beneath him. The yellow na sparkled and glinted in the flickering gleams of the fire basins lighted along the embankments as they leaped and flared. Other fires flashed out in various of the public squares. And here, the population met for their hours of relaxation. Here, groups of wandering musicians played on reed and harp and horn as the gaily decked crowds filed by. Here, mountebanks plied their stock of tricks and acrobats proved their supple agility and strength. Over it all, the three moons of Palos poured a silvery light as Croft flitted past. Then he was at the palace of Lacon, finding still open a window of Naya's own room, and so, at length, the place he sought. The moonlight filtered in. It fell in a broad bank, which struck across the pure white figure of Azil with its outstretched wings. Through a long moment, Croft stood gazing at the statue, bathed in the light of the moons. Then, without removing his eyes, he found the couch and sat down upon it, and thought. Still staring at Azil, the material symbol of that spirit to whom the girl, the aura of whose presence pervaded this room, had prayed. And after a time, out of all his agony of spirit, his tumult of thought, his rebellion at what was proposed for the girl's fate, the sick knowledge of his own futility to aid her, there came to him a prompting impulse as to his future course. To what end, he did not know. In his present state he could do nothing and knew it, had raged at the knowledge ever since he had seen Naya of Afur on her way to this room, where he now sat. Yet despite the acknowledged fact of impotency, something seemed to urge him to go on, to learn all he might of Palos and its people, of Tamarizia and its history, its manners and customs, its government and laws, and more particularly the true state of things in Cathur and the truth concerning Kyphalos, son of Cathur's king. To Cathur then he would go, Croft decided while he sat there staring at Azil, the angel of life. And Cathur, he judged, lay toward the north, since Jacko had spoken of the state of Noda as lying beyond a fur on the Na. Hence, he willed his spirit in projection without further delay. Thereafter followed a week in which Jason Croft, disembodied spirit, learned much concerning the nation and the country to which he had dared venture across millions of miles of space. He found Cuthur a mountainous state lying to the north of a wide mountain-walled strait. He found Skira, its capital city, not unlike Himira, save that it was built of an odd blue stone quarried from the mountains which ribbed the state in all directions. There was white stone too, used in the governmental palace and also in a splendid collection of buildings lying on a small plateau above the city proper. This was the National University of Tamarizia, as Jason quickly learned once he was inside its walls. Endowed as he was with the peculiar ability of reading the words of the people by reason of his sublimated state, he found this school a wonderful means of quickly gaining all knowledge of the nation which he desired to know. He literally went to school. An unknown scholar who listened to the recitation of classes and the lectures of grave professorial men clad in long robes of spotless white. Geography held his interest mainly at first. He learned that Tamarizia lay upon a continent holding itself completely surrounded, save for the narrow strait, a vast central sea, 
studded here and there with islands, the major of which, Hirana, some fifty miles long by twenty wide, was the seat of the imperial throne at the city of Zitra, of which Jack Gore had made mention before. The Tamarisian states bordered this central ocean, or had done so before the Zolarian War had wrested Mazur, on the extreme north shore, from the original group of states. East of Mazur lay Bithur. South of that was Milladur, completing the eastern side of the Central Sea. A fir joined Milladur on the west, its name literally meaning the state to the west, and south of Milladur and Afur was Nodur, gaining outlet for its commerce by means of the river Na. Kathur lay west of Mazur, north of the strait, to the outer ocean, completing the circle. Its name might be translated as the battleground, which, in fact, it was, Zolaria having more than once sought to conquer it and lost because of the nature of its mountainous terrain. Having learned so much, he could readily see wherein the possession of this state would give Zolaria the freedom of the seas which she desired, and a joint control of the entire central sea. From geography, he turned to sociology and science. He found out quickly that the Tamarisians used a metric system, numbering their population by tens and dividing the national census on the basis of thousands and tens of thousands, each thousand unit having a captain and each 10,000 a local governor. Their day was 27 hours long, their year longer than that of Earth, but divided into 12 periods or months, each in their belief ruled over by an angel designated by a symbolic sign. They believed in the immortality of the soul, as he had learned on the first day. They believed in the resurrection of the dead. They used a system of social castes, to which the naturalized descendants of the Mazarian nations belonged, being purely a caste of the lowest or serving type. The trades of fathers descended to sons, instruction in crafts and arts being largely by word of mouth alone. They had a bard or minstrel caste, a caste of dancers wholly female in its circle. A Pelosian year was called a cycle, a day, a sun, a month, a zetron, or period set by Zetu, the national god. There was a priesthood and a vestal order of women. Also, there was an order of knighthood to which belonged men of noble blood or those raised to it by kingly decree for some signal accomplishment in the arts or sciences or some other service to the state. The royal house of each state was hereditary, but governed jointly with a state assembly elected by the vote of each 10,000 unit of population, each unit selecting a state delegate to the assembly. The imperial throne was filled by the choice of the states, as he had once before heard Jack Gore of Afur say. Agriculture was highly held and greatly specialised. Metalworking was a very advanced science, as he had already guessed. Copper was abundant, and the Tamarisians held the secret of tempering the metal, now unknown on earth. Of it, they made their weapons and most of their public structural metal, including their carriages and chariots and all conveyances of a finer sort. Gold was plentiful too, but silver and lead were rare and held in high esteem. Steam and electricity were unknown in their application, as Croft had already seen. They had reached a high plane in art, sculpture, and weaving. He discovered that golden cloth was actually gold spun into the threads and mixed with a vegetable fibre to form a warp and wool. There was also a medical cast, somewhat crude, but seemingly efficient so far as he could learn, and attached to it a female or nursing cast, consisting wholly again of women who entered it from choice. In fact, women, as he came to see, held a prominent place in the nation. They held the right of suffrage. Their citizenship was co-equal with their men. They sat in the classrooms of the university, as he actually saw, and even took part in public ceremonials and competed in the public games. All in all, before his week at Skira was passed, he had come to understand that Tamarizia was a very democratic nation despite its form of royal rulership and that the emperor of Zitra was little more than a relic of old-time government, 
with little more power than a Republican president. And that, like most republics, the nation had grown weak in the pursuit of the profession arms. He had to admit that Jack Gore was right. Each city had a sort of civic guard. Each unit of 10,000 possessed a military police. There was an imperial guard at Zetra of possibly 500 men. Civic guards, imperial guards and police, the national maximum force none too well armed or trained, would not be judged as aggregating over 50,000 effective men. To the north of Tamarizia lay Zolaria, her western shoreline that of the greater or outer ocean. Like Tamarizia, Zolaria was a nation of whites, differing, however, in their national regime and their physical appearance to no small degree. As Jack Gore had said to Lacon, theirs was a rule of absolutism first and last, with the governing class distinct from the common people in each detail of their life. Larger than Tamarizia, Zolaria looked with envy on the position of the country to the south. Fifty years before, she had sought to change it and failed. Yet Jack Gore was assured she had not laid aside her ambition, and Croft was inclined to agree. The Zolarians themselves were a light-haired race to a great extent, heavily built, strong, virile, sturdy, many of them blue-eyed, except in the southern part of the nation where they approached more nearly to the Tamarizian type. East of Tamarizia and south of Zolaria, in the hinterland of the continent on which the three nations lived, was the half-savage tribe of Mazare, the Blue Men, inhabiting a region consisting mainly of semi-tropic forests and plains, living largely by hunting and the exporting of skins and dried meats and natural fruits, together with a variety of cheese. In these articles they maintained commerce with Zolaria and Tamarizia along their adjoining borders and had done so for years. Commerce was entirely by water, in such boats as Croft had seen on the Na, and by means of the Sarpelka caravans across stretches of desert to regions not approachable by the streams. That week in school proved a rather peculiar experience to Croft. He came to feel actually at home in Skira. Without being seen or known, he came to know the youths of the various classes. And to one in particular he gave special note. He was a wonderful man, insofar as physique was concerned. He stood a good six feet in height and was built in perfect proportion. In the games and sports, he always excelled because of his splendid strength. And there, he ceased. Mentally, he was not the equal of those with whom he strove. Nature seemed to have left her task uncompleted so far as Jaysaw was concerned. That was his name, Jaysaw, from Nodur, the state to the south of Afur, as Croft learned by degrees. He was a lovable young man, mild-mannered, friendly, and kind. But he was rated in his studies with youths two years his junior and appeared unable to do more than maintain his standing with them. Watching him, Croft felt both pity and interest develop through the course of the seven days wherein he himself acquired so great an understanding of Pelosian life. It seemed a pity to Croft that one so splendidly endowed with physical perfections should be so mentally weak. He rather followed young Jaysaw about and discovered to his pleasure that although seemingly well provided with means, the youth was naturally of a cleanly life. More than that, through association with him, he came to know that Jaysaw felt his position acutely and was brooding over his own mental capacity to an unwise degree. Throughout his stay in Cathar, however, Croft did not lose sight of his main object in coming to the northern state. He had come to find and judge Kaiphalos for himself, and he attended to that, not the first night, as he had intended, but the next night after that. There was a reason for the delay. Kaiphalos was not in Skira when Croft came to the capital of Cathar. Jason managed to see Scythus, the king. He found him in a splendid room clad in a loose robe of scarlet, a senile husk of a once massive man, with a look of vague trouble in his half-blinded, cataract-filmed eyes. But of Kaiphalos the son, there was no sign. Only by chance remarks was Croft able to learn the whereabouts of the prince. By such means he finally learned of a second palace maintained on an island in the Central Sea, 
off the coast of Cathur, not far from the border of the former Tamarisian state of Mazur. The island was known as Anthra, was a part of the state of Cathur, and a favourite retreat with the crown prince. To Anthra on the second night Croft went, and on Anthra he plunged into a scene as he had not met in Tamarisia yet. Heretofore he had been struck with the mild beauty of Pelosian life, with a sort of personal dignity which seemed to pervade the nation, despite the magnificence of their public structures and the undoubted wealth of the state. Not but what, being human, there was a percentage of criminality in the social life. Such things as among other races were known and recognised, but he had found it here regulated to a surprising extent. On Anthra, he came into an atmosphere the antithesis of this, combined with a degree of voluptuous luxury cradled in a setting of utter magnificence. He came upon a Saturnalia of pleasure. He could liken it to nothing else. A feast was in progress in the palace Kaiphalos had made the scene of his private debauches for years. Above an artificial harbour, as calm as glass, the palace rose an imposing pile. At the quays of the harbour, their coloured sails picked out by flaming fire urns, their gilded hulls set a sparkle in the flicker of the light-giving flames, lay a number of elaborate pleasure craft more like gold and copper galleys than anything else. Steps led up from the stone quays to the palace proper, giving on a wide expanse of crystal flagging under a heavy portico supported by pillars of lemon-yellow stone. And beyond this, through wide airy arches was the main court in the centre of which was a pool of limpid water some fifty feet long by as many wide. Like the other Pelosian palaces, this central court was the main gathering place of the inmates and guests. On Anthra, the structure was flagged in a pale green stone. The pillars supporting the balcony about it were lemon yellow, and the stairways at either end of a clear translucent blue. Innumerable oil lamps lighted it this night, and about one corner of the central pool were arranged the tables for the feast. Here, Croft found the man he sought, reclining on a padded divan, his two full red lips slightly parted in a bibulous smile, his long hair curled and anointed and perfumed till he reeked of aromatic scents, his well-formed hands loaded with rings, his body clad in a crimson garment embroidered in gold. Beside him, Lying outstretched like some splendid creature of the jungle, as it came to Croft, was a woman, tawny as a lioness in the tint of her hair and heavy-lidded eyes, lithe as a lioness too, in every sensuous line of her body, well-nigh unclothed. Her sandalless feet were stained on the soles with crimson, anklets gripped her lower limbs and tinkled tiny golden bells as she moved. Bracelets banded her graceful naked arms, Gem-encrusted cups, fastened by jeweled bands, covered in part her breasts. A bit of gold gauze, studded with bright red stones, accentuated, rather than veiled, the rest of her perfect figure from waist to the bend of her knees. She lay there, close to Kaiphalos, and after a bit she lifted a golden goblet and pressed it to his lips and laughed. Beyond her was a man, Croft marked at a glance. He was heavy, gross, yet gave an impression of mighty strength in the size of his hairy arms, the pillars of his mighty limbs, the breadth of his shoulder and chest, and he too was tawny-haired. And on the other side of Kaiphalos was a figure to give Croft pause. A blue warrior sat there, but surely no member of the serving class, Jason thought. This man was never made to serve. His were the features of one who commands, strong, firm-lipped, high-cheeked, with almost a somnolent sneer in the expression of his mouth and the glint of his eyes as he turned them on Kaiphalos and the woman by his side. This was some Mazarian chief, here in the palace of Cathar's prince. Who then were the tawny woman and man? Croft asked himself, and found he was soon to know. For as the woman laughed, Kaiphalos spoke. Your laughter is music better than any I can offer, my Calamita. Since first I heard it in Nera, the time I met you there with your brother Bandor, 
I have longed to hear it more. Your graciousness in coming to this farewell feast, ere I sail for a fur, burdened me with debt. Yet were I loath to have sailed without a final sight of you, a parting word, and I have provided such entertainment as I might. As you do always, Prince of a fur, his companion responded. Is it not true, Bandor, my brother, that we are honoured to be present when Cathar desires? Aye, wine, food, music, and women. What more can a man desire? The massive individual at whom she smiled over a rounded shoulder replied. When Cathar returns, he must come to our house at nearer as he has done before. There are others of Zalaria I desire him to meet, as well as other men of Mazare, besides the noble Bazd, whom we made bold to bring with us tonight. As he finished, the blue man smiled, and Kaifalos, picking up his own goblet of wine, passed it to the Mazarian with a languid grace. Thy friends are my friends, O Bandor of Zalaria, he exclaimed, and bending close to the face of the girl said, Shall I come when I return from a fur? And as he gazed upon her, the heavy lids slowly contracted until her eyes narrowed to slits. Then they shot up, fully open, and she flashed him a smile. I, my Kaiphalos, unless you desire me to suffer, come when you return. Kaiphalos took back the cup from which Bazd, the Mazarian, had drunk and drained it at a gulp. I shall come, he shouted and clapped his hands. Let the entertainment begin. After that, Croft could only watch and marvel at what he beheld. A sound of harps burst forth. Golden and scarlet curtains drew apart at one end of the immense court. He caught a glimpse of moving figures behind them, and then fifty dancing girls broke forth. Swaying, posturing, gesturing, they moved down the hall toward the tables. At first they were clothed, but as they advanced, they dropped veil after veil from their posturing bodies until they gleamed white and pink, swinging figures caught in the eddies of the dance. Closer and closer they came. They reached the tables themselves. They sprang upon them. They danced among the remnants of the feast. The hands of the guests, other companions of Cathar's prince, reached towards them, sought to capture them and draw them down upon the divans. And then the music ceased, Crying aloud, the dancers leaped from the table into the pool. Like nymphs, they swam across it and disappeared behind a curtain of flowers and shrubs at the farther end. Yet in a moment they were back, dragging what looked like a monster shell in which sat the figure of an aged man carrying yet another shell in his hand and wearing a long green robe. This they launched in the pool, and seizing ropes fastened to it, they swam back toward the tables, towing it along. At the corner of the pool they clustered on each side while the aged passenger rose and stepped to land. Kyphalos rose too. Hail Cronor, ruler of the seas, he exclaimed. I am about to entrust myself to your domain for a journey to the south. What fare may I expect? Good, O prince of Cathur, the aged one returned. I shall instruct all handmaids to wait upon you and steer your ship in safety, even as they have brought me into your presence tonight. Kyphalos filled a goblet with wine and held it out. He who played Cronor took it. Drink, the Cathurian cried. Cathur does honour to Cronor thus. Calamita sprang to her feet, she filled other goblets, swiftly motioning the others about the tables to do the same. Drink, her voice rang out. Drink to Cronor, drink to Kyphalos and the safety of his voyage. The toast was drunk. Cronor made his adieus and was towed back to the other side of the pool. Calamita was leaning with both hands locked over Kyphalos's shoulder. Tell me, she whispered. Why does Jack Gore of Afur ask your presence, my friend? I know not, said the Cathurian prince. Some business of state, no doubt, to which I must attend for my father, who grows feeble with age, as you know. The dancing girls were hauling the shell from the pool. 
they made what looked like a straining group in Pink Bisk. It was a pretty play, Kalamita murmured. Did you design it, Kaiphalos? I know from the past you are clever. The man turned and looked once more into her eyes. I designed it. I planned it to amuse you. Croft turned away. He had seen enough. This was the man to whom it was planned to give the woman he, Jason Croft, loved. That sweet, pure Naya of Afer who had knelt two nights ago in appeal before Azil, the angel of life. This scented sensualist, caught fast in the charms of a Zalarian woman of a type Croft could not mistake. Jack Gore had hinted at something like this in his talk with Lacon two days before. And tonight, on the eve of his departure of Afur, Kaiphalos of Cathur sat as the host of the enemies of his land. Surely Jack Gore had reason for the fears he had expressed. Surely here was food for serious thought. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Palus of the Dog Star Pack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Palus of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Giese. A Fuhrer Agrees. Croft left the court and made his way outside into the calm beauty of the night. Flooded by the moonlight, he stood watching the flicker of the fire urns on the waters of the tiny harbour where lay the gilded pleasure craft. And after a time, he turned back, attracted by the fact that the inner lights had died. Only for a moment, however, did he remain inside. In the court, flooded now only by the moons, a wild and loathsome orgy was taking place between the dancing girls and the guests in and about the pool. Cries, shrill laughter, sounds of splashing and fleeting glimpses of flitting shapes told him the full story as to the end of Kaiphalos's feast. It sickened him, and once more he fled the spot to spend the night outside. Naya, the thought came to him. Suddenly he wanted to see her, be near her, away from this scene of brutal carnival where license reigned supreme. He wanted to be in the hills of Afur, where she had her home. And swiftly he was. There was Lacon's palace, white under the triple moons. And here was the window of the room where she had knelt and prayed. Invisible yet seeing, he crept inside like a wraith of the night. Only the moon gave him light, but it showed him the woman of his soul. She lay on the metal couch asleep. Her fair hair shadowed her face as he bent above her. A slender arm was thrown out to one side. Coverings as light as silk betrayed the grace of her form. Her lips were half parted, and as Jason bent down, she sighed. Croft straightened and stood like a guardian spirit above her. His soul was once more on fire at the thought of what was planned. This was the girl who was to be offered to the lecherous young spawn of royalty, even now disporting himself with the tawny siren from another nation, that Calamita, whose name, Croft knew, might best be translated into English as magnet. Calamita the magnet, a human magnet, a female magnet, to draw men to her by her shameless charms and bind them fast, past any chance of escape. How much, he wondered, did Jacor of Afur really know of what was going on? How fully was he informed of what was coming now to seem to Croft as one side of the workings of Solaria's plot? Surely he must know how much to be willing to sacrifice this fair young sleeper his sister's child. Little by little, Croft was coming to understand the workings of Jakor's mind, to believe him a patriot, really rather than a seeker of selfish power, such as he had fancied he might be for all his brave words at first. What then? Croft could not answer. Bound as he was, despite his ability to hear and see and know, he could do nothing in himself. 
All night long he raved in impotent rage, unknowing that by degrees he was solving the problem presented to him. At morn he went back to Anthra. He witnessed the departure of Kaifalos in a gilded galley with red sails and red silken cordage rowed by twenty blue men, ten to each bank of oars. Kalamita's barge, in which rowed the Zolarian woman, her brother and Baz the Mazarian chief, accompanied the Cathurian for some two hours before it turned north and made off for Niera, as Croft gathered from what conversation passed. Kaifalos's craft continued south. Croft let him go. He himself went back to Skira and the national school for his lessons of the day. The Cathurian prince was safe for five days while he sailed and rowed to Himaira. Meanwhile, Croft was determined to learn all he could. It was after that that he first met Jasor and studied him during the few days remaining until the first meeting between Kaifalos and Naya, which he had determined to attend. And in so studying the youth, he discovered Jasor's full recognition of his own shortcomings, and that his knowledge of his own backward mental powers was preying upon his mind to produce a melancholic turn in the young man's thoughts. At night Jasor sat in his quarters brooding, or took long, solitary walks. Even in the four days he lost flesh. Croft realized that his introspections were sapping the young Nodurian's strength, that he was physically as well as mentally sick. He had drawn into himself and no longer took part in the games in which not only the dares of his classmates, but his very stature told Croft he had once excelled. Then came the seventh day, and Croft had willed himself back to Himaira once more, with an eye out for the galley from Anthra along the yellow Na. He found it a little below the city wall, and followed it as it worked its way up the current with flashing, dripping blades which rose and glistened and fell in the brilliant light. Under a scarlet awning, Kaifalos, curled and perfumed, lay on a burnished divan and watched the city slip past until the galley swung into one of the quays in front of the palace, where a chariot accompanied by a part of the royal guard waited as the galley moored. Meanwhile, Vast crowds lined the terraces along that portion of the Na, and trumpets blared a greeting to the northern guest. The Cathurian came ashore and entered the burnished car. The detachment of the guards fell in on either side. The procession mounted the inclines from terrace to terrace past the gathered throngs, until in the end it passed through the monster entrance of the palace and brought up in the principal court. There various nobles of the state, Lacan among them, waited to conduct the visiting noble to a Führer's king. Under their escort, Kaifalos moved through the corridors and across courts to where, in an audience room of huge proportions, Chakor sat in state. Here his guard of honor drew aside and left the prince standing alone as Chakor rose. "'Welcome, Cathur, to such poor hospitality as is mine,' said Afur's king. "'Hail, Afur,' Kaifalos replied, bowing in the least degree. "'Kafur sends greetings through me, his son.' Jakor descended a step of the dais on which he sat. He put out a hand. "'Accept a seat beside me, son of Cathur, whose presence gladdens the eye,' he went on. Kaifalos advanced clasped palms with the Afurian king, mounted the steps, and seated himself on the gilded divan where Jakor had sat alone. The king of Afur turned to two guards stationed on either side. Announce that Kathur is Afur's guest. Kathur is the guest of Afur, proclaimed the soldier heralds. This completed the ceremonial of the royal arrival, and the nobles withdrew, with the exception of Lacon, who had a sign from Jakor, remained and approached the dais. Jakor waved away his guards. I would speak with you on matters of weight, O Kathur, he said when the three were alone. I give ear, king of Afur, Kaifalos replied. Like the man of purpose he was, Jakor did not waste time in airy persiflage. 
Kathir guards the western gate with a fewer kaifalos, he began. To my mind, it occurs the guards are bound by a common interest. It occurs to me to strengthen the tie. To what end? A slight frown grew between the younger man's eyes. He seemed like one taken suddenly by surprise, and his words came only after perceptible pause. To the end of strengthening our nation, Chakor shot out his reply. In one year, Tamhais's reign is done, unless he be re-elected, as you know. With Kithur's help and that of Nodur, which is well assured, and support from Milidur, already promised, Ashur can win the day. Ah! Suddenly Kaifalos smiled, and as swiftly his eyelids drew together. But what? he asked, if Kathur should look toward Zitra as well. Like a stab of light, a thought pierced Croft's listening brain. Was that it? Was that the bait Zolaria held forth? Kaifalos on the throne of Tamarisia, not for ten years, but for life. Zolaria and Tamarisia practically one, if not actually united. Kathur in Zolaria's hands, and Kaifalos, a noble of a vast empire? A dual monarchy such as Palos had never seen? The conception, from the standpoint of royalty at least, was no less than magnificent. Jakor, too, gave his companion a piercing glance. Could Kathur win without a fur? he asked. Kaifalos shrugged. My words were but a question, he evaded the direct answer. What does a fur propose? An alliance of their houses, Jakor said, and paused. And once more Kaifalos frowned without reply. Plainly, he was giving this matter a consideration. Chakor resumed. It is in our minds to offer you the fairest flower in Afur's garden of women to this end. Hi, a woman! Thou meanest marriage? Kaifalos cried. Aye. Kaifalos smiled. And this wonderful woman, who is she? The daughter of Prince Lacon here. Chakor declared, Naya, the child of my sister, more beautiful than any girl in Afur, and pure as the virgin Ga. Naya, Kaifalos's eyes lighted, I have heard of her, O Afur. It would seem you plan to make this alliance strong. The guard of the western gate should be strong, Chakor said. Kaifalos nodded, Yet have I never seen her he remarked in a tone of musing, though the fame of her beauty has reached Kathur ere this. I have heard she hath hair like spun gold and eyes as purple as the twilight in the mountains. Is this true? Kathur shall judge the truth for himself, Chakor made response. Prince Lacan craves the presence of Kaifalos at a feast tomorrow night. The maiden shall be there. Good. Once more, Kaifalos smiled. Women were his main interest in life. I have never given serious thought to marriage, yet it can do no harm to see this fairest of Afur's maids. Say to Prince Lacon that Kathir shall do himself the pleasure to accept his invitation to a feast. As for the rest, he shrugged, a man, O Jukgor, should never marry in haste. I must think upon your words." There was something in the Cathurian's mind. Croft tried to read the secret thought and failed. Jakor, too, seemed to sense some reason beyond the one assigned for the man's hesitation, although an immediate answer was hardly to have been expected to such a proposition as that by which the prince was faced. And Jakor did not seek to press the matter further. Instead, he turned to Lacon with a request to escort the royal guest to the rooms prepared against his coming, and rose from his seat. Croft sought Prince Lacon's palace without more delay. He found it receiving the finishing touches of preparation for the Cuthurian's entertainment, and Naya, with her own maid beside her, supervising the hangings of fresh draperies in the huge central court. His soul quickened at the sight of her, and then sank as he saw the expression of her face. It was an expression of deliberate endurance, and he recalled how nights before she had sighed in her sleep. Yet he hovered near her, and after hours Lacon himself arrived and came to her side. 
father and daughter sat upon one of the carved and gilded seats with which the court had been set forth. Naya looked into Lacan's eyes. What said the Cathurian to Jakgor's proposal, she inquired. He accepted our invitation for the night after this, Lacan replied. He seems a cautious man. He would see you before he decides. He would see me, Naya of a fewer flushed. He would view me, learn if I please his royal fancy. Zitu, must I submit to this? Nay, Lacan shook his head. Kathira's prince was but gaining time to consider all sides of the case. Jakgor's offer took him by surprise. Perhaps, said Naya in almost eager fashion, he does not wish a wife. Lacan shook his head again. Scythus, his father, is old. Caiphalus must marry when he gains the throne at latest. Is everything prepared? Aye, even to the sacrifice. Naya's tone was bitter. She rose and moved away without more words, mounting the stairs toward her rooms. Croft's heart was bitter, too, as he left the place and returned by his will to Skira and the apartment of Jesor of Nodur. Just why he went there he hardly knew, save that the sympathy he felt for the soul-sick youth seemed to keep the boy in his mind. Yet once in his presence he found the youth sitting before an untouched plate of food, and after a time he hurled this to the floor and buried his head in his hands to break into muttered speech. Croft listened, and after a time he found the cause. Jesor's father had sent him word to come home. The two leaves of a writing tablet, bits of thin metal covered with hardened wax, in which characters were cut with a metal stylus, lay unbound and spread out on the table where the food had sat. Jesor's father had evidently become convinced that his son was a dullard and was wasting his time in seeking to learn more than he already knew. Croft remained with him during the night. For a time he whimpered and cursed. Later he destroyed the tablets as he had destroyed his food. After that he flung himself on his couch, and for hours he dozed and waked and tossed and muttered. Croft fancied him in a fever from the broken nature of the words he spoke, and in the morning the boy did not rise. The woman of whom he rented his lodgings came to clean and found him muttering and mouthing. He sprang up and drove her from the room. She ran crying downstairs and out to the street and along it for some distance to a house where, quite evidently, one of the nursing caste lived. Presently a woman in the uniform of her calling, a short blue-skirted costume, embroidered with a red heart-shaped symbol, came forth and followed her back to her house. Five minutes after her arrival she had sent the old woman for a doctor, and was herself bathing Jesor's flushed neck and face. The doctor came, examined the patient, left some liquid substance to be given in interval doses, and went away. Croft remained till evening. Jesor was more quiet by then, and he left. But, physician as he was, he felt that the young Nodurian's days were numbered, and that unless he had the will to recover he would sink slowly and die in the end. And he knew Jesor had not the will to get well. His own will carried him to Himaira in a flash, and to Lacan's palace at once. Night had fallen when he reached it, and the central court was a blaze of light from a myriad of oil lamps. In the main expanse of the crystal flooring, the tables were set forth, decked with flowers and loaded with viands. Serving men and maidens of the blue Mazarian race were still at work in the final preparations. Of Naya or Lacan, there was no sign. The latter came down the stairs at one end, after some time, however, and signing to Basca, the Mazarian Majordomo, took up a place near the massive doors. There he remained until a clatter of hoofs marked the first arriving guests. They came in a stream thereafter, nobles of Afur and their daughters and wives, captains of the civic guard, and finally, with a blare of trumpets from riders mounted on Nupas, Jakgor himself and Kaifolos, in a gold coach drawn by eight Nupas, harnessed four abreast. And still Naya had not appeared. But as the king of Afur and the 
Prince of Kathur moved down the crystal pave from the doors toward the tables in the center of the court, she came slowly down the stairs. Croft stared in delight. She was a thing of purple and gold. The gown she had described that first day wrapped her supple form like a second skin from right shoulder to hip and fell from there to the knees. It was a shimmering thing, embroidered in purple stones. Halfway down the stairs she stood and inclined her head, while Jakgor and Kaifulos paused. Then, as the men advanced, she began again to descend, until near the head of the table she sank on her left knee and bowed before the king. Jakgor's own hand helped her to rise. Jakgor made Kaifulos known. Prince and princess touched hands. Lacan led toward the feast. At the head sat Jacor and Kaifalos, side by side. Lacan reclined beside the king. Naya's place was on the prince of Cathur's left. Blue servants in Lacan's livery placed the other guests and began their service at once. For an hour the feast went on. Hidden musicians filled the air with the sound of their harps, that snow-chilled wine of which Lacan had spoken, poured from golden pitchers into goblets of silver as serving maids passed up and down the board to keep all well supplied. Croft noted Kaifalos more closely than the rest. He had seen the swift lighting of his eyes when Naya appeared on the stairs, the swift, instinctive parting of his two full lips, the twitch of his nostrils, accompanying that first glance of the maid suggested for his wife. Now, as he lay on the divan, he found him watching her with what seemed a steady interest, plying her with gallant conversation, finding excuse to frequently touch her hands, staring into her long-lashed purple eyes. With his resentment for the Cathurian growing by swift leaps and bounds, he realized that Kaifalos was impressed, sensed that before this chaste beauty of his own people he had forgotten Zolaria's magnet for the time. Also he thought it had been better had the wine been less nicely chilled, for Kaifalos drank deep, and his eyes began to sparkle as time passed with new toasts proposed and drunk about the board. It came to Croft that Cathur's prince was losing his head at a time when he had better have kept it, as his voice became more and more loud. Intoxication may be very well on Anthra, where it was the accepted thing. In Himaira and the palace of Lacan, before his proposed bride, it might prove another thing. He was strengthened in his belief by the questioning glance Naya cast at the northern noble from time to time. A glance of something like surprised dismay. The harps struck up a different measure toward the last. Golden curtains parted under the balcony near the stairs. A band of dancing girls trooped in. They were things of beauty, laughing-faced, their soft hair flowing clad in what seemed no more than garlands of flowers twined about their slender bodies and halfway down their limbs. Beginning to dance, they advanced, and as they danced, they sang. The scene became one of rhythmic beauty, delightful to the senses. Each girl bore a particolored veil of gauze and waved it as she moved. Massed inside the rectangle of the tables on the crystal floor, they seemed to be a very dancing, nodding bed of flowers, amid which twinkled their flying feet and gesturing arms, beating time to the pulse of the harps. Then it was done. The dancers were drawing back with graceful genuflections, as applause broke forth from the guests. Lacan tossed a handful of silver pieces among them, Jakgor cast a double handful of jewels into the scarf of a maid who advanced at his sign. "'Divide them among you,' he said. The girl sank to the floor and rose. "'Hold!' cried Kathuris prince. His face was flushed and his eyes shone with an unholy light. Croft saw his nostrils fairly quiver as he watched the lissom dancer. He lifted himself and struck the table. "'Up!' he commanded thickly. Up, beauteous maid! With a glance at Jakgor, who made no sign whatever, the dancing girl obeyed. She stood on the table before Kaifalos. 
Unveil, he said. Again the woman glanced at Afura's king, but Jakor did not draw back from the situation invoked by his bibulous guest. Too much hung on the moment, as Jakor saw it, to quibble over the uncloaking of a dancer. Unveil, he added his command. The girl lifted her hands. Her garlands fell away. She stood a lithely rounded form, her feet lost in the mass of blossoms she had worn. Kaifalos laughed. His eyes were blazing. He caught up a goblet of wine and rose. Hail, Adita, goddess of womanly beauty, he exclaimed. Now are you perfect as you stand revealed, stripped of the silly trappings which concealed the greater charms beneath. Flowers are things of beauty in their place, but woman unadorned is the fairest flower of life. Arise, my friends, and drink with me to woman as she is, this new Adita I have found." They rose at Jakgor's sign, though Croft caught more than one glance of question passing among the guests. So much he saw, and turned back to Naya, who had risen too, her face a mask of outraged dignity and scorn. Kaifalos lifted his goblet and set it to his lips. Naya lifted hers and cast it from her so that its contents spilled and flowed across the table at the dancer's feet. "'Thou beast!' her voice came in tones of sharp displeasure. "'Thou sensuous offspring of Cathur! "'Tis thus I drink your toast!' Silence came down. A breathless pause about the tables. Kaifalus lowered his cup and turned toward the princess of Afur slowly. And suddenly the Cathurian smiled. He replaced his goblet on the table and sank to one knee before the haughty daughter of his host. By Zitu, his voice rang out, but you are truly royal. You are magnificent, daughter of Afur. Did I pick me a lesser toy? Twas but that I knew you for what you are, one fit to be a queen. Naya of Afur, wilt pledge yourself queen of Cathur's throne? The words were out. Croft felt his senses sink. Yet even so, he saw the whole psychology of the event. To Cathur, the maiden offered had seemed but an easy prize, to take at his pleasure, if at all. To Cathur, drunk, the dancer had appealed. To Cathur, still drunk, Naya of Afur, offended, angered, hurling her scorn in his teeth, appeared suddenly not a thing to be taken lightly, but a beautiful consort to be won, if taken at all. On Jakgor's face was a satisfaction unvoiced. He rose and lifted his hands. My lords and ladies, he announced, I call you witness that Cathur asks the hand of Afur's princess. Let Naya choose. Kaifalus drew himself up and folded his arms. To Croft it seemed the man was sobered by Jakgor's words. Yet as cries of assent and acclamation rang out through the court, he remained silent before the tense figure of the girl. And slowly the golden head beneath the curling plume of purple bowed. One bared arm rose and it extended its fingers toward the northern prince. Afur accepts. Her words came scarcely above a whisper, and were drowned in a greeting roar of voices upraised by the waiting guests. Cathura caught the extended hand and turned to the forward straining faces, the watching eyes. A happy consummation to our feast, rang the words of Afur's king. Men and women of Afur, this shall be arranged. I, Jakgor, myself, shall sponsor the formal betrothal on a day one-twelfth of a cycle hence. The thing was done. A month from tonight would see it ratified. A sick impotency filled Croft's soul as once more cries of approbation greeted the promise of the king. And into the midst of his despair there flashed one ray of blinding thought. Before it he staggered, drew back, shaken in the primal elements of his being. Yet he did not put it aside. He held it. He marveled at it and suddenly taking it with him, he left the scented atmosphere of Lacan's palace court and rose up toward the heavens, studded with stars. To earth 
His will, gathered, centered, focused by the wonder of the thing he had conceived, cast all its driving power into the demand. Palos and all it held sank swiftly away beneath him. He opened the eyes of the form he left on his library couch. End of chapter 8「Chapter Number Nine of Palos of the Dog Star Pack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Russell Packer. Palos of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Jeezy. Twixt Earth and Heaven. Nothing had been disturbed. Everything was as he had last seen it, save that a layer of dust had collected, thanks to the absence of Mrs. Goss, and that due to the difference of the length of the Pelasian day. Nine terrestrial days had passed since Croft had lain his body on the couch. Rising slowly, he ignited the flame of a small alcohol lamp, and quickly brewed himself a cup of strong beef extract, which he drank. The hot beverage and the food put new physical life into his sluggish veins, as he knew it would. Seating himself in a chair, he gave himself over to a consideration of the thought he had brought with him from Palos, a thought more weird than any of which he had ever dreamed. Briefly, Croft had conceived of a way to acquire a physical life on Palos. That was his unheard-of plan the possibility of which had wakened in his consciousness as Jack Gurr announced the formal betrothal of Naya and Kyphalus at the end of the month. It was that that had sent him back here to his study and his books. And after a bit he rose and drew a volume from a case and brought it back to the desk. It was a work dealing with obsessions, that theory of the occultist that a stronger spirit might displace the weaker tenant of an earthly shell and occupy and dominate the body it had possessed. He read over the written page and sat pondering once more while the night dragged past. Even as he had gone a step farther in astral projection, carrying it into spirit projection as a further step, so now he was considering a step beyond mere obsession and questioning whether or not it were possible for a spirit, potent beyond the average ego of earth, to enter and revivify the body laid down by another soul. His thoughts were of Jasor as he sat there wrapped in thought. The young Nodurian was dying, unless Croft's medical knowledge was all at fault. Yet he was dying not from disease in the physical sense. His body was organically healthy. It was his soul which was sick unto death. And here was the wonderful question. Could Croft's strong spirit enter Jasor's body as Jasor laid it aside and, operating on the still inherent and reasonably sound cell energy still contained within it, possess it for its own? It was an amazing thought, a daring thought, yet not so far beyond the spirit which had dared the emptiness of the unknown in the adventure which had brought Croft to his present position thereby inspiring the thought itself. Day broke, however, before Croft made up his mind. He realized fully that he must remain on earth for a day or two to provide his present body against another period of chance. He realized also that in the experiment he meant to make, he might lose that earthly body and fail in his other attempt at one and the same, but he made up his mind nonetheless. Should he succeed, he would live as an inhabitant of Palos, would be able to physically stand between Naya, the one woman of his soul, and her fate, and, winning, be able perhaps to claim her for himself. Against the possibility of such a consummation to his great adventure, no argument of a personal peril held weight. Croft sent for Mrs. Goss, telegraphing her shortly after it was light. He spent the day waiting her arrival in feeding his body with concentrated foods. He met her when she came, and for a week life went on in the Croft house as it had gone on before. 
Then Croft summoned the little woman and bade her sit down in one of the library chairs. He told her he was engaged on a wonderful investigation of the forces of life. He made her understand dimly he was doing something never attempted before, which, if succeeded, would make him very happy. He explained he was about to take a long sleep, that it would last for three and possibly four days. He forbade her to disturb his body during that time, or touch it for a week. Then, if he was not returned in his sane mind, she might know that he was dead. With quivering lips and wide eyes and apron-plucking hands, she promised to obey. Croft sensed her anxiety for himself, and tried to be very gentle as he saw her from the room. But with the door closed behind her, he moved quickly to the couch and stretched himself out. For a moment he lay staring about the familiar room. Then into his mind there came a thought of Naya and of Jasor, of love for the one and pity for the other. He smiled and fastened his mind on the object of this present attempt, and suddenly his eyelids closed and his body relaxed. Once more time and space suffered annihilation, and he knew himself in Jasor's room. It was full. The nurse was there and the physician, and there was another, a young man with a strong, composed face, clad in a tunic of unembroidered brown, whom Croft recognized as a priest. He stood by the couch on which Jasor laid, pallid as wax, with closed lids and a barely perceptible respiration. He held the silver basin in his hands, and as Croft watched, he sprinkled the face of the dying youth with his fingers dipped in the water it contained. A quiver of emotion shook Croft's spirit. He had returned to Palos none too soon. The priest drew back. The doctor approached the bed. He lifted the wrist of Jasor and set his fingers to the pulse. In a moment he laid it down and bowed his head. As he did so, Jasor sighed once, deeply, like one very tired. He passes, the physician said. Priest, nurse, and physician all saw it, but Croft saw more than they. He saw the astral form, the sole body of Jasor, rise from the discarded clay, and swiftly casting aside all other considerations, he willed his own consciousness into the vacant brain. Thereafter followed an experience, the most terrible he had ever known. He was within Jasor's body, yet he was chained. For what seemed hours he fought to control the physical elements of the flesh he formed he had seized. And always he failed. In some indefinable way it seemed to resist the new tenant who had taken the place of the old. Croft describes his own sensations as those of one who presses against and seeks to move an immovable weight. He suffered, suffered until the very suffering broke down the bonds in a demand for some outward expression. Then, and only then, he knew that the chest of the body had once more moved, and that he had drawn air into the lungs. Encouraged, he exerted his staggering will afresh, and, he knew he was looking into the faces above him through Jasor's physical eyes. He lives! With Jasor's ears he heard the physician exclaim, This passes understanding, man of Zitu. He was dead, yet now he lives again? The ways of Zitu oft pass the understanding, man of healing, said the priest advancing to the bed. What is man to understand the things that Zitu plans? Croft thrilled. Coordination between his conscious spirit and the body of the man of Palos was established. He had won again, won a visible, material existence on the planet with the woman he loved. The thought brought a sense of absolute satisfaction. He closed the lids above Jasor's eyes and slept. For several hours he lay in restful slumber, then awoke refreshed. His deductions had been correct. Jaser's body was healthy, aside from the weakening influences of his spirit. Given a strong spirit to dominate it now, it responded in full tide. He glanced about. It was night. By the dim light of an oil lamp he saw two persons in the room. 
One was the nurse, the other was the priest. They appeared to converse in lowered tones. Man of Zitu, Croft spoke for the first time with his newfound tongue. The priest rose and hurried to him. My son. I am much improved, said Croft. In the morning I shall be almost wholly well. It is a miracle, the priest declared, holding his forearms horizontally before him until he made a perfect cross. A miracle, Croft considered the words. They carried a sudden meaning to his mind. Truly the priest had spoken rightly. This was little short of a miracle indeed, did the other know the facts. Swiftly Croft formed a plan. Father, what is your name? he inquired. Abu, my son. Croft turned his eyes. Send the nurse away. I would talk with you alone. The priest spoke to the woman, who withdrew slowly, her face a mingled mask of emotions, chief among which Croft read a sort of awed wonder. Why does she look at me like that? he asked. The priest seated himself on a stool beside the couch. I said your recovery was a miracle, my son, he replied. I am minded that I told the truth. You have changed. Even your face has changed while you slept. You are not the same. Croft felt his muscles stiffen. He understood. The new spirit was molding the fleshy elements to itself, uniting itself to them, knitting soul and body together. The experiment was a success. He smiled. That is true, Father Abu, he replied. I am not the same as the Jasor who died. Died? The priest drew back, eyes widened. Died, repeated Croft. Listen, Father, these things must be in confidence. I, Abu agreed. Croft told what had occurred. Abu heard him out. At the end he was seized by a shaking which caused him to quiver through body and limbs. Listen, Father, Croft said. I am not Jasor, though I inhabit his form. Yet I know something of him, and of Tamarazia as well. Jasor had a father. And a mother, the priest inclined his head. Croft had gained information, but he did not make a comment upon it then. To them I must appear still as Jasor, he returned. They are looked for in Skira, Abu declared. We hope for their coming. Why have you done this thing? Are you good or evil? Good, by the grace of Zitu, said Croft. I come to help Tamarizia. Think you I could have come had not Zitu willed? Suddenly the face of the young priest flamed. Nay, he cried and rose to stand by the couch. Now my eyes are open and I see. This thing is of Zitu, nor could he save by his will. It is as I said, a miracle indeed. Again he lifted his arms in the sign of the cross. Then, said Croft, striking quickly while the man was lost in the grip of religious fervor, will you help me do that for which I came? Will you help me to help Tamarazia should the need arise? I, to his surprise, Abu sank before him on bended knees. How am I to serve him who comes at the behest of Zitu in so miraculous a way? Call me Jasor as in the past, decided Croft. The name was near enough to his own to fit easily into both his ears and mouth. Yet think me not, Jasor, he went on. Jasor was a dullard, weak in his brain. Soon shall I show you things such as you've never dreamed. Think you I am Jasor, or another indeed? You are not Jasor, said the priest. Nay, by Zitu himself I swear it, said Croft. Now go and send back the nurse. Say nothing of what I have told you. Swear silence by Zitu and come to me every day. I swear. Abu promised, rising. And I shall come, O spirit sent by Zitu. He left the room backward and with bowed head. Croft let every cell of his new body relax and stretched out. He closed his eyes as he heard the nurse return and gave himself up to thought. It appeared to him that he had made a very good beginning and won an ally in Abu. 
into whose astonishment he had woven a thread of the man's own religion to strengthen his belief. Now it remained to gain utter control of the body he possessed, to master it completely, and make it not only responsive to his physical use, but to so impregnate it with his own essence that he might leave it for short times at least in order to return to the earth. And to accomplish that he had just four days. Lying there apparently asleep, he sought to exercise that control he possessed over the body now lying on his library couch. Then he failed. Strive as he might, he could not compass success. In something like a panic, he desisted after a time and sought to fight back to a balanced mental calm. Was he trapped? he asked himself. Was he a prisoner of the thing he had sought to make his own? Reason told him the question was folly, that already the body was responding in a physical sense. In the end, he decided to take a longer time in his endeavors, and so at last fell into a genuine sleep. From that he awakened to the sound of voices, and turned his eyes to behold a woman past middle age, with graying hair, and a man strongly built, with a well-featured face, in the room. Working swiftly, his mind recalled Abu's words concerning Jasor's parents. The priest had said they are expected in Skira. This woman, then, must be the Nodurian's mother. He opened his lips and called her by that word. She ran to him and sank her knees by the couch. Jasor, my son, she cried in a voice which quavered, and as the man approached more slowly, turned her face upward to meet his eyes. He knows me, Sinon. He knows me, she said. Ay, Malia, praise be to Zitu. Jasor, my son, dost thou know me also? The Nodurian's father said. Ay, sir, said Croft, marking his parents' names. But how come you in Skira? Did we not write that we should arrive and take you with us on our return? Sinon asked. Croft saw it in a flash and the slip he had made. This explained Abu's assertion that they were expected. The tablets hurled to the floor by Jasor had been deciphered after his illness, it appeared. Aye, he admitted somewhat faintly. But I have been ill. And are recovered now, he who was to be his father said. Aye, had I my clothing, I could rise. We shall return then at once, Sinon declared. But Malia, the mother broke into protests, and Croft became much more cautious, spoke for delay. He did not wish to undertake a trip to Noder before he had returned to Earth. That was necessary if he was to protect his Earth body from Mrs. Goss at the end of the week, since now he knew he must have more time. He determined to make another attempt at escape from his new body, when he would appear merely to be asleep. And he succeeded late that night. Freeing himself, and once more rousing on the library couch, he did several things at once. He examined his own body and found it sound. He wrote a note telling his housekeeper he had returned and gone away for at least a month. He knew many a body had been kept entranced for longer periods by the Indian adepts of the East, so did not fear the attempt. Next, he crept upstairs to his former bedroom and packed a suitcase carrying it to one of the several spare rooms seldom used and always kept closed. Locking himself into his room, he opened the window slightly to assure a supply of air. He had told Mrs. Goss to remain at the house or go to her daughter's, as she preferred, until his return. He felt assured he would be undisturbed. Laying himself on the bed, he once more satisfied himself that all was as he wished it, and returned to Jasor's room. End of chapter number nine. Chapter ten of Palus of the Dog Star Pack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Palus of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Giese. Whom Zitu Changed Dawn was breaking on Pelos as he opened his eyes. The nurse dozed not far from his couch. 
He waked her and demanded his clothing. She brought it in some doubt and assisted him to put it on. Ten minutes later, he sat on the edge of the couch, a Pelosian in all physical seeming. Yet the woman regarded him still in a more or less uncertain fashion. Croft smiled. Thank you for your kindness, my nurse, he said. I shall ask my father to remunerate you for it. Now I would eat. She nodded and hurried from the room to return with food. Hardly had Croft disposed of the meal with a zest evoked of his physical needs that Sinon of Nodur appeared. Croft rose and stood as the man came in. We return home today, my father, he declared. Sinon seemed embarrassed before the words of his son. I, if you wish, he made answer after a pause, sit you, my son. We must speak together. Your sickness has wrought changes within you. You are not the Jesor to whom I wrote it were useless to remain in Skira. The glance of your eye, the sound of your voice, even the lines of your face have changed. Croft smiled. That is true, he agreed. Yet even so, it is of small value to remain in Skira, since now I know all and more than the learned men can teach me were I to linger among them for many more cycles than I have. Zitu, Sinon regarded him oddly. My son, is this change to make you a braggart instead of a dullard? He began slowly after a time. Not so, Croft returned. My father... I am as one born anew. I shall prove my words, yet not until I have returned to our home. Let us begin the journey this day. It shall be as you wish, Sinon said, and left the room. Later Abu came and was admitted. To him, Croft explained that he was going south to Nyodur with his father. He went further and questioned the priest concerning Sinon himself, learning that he was a wealthy merchant, residing in Ladra, capital of the southern state. The information was a considerable shock to Croft. The merchant caste, while exercising great influence and weight in Tamarisian affairs, were not of noble blood. Hence now, at the very beginning, he found himself confronted by a gulf of caste separating him from Naya of Afur, hardly less completely than before he had made Jesor's body his own. For a moment the thought occurred to him that he had chosen that body rather badly. Then his natural determination came to his aid, and he set his lips as he resolved to find a way to win to Naya's side. Abu rather drew back before the gleam which crept into his eyes. Jesor, since I know you by no other name, he cried, wherein have I given offence? Croft laughed. He rose and flexed his arms and stared into Abu's face, in nothing. I was but thinking, he made answer. Abu, give me tablets to the priesthood at Himaira, stating those things you have seen. Abu nodded. You stop at Himaira, he said. Aye. The first step of winning to the woman of his soul flashed into Croft's brain, even as his plan for winning a body had flashed there days before. But he kept it to himself, locked safely in his breast, as he set forth for his new home with his parents, Sinon and Melia, that afternoon. That Sinon of Nodur was wealthy, he was assured when he saw the galley in which the homeward journey was to be made. It was a swift craft, gilded and ornate as to hull and masts and spars. Ten rowers furnished power on its two banks of oars, seated on the benches in the waist of the hull. Behind them were the cabin and a deck under an awning of the silk-like fabric, a brilliant green in hue. Not only did all this show Croft his supposed father's financial condition, but he learned from Sinon that he was the owner of a fleet of merchant craft which plied up and down the Na, and across the central sea. In addition, the largesse Sinon bestowed on the nurse was evidence of a well-filled purse. All these things Croft considered in the intervals of conversation with Sinon and Melia, while the galley ran south. In his boyhood, Jason had been possessed of a natural aptitude for mechanics. In later manhood, he had owned and operated his own automobiles, making most of the repairs upon the cars himself. Learning now of his father's line of business, it occurred to him to revolutionize 
transportation on Palos as a first step toward making his name a word familiar to every tongue. To this end, he approached Sinon the first evening as he and Melia reclined on the deck. My father, he said, what if the trip to Ladra could be shortened by half? Shortened in what fashion? Sinon asked, turning a swift glance toward Croft. By increasing the speed, Sinon smiled. The galley is the best product of our builders, he replied. Granted, said Croft, but were one to place a device upon it to do the work of the rowers with ten times their strength? Zitu, Sinon lifted himself on his couch. What, Jesor, is this? What mean you, my son? What is this device? One I have in mind, Croft told him. Come, you make your money with ships. Apply some of it to making them more swift of motion. Let me make this device, and they shall mount the na more swiftly than now they run with the current and the wind. Sinon turned his eyes to the woman at his side. And this is our son, who was a dullard, he exclaimed. In whom I always have had faith. Melia replied with a smile of maternal joy on her face. "'You have faith in this thing he proposes?' Sinon went on. "'Ay, I think Zitu himself spoke to him in his death-like sleep,' the woman said. "'Then by Zitu he shall make the attempt,' Sinon roared. "'Should he succeed, the king himself would make him a knight for his service to the state.' Croft's heart leaped and ran racing for a minute at the words— Knighthood. That was the answer to the question in his brain, the bridge which should cross the gulf between Naya of Afur and himself. He crushed back his emotions, however, and faced Sinon again. Then I may carry out my plan? Aye, to the half of my wealth, Sinon declared. Jesor, I do not understand the change which has come upon you, but this thing you may do if you can. Then we start at Himaira, Croft announced. At Himaira? Sinon stared. Aye, I would see Jakkor of Ashur so quickly as I may. See Jakkor? You? Sinon protested. Think you Jakkor receives men of our caste without good cause? He will see Jesor of Nodur, Croft told him with a smile. Wait, my father, and you shall witness that and more. And now all doubt, all foreboding left him, and he planned. That night, as he lay in his bunk aboard the galley, he smiled. To him, it seemed that any doubt must have been transferred to the minds of Sinon and Melia. He heard them speaking above the lap of the waters and the squeak of the oars. He realized how much of an enigma he had become to these two who believed themselves his parents. How wonderful to them must be the change in their son! But his own mind was coolly collected and calm. He would see Jakkor. He would use his knowledge of that monarch's present wishes to interest him in his plans. He would become not a knight of Nodur, but a knight of Afur instead. And then, then, Croft smiled and fell asleep. The next day he questioned Sinon concerning the nature of the oil used in the lamps and found it a vegetable product, as he had feared. But... He had been given evidence that the wine supply of the country held no small alcoholic content, which could be recovered in pure form with comparative ease. And he knew enough of motors to know that slight changes would enable them to burn alcohol in lieu of petroleum gas. Straightway, he asked for something on which to draft his plans. Sinon, eager now in the development of his son's remarkable plan, furnished parchment and brushes with a square of colour, something like India ink, and Croft set to work during the remainder of the trip. He had assembled more than one motor in his day, and after deciding upon his type of construction, he immediately went to work. At the end of four days, while the galley was mounting the Na toward the gates of Himaira, he finished the first drafting of parts, and was ready for Jakor the king. Yet he did not go to Jakor first, when once he has stepped ashore. Wait here, he requested Sinon. After a time I shall return. Hold, my son, Sinon objected at once. What have you in mind? 
To see the priest of Zitu without delay, Croft replied without evasion. Shall Jakor not give ear if the priest of Zitu asks? And the priest? Sinon asked. I carry a message to him from Abu of Skira. Croft held up the tablets that Abu had inscribed. My son, Sinon gave him a glance of admiration. Go, and Zitu go with you. We shall wait for you here. Croft nodded and left. He had purposely had the galley moored as near the palace as he might. Now he rapidly made his way to the bridge across the Na and along it to the middle span, and there he paused and gazed about him, at the palace, the pyramid, the vista of the terraced stream. This was Himyra. This was the home of Naya. Today he stood here unheralded and unknown. Yet he stood there because of the dominant spirit which was his, which had dared all to stand there, and it should not be long until all Himyra, all Tamarisia, knew of Jesor of Nodur, as he surely must be known. He went on across the bridge and approached the pyramid. It lifted its vast pile above him. He found an inclined way and began to mount. After a considerable time, he reached the top and entered the temple itself. The huge statue of Zitu sat there as he had seen it in his former state. Now, almost without volition, he bent his knees before it. After all, it stood for the one eternal source. He gave it reverence as such. A voice spoke to him as he knelt. He rose and confronted a priest. "'Who art thou?' the latter asked advancing toward him. How come you here at no hour appointed for prayer? Croft smiled and held forth the tablets he had brought. The priest took them, unbound them, and looked at the salutation. His interest quickened. Ye come from Skira, he said. I, carrying these tablets from the good Abu, as you see. The priest considered. Come, he said again at last, and led the way back of the statue to the head of a descending stair. Together they went down, along the worn tread of stone steps turning here and there, until at length they came into a lofty apartment where sat a man in robes of an azure blue. Before him Croft's guide bowed. My pardon, Megyor, priest of Zitu, he spoke still in his stilted formal way, but one comes carrying tablets inscribed with thy name. Even now he knelt in the holy place, so that I questioned, asking what he sought. Megur, high priest in Himyra, at least as Croft judged, took the tablets and scanned each leaf. As he read, his expression altered, grew at first well-nigh startled, and after that nothing short of amazed. In the end he waved the lay brother from the room and faced Croft alone. "'Thou art called How?' He began, Jesor of Nodur, son of Sinon and Melia of Nodur, Croft replied, whom Abu writes, Zitu hath changed? I. Thou comest to Himaira, why? To assist the state, to safeguard Tamarisia from the designs of Zolaria, perhaps. Hold, Megir cried, what know ye of Zolaria's plans? Zolaria desires Kathur and plots the downfall of Tamarisia, priest of Zitu. Think that I bring no knowledge to my task? Yet, were you Jesor indeed, thou mightest know somewhat of Zolaria's plans to some extent, said the priest. And Jesor was no dullard, as the schools of Skira will declare, Croft flashed back. Let my works show whether I stand a fool or not. Thy works? Megir inquired. I, those I shall do in Tamarisia's name. The first shall be one which shall span the desert twenty times as quickly as the Sarpelka caravan, or drive a boat without sails or oars, or propel a carriage without any gnupa, and so haul ten times the load. Thou canst do this? Megir laid the tablets on the lap of his robe and sat staring at the man who spoke such words. I... And what do you desire of me? An audience with Jakor, 
Croft replied, since Afur's king suspects the things Zolaria plans. Megir frowned. Croft's knowledge seemed to have swept him somewhat off his feet. For moments he sat without motion or sound. But after a time he raised his head. To me, Abu seemeth right in this, he said. In this, Zitu's hand is. This thing shall be arranged. He clapped his hands. A brown-robed priest appeared. Prepare my chariot for use, the high priest said. The other bowed and withdrew. Thereafter, Megur sat through another period of silence ere he rose, and, signing to Croft, led him through a passage to a small metal platform which, when Megir pulled on a slender cord, began to descend. Croft smiled. It was a primitive sort of elevator, as he saw while they sank down a narrow shaft. He fancied it not unlike the ancient lifts employed in Nero's palace in Rome. But he made no comment as they reached the bottom of the shaft and emerged past double lines of bowing priests to the waiting chariot. Magir mounted and took the reins. Croft stepped into a place at his side. The Nupas leaped forward at a word. They rumbled down the street and out upon the bridge. Croft had crossed it alone and on foot an hour before. Now he rode back in the car of Zitu's priest. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of Palos of the Dog Star Pack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Palos of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Giese. With a motor in Palos. And in that car he passed the palace gates where the winged dogs stood guard and entered the palace court. Guards in burnished cuirasses leaped to the Nupa's heads when Megur drew rein. Inclining his head, Megur stepped from his car and led the way within that wing of the palace where Croft already knew that Jakgor led his private life. The high priest moved as of perfect right, saluted by a sentry here and there in corridor and hall. So at length he came to two guardsmen posted outside a door of moulded copper embossed with the symbol of the setting sun, which Croft sensed at once as Effure's sign. And here Megur asked for the king. Quitting his fellow, one of the guardsmen disappeared through the door, was absent for some few moments, and returned. Leaving the door agape behind him, he signaled Megur and Croft to enter the room beyond. Thus for the third time Croft came upon Jakgor of Afur, and now, as on the first occasion, he found him in the room where he had conversed with Lacan concerning a way to counter Zolaria's plans. Yet now for the first time he met Afur's ruler in the flesh and faced him man to man. Megur approached the seat where Jakgor waited his coming. King of Afur, he said, I bring with me Jesor of Nodur, in whom Zitu himself has worked a miracle, as it seems, so that he who was known as a dull wit for cycles at Skira's school, having fallen ill unto death, returns to life with a changed mind, and comes bringing tablets to me from a brother in Skira, to the end that I gain him audience with thee. With me... Jakor said, bending a glance at Croft. I. Jakor continued to study Croft. To what end? he inquired at length. To the end that Himaira and all Afur may grow strong beyond any Tamarisian dream, and Kathur never mount the throne at Zitra, Croft replied. Jakor started. He narrowed his eyes. What talk is this? he cried, his strong hand gripping the edge of his seat. Jakgor the king knows best in his heart, said Croft, and waited. I ask but his aid to bring this thing to pass. These things have been spoken to Megur? Jakgor turned his eyes to the face of the priest. Aye, Croft said quickly. Jakgor nodded. Then speak of them to me. An hour passed while Croft explained, and the two Tamarisians listened or bent about the drawings he unrolled. 
And this, how do you name it? Chakor began at last. Motur. Croft threw the word into the native speech. This motur will do these things? Chakor asked in a tone of amaze. All I have promised, and more. And what is required to bring this to pass? Workers in metals, a supply of wine to be used as I shall direct, and a closed mouth that Kathur shall not be advised nor permitted to view the work until done. These things are granted. I shall see it arranged. Chakor turned his eyes again in Megur's direction. Priest of Zitu, Zitu's own hand appears in the plans of Jesor's mind. The designs of Zitu himself have surely entered his soul. I, Jakor, shall sponsor the carrying out. And once more he addressed Croft. When shall this work begin? So soon as Afur wills. Good! Jakor clapped his hands. He was a man of action, as Croft knew, quick to see an opportunity and seize it. Now, as a guardsman answered the summons, he spoke quickly in direction. Make search for my son, Prince Robur, and say I desire him here. The soldier withdrew, and Jakor plunged into further questions concerning Croft's plans. Croft, on his part, answered him fully, promising other wonders than the motor in good time, until a faint tinge of color crept into Jakor's cheeks, and his eyes were aglint with a deep and subtle light. Croft would not doubt but that he saw a fewer dominating all the nation, that he dreamed a far-reaching dream. And at that moment there entered the room a youth to whom Croft's heart went out, Clean-limbed, strong-featured, with a well-shaped jaw and a mouth not lacking in humor, he advanced with a springing stride and stood before the king. Robur, my son, Jakori began, Jesor of Nojur is our guest. In all things shall you aid him, speaking in all such matters as the mouthpiece of the king. See to it that he has metal workers under his command to do his bidding, also that wine is given into his hands for such use as he sees fit. Robur put forth a hand which Croft took in his own. The prince of Afur smiled. My father's word is the law in Afur, he said. Welcome, Nodur. Ask, and I obey. First then, said Croft, I would visit my father's galley at the Keys and acquaint them with what has occurred before they continue up the Na. Come then, Robur responded to the natural request. He led Croft from the room. Five minutes later, the two men were driving down the terraced inclines to the quay where Sinan's galley lay. Not only that, but at his own request, Croft held the reins above the four nupas and guided them down the sloping roads. He felt for the first time that at last he stood on the threshold of that success for which he had planned. And thus he began that work on Palos, which was to hold him for many months. He presented Sinon and Melia to Robur, and after an hour spent in explanations and ending with a promise to visit Ladra after he had his work in Himira started, he left them divided between amazement and pride in their son. Once what I intend is completed, we will mount these splendid roads without nupas, and at many times their speed, he said as Robur and he re-entered the prince's car. Robur opened his eyes. Say you so? Is it for that I am to aid you, as my father said? I. Then let us begin at once. I would like to see the thing accomplished, Robur urged. Croft nodded and briefly described what was required. There is a place where the doors of metal and the bodies of the chariots and carriage are molded, Robur said. Metal is melted and worked into shape according to designs. Croft had felt assured that some such industry existed from the molded doors and the type of the other metal work he had seen. Take me there, O Robur of Afur, he said. Robur laughed. He was an exceedingly companionable man. Call me not by so lengthy a title, he exclaimed. I am drawn to you, Jesor. Let us forget questions of caste or rank between ourselves. Speak to me as Rob. Gladly will I call you so, said Croft, his heart warming to this proffered friendship of a fewer's heir. And let us pledge ourselves now to work for the welfare of our nation until it is assured. He thrust out a hand. Robur's eyes lighted as they held Croft's palm. This is a day of wonder for all Tamarisia, he said, and turned the Nupas southward along the river road. In the end, he brought them to a stand before an enormous building, wherein Croft found the flares of fires and men, well-nigh naked, at work in their glare. 
Robier led him to the captain in charge of the place and made him acquainted with Croft's needs. Inside an hour, Croft was superintending the makings of certain wooden patterns to be molded and cast in tempered copper, while Robier looked on all eyes. And his eyes were glinting as they left the Pelosian foundry and drove toward the royal depots of wines, after Croft had given certain of the metal workers the designs for a huge copper retort to be made at once. At the depots, where Croft found unlimited supplies of wine stored in skin bottles of tabure hide, Jason ordered the building of a brick furnace for the retort when it was done, giving the dimensions and plans of construction to masons hurriedly called. That task arranged for, Robier drove him back to the palace and led him straight to his own private suite. A woman rose as they entered. She was sweet-faced with brown eyes and hair. Robur presented Croft to her as his wife, a princess of Milladur, and proudly displayed two children, a boy and a girl. Croft found his reception gracious in the extreme, and learned he was to be the guest of Robur and Gaia while engaged in his work. He was to learn also that Gaia was no uncommon name in Tamarisia, and that it fitted the wife of Afur's prince. She was a cheerful, bright, and sympathetic soul, who listened to Robier's and Croft's descriptions of their plans, and cried out with delight at what they proposed. Thereafter the days passed quickly, and Croft checked off each as it fled, as bringing one day nearer the time set for the formal betrothal of Naya to Kaiphalos, whom, he learned, was also a guest of the palace, through meeting him now and again, and questioning the prince, whom, when alone, he now called Rob. As the days passed, Part after part of the new engine, which was to revolutionize transportation on Palos, was drafted, molded, and made. Robier's wonder grew, as it seemed, with the making of each new part, and his impatience of the final result became intense. But many hands made rapid work. Croft selected each man who showed any particular aptitude and delegated him to that individual task. The huge retort was set up and was producing pure alcoholic spirit every day. Inside ten days, Croft himself began the assembling of the already finished parts. At his own request, Robur was permitted to assist. More than once, Croft smiled to himself as he beheld the crown prince of a fure, soiled, grimy, smudged, and enjoying himself immensely, tugging away at a wrench or wielding a riveting hammer on the growing work of wonder which they built. To gain speed, Croft had introduced the unheard-of night shift in Himira. Day and night now the work went on, and his first creation advanced apace. Only on the winding of the magneto did he maintain great secrecy. Over that, he and Robier worked alone. It was the main, essential part, he explained to the prince. Without it, the whole thing would be useless and dead. He even tried to make Robier understand the electric nature of the device and, failing, told him it was the same as the lightning in the clouds. Zitu! cried Robier with a glance of something akin to fright. Jesor, would you harness Zitu's fire? By Zitu's permission, Croft said. A furious prince studied that. I, he said at length, my friend, you are a strange and wonderful man. Chakor believes that Zitu himself had endowed your mind, and Magyur says as much in your favor also. Magyur speaks the truth, Croft declared, once more sensing a possible means of harmonizing the approaching need for his return to earth, were he to keep the bond unbroken between Pelos and his earthly body. Listen, Rob, strange things occurred in this body of mine in Skira. At times, when the need occurs, it shall fall asleep, and from each sleep shall it return with new knowledge for the good of Tamarisia's race and the confounding of Zolaria's plans. Zolaria! Hi! Robier exclaimed. It was the first time Croft had mentioned the northern nation to him. To oppose which Jakgor designs to betroth your cousin to Kaiphalos of Kathur. Suddenly Croft grew bold. Robier frowned. Rob, Croft went on, I would ask favor if it may be granted. Speak, Robier said. 
I would be present at the betrothal feast inside the next few days. By Zitu, and you shall, Robier declared. My cast, Croft began. Robier laughed and tapped him on the breast with a wrench. Rise, Hupor. If this work succeeds, that will be arranged. Croft felt his pulses quicken. You mean, he began again and once more paused. Robier nodded. That Chuck Gore, my father, will raise you to the first rank beneath the throne. End of chapter 11「on the day before the betrothal feast, Croft finished his magneto, tested it out before Robier's eyes, and obtained a good fat spark. Hastily connecting it with the now assembled motor, for which workmen were building a chassis such as Palos had never seen, he filled a testing tank with spirit, primed the carburetor that he had somewhat changed for the use of the different fuel, and then laid hold of the crank. It was a tense moment, and his voice showed his realization of the fact as he spoke to Robur. Watch now, Rob. Watch. He spun the crank around. For the first time on Palos, there came a motor's cough. Again, Croft whirred the crank, spinning it to generate the life-giving spark. He was answered by a hearty hum. The motor quivered and shook. A staccato sound of steady explosions filled the room in which it stood. Like gunfire, its exhaust broke forth. The heavy balance wheel Croft had arranged for the trial to load it safely spun swiftly round and round. A commotion rose in the shop. Captains and sub-captains ran from their work to view the success of that for which they had worked. They stood staring at the throbbing, quivering engine. Croft straightened and stood, pale of face, but with blazing eyes before them. He had won. Won! Robier's face told him he had won. It was a face filled with a mighty wonder and delight. And suddenly the crown prince spoke. Back! Back to your work! Work as ye have never worked before! Complete the frame for this to ride upon, the wheels! Make all ready, men of Ifur, and spare no effort to the aim! A new day has dawned in Ifur, in Tamarisia! Inside the hour there shall be a new prince! Salute him, Hupor Jesor, who thus has served the state! They lifted their hands in salute, those captains, and turned away. Croft looked into Robier's eyes. Rob, he stammered, and put out his hands. Rob, I, Robier said, such as the order of a Fuhrer's king did the test we were to make today succeed. He will himself confirm it tomorrow night. In the meantime, I am told to bid Jasor to the betrothal feast of Naya of a Fuhrer to Cathur's prince. What now of caste, my friend? Croft quivered. He shook in every limb. The gulf was bridged that gulf of rank between himself and the girl of gold at the shrine of whose sweet presence his own spirit bowed. He opened his lips, yet found himself overwhelmed with emotion, unable to speak. Robier cast an arm about his shoulders as the two men stood. Jasor, my friend, he once more began, means this thing so much to you? Why? What things have you in mind I know not of? Speak, know you not, Jasor, that I love you? Aye, said Croft, yet, Rob, I may not speak of these things as yet. Nor did he feel that he could at present confess the thing in his heart. Later you shall know all, he declared. As for the rest, you are my dearest friend. Speak when you will, Robur replied. Tomorrow at the house of Prince Lacon, Jakgor shall name you Hupor before the nobles of Afur. So it is planned. And when this moture of ours is completed, you shall drive it to Ladra and take with you the noble rank for Sinon, since he have served his state in bringing about your birth. Tomorrow night at the house of Prince Lacon. 
the words rang in Croft's brain. Naya, his beloved, should see him exalted, made a noble of a fure. What more auspicious meeting could he desire than this? It was fate. Fate. Suddenly Croft felt his face flush, and his eyes took on a flashing light. Rob, he cried, this is only the beginning. What we shall do for Tamarisia, Zitu only knows. Would Zitu had sent you before this, then, Robier growled. Croft noted his change of manner with amaze, and plainly Robier was not unmindful of his regard. I question not the wisdom of Jagor, my father, he went on quickly, yet like I not this sacrifice of a virgin maid to the lecherous son of Cathur's king. Rob, Croft cried, as his friend and comrade paused and caught a single lung-filling breath and went on. Zitu himself must frown upon such a thing. Robier eyed him with mounting interest, and suddenly Croft raced ahead in eager question. Rob, how long between the night of betrothal and the marriage itself? Hi, Robier narrowed his eyes. A cycle, my friend. By royal custom, these things are never matters of haste. A cycle? Croft threw up his head and laughed. Rob, could we make Tamarisia strong beyond any dream of her wisest men inside that cycle? What then? Robier frowned. A promise is a promise, my friend. But, said Croft, much may happen in a cycle. And Zolaria plans. What mean you? Robier seized his arm in a grip like iron. Jasor, you are a strange man. Twice now have you spoken of Zolaria's plans. What do you have in mind? To watch Cathur's prince, said Croft. Hold, Rob. The priest Abu is my friend. He will help us in this. Megir, too, must give us aid. Let us watch and work. Work. Yes, work. With a Syrian year in which to work for such a prize, what could a man not do? Croft threw up his face and met Robier's questioning gaze. Afur shall show the way to the nation, he cried. Solaria's plans shall come to naught, my friend. Zitu, Robier gasped. After tomorrow night we must speak of these things to Afur's king. Jasor, I am minded that Megir is right. Zitu works through you to his ends. The motor coughed and died, having used up its fuel. Croft smiled and called Robier back to work. Through the day they toiled, and by night the engine was bolted to the chassis, wheeled into the assembly room by the workmen that afternoon. There remained now no more than the assembling of the clutch and the transmission before the body should be affixed to complete the car. And the body was ready and waiting to be bolted fast. Croft worked throughout the night. Robier offered to assist, but he refused. He wanted to be alone, to think, think, plan the future steps of those things he would do inside the coming year. He had sworn to make a fewer strong, and as he assembled the final portions of this first work of his genius, he considered that. The answer was plain. A fewer must arm, and no dur, and milidur, from whence came the gentle, sweetly sympathetic Gaia, Robier's wife and of arms he knew little, but he could learn. Only he had to return to earth. There, not many miles from his own town, was the home of a man who before now had won fame as a maker of arms. Indeed, as Croft knew, he had designed weapons afterward adopted by the royal nations of Europe, and made by them on a patent lease from this man, Croft's friend. It would be easy, then, to learn what he desired, to bring back the plans of those self-same weapons and make them here under the patronage of a furious king. Then, well, let Solaria plan and hold what bait she would before Cathur's eyes. Croft chuckled to himself as he worked, and the captain assisting him in Robier's place thought him pleased with their progress and smiled. This mouture of thine will surely draw the car in lieu of Nupas, my lord, he inquired. Aye, said Croft with a nod. By Zitu, never was anything like it dreamed of in Tamarisia before thy coming, the captain rumbled in his throat. Croft nodded again. Tomorrow I shall bring you orders to start all men working on those parts they have made for this in untold numbers, he returned. And hark you, captain, each man shall make but the one part, 
which he makes the best. So shall we make many and build them together at once and produce a vast number of cars and other motors to drive boats on the Na. By Zitu, then shall a few rule the seas indeed. Tamarisia shall rule, said Croft with an assurance not to be denied. The captain gave him a glance. What he read carried conviction to his mind. My lord, he said, my lord. Lord, they called him that now. Croft chuckled again to himself and went to work. Lord, and tomorrow night, no, the night of this day as it would be on earth, they would call him Lord before Naya herself. He would meet her, speak to her perhaps. He called upon the captain for assistance and redoubled his rate of work. And as the first rays of Sirius began to gild the red walls of Himaira, he finished filling the fuel tank with spirits, told the captain to open wide the doors of the building wherein they had toiled through the night, and seized hold upon the crank of the engine he had built. The motor roared out. Croft sprang to the driver's seat. He let in his clutch, and slowly, very slowly, the car moved toward the open doors. One glimpse Jason had of the captain's face, a thing wide-eyed, agape with amazed belief, and then he was outside the massive walls of that foundry womb in which the car had been formed. He was out in the streets of Himaira, riding the thing he had made, the first of many things as he had determined during the night. For a moment visions of marine motors, tractors, airplanes filled his brain. Then, as a night guard at the throat of the street caught sight of him, and wavering between fear and duty yielded swiftly to the former and fled with a yell of terror, he came back to the matter in hand. He came the river road and opened the throttle notch by notch. Swiftly and more swiftly the new car moved. The sweet air of morning sang about his ears. The throb of the motor was a paean of praise, a promise of what was to come. He reached the palace entrance and turned in. Straight to the steps of the king's wing he drove and brought the car to a stand. Like their fellow of the street, the guards shrank back in amazement from this strangest of chariots they had ever seen, until Croft, rising in his seat, ordered them to send word to Robier and Jakgor himself that he waited their inspection of the car. He himself was thrilling with creative fire, divine. It was in his mind to demonstrate the new creation in the vast court, deserted thus early in the day. He throttled down and sat waiting while a guardsman hurried away. Then into the midst of his elation broke the voice of a furious prince. Hi, Jesor, my lord, this is a surprise. Now I see that which last night you planned. Robur had hurried forth with Gaia by his side, and behind him now came Jack Gore between a double row of guards. While Croft rose and gave a hand to Robier and Gaia in turn, and bowed before the king, the latter advanced quite to the side of the new, and to his experience, wonderful machine. "'You came here in the moture itself?' Robier asked. "'Yes,' Croft replied, and well nigh frightened a night guard out of his wits when he saw me bearing down on him, as well as carrying consternation into the minds of even soldiers here. Robier laughed. I can well believe that, he agreed. Had I known not of it, I fear I should have been sadly disturbed myself. Jakor smiled. If it carried fear into the hearts of a Fuhrer's guards, might it not do likewise to an enemy's men as well, he remarked. O king, it is in my mind that it would do even that, Croft returned, sensing the deeper meaning back of the mere words as applying to a specific enemy. He gave Jakor a meaning glance. May I show you the moture in action, O king of Afur? he asked. Yes, Jakor agreed. Wait, Robur cried as Croft resumed his seat. Wait, Jesor, I shall go with you. Gaia will be the first woman of Afur to ride in such a chariot. Gaia smiled. Like most of the Tamarisian women, Croft had seen she seemed devoid of any particular fear. She took Robier's hand and stepped into the car. Robier followed with scant dignity in his eagerness to put this new mode of travel to the test. Then Croft engaged his clutch, and the car moved off, rolling without apparent means of propulsion in circles about the great red court while the guards and Jakor watched. For some five minutes, Croft kept up the circling before he brought the machine to a stand before the king and once more, rising, bowed. 
Your words were true, O Jasor, spoke Jakkor then. In this I see great service to the state. Hail, Hupor! He caught a sword from the nearest soldier and, advancing, struck Croft lightly upon the breast with the flat of the blade. More of this tonight, he said, stepping back. In the meantime, arrange to build as many of these motures as you may, also for those which shall propel the boats. Turning, he withdrew with his guard, disappearing into the palace. Gaia smiled at her husband and Croft. I, too, shall withdraw now, she began. I can see you are eager to be alone with this new toy. My thanks, Lord Jasor, for the ride. All my life long I shall remember myself the first of Tamarisian women to mount your wonderful car. Robier helped her to get out, then sprang back to Croft's side. His face was alight. Now, go! Let us ride, he exclaimed. Let us leave the city along the highway to the south and test the mature for speed. Nothing loath. Croft once more advanced gas and spark and led in the clutch. Outside the palace entrance, he turned south along the Na. Robur, beside him, seemed strangely like a boy. Approach the gate slowly, he chuckled as they rode. Let me see for myself what effect we have on the guards. His wish was granted in a surprisingly short time. As they neared the gate, not yet open to morning traffic, a guardsman appeared. Plainly he was watching, yet he made no move. He seemed practically paralyzed at the sight which met his eyes. In the end, however, he suddenly lifted his spear, as though expecting to meet a charge with its point. His face was rigidly set. He appeared one determined to die in the path of duty, if die he must. "'Open, fellow!' Robier shouted with a grin. His voice wrought a change in the man. He caught a deep breath, dropped his spear, and flung himself toward the levers which worked the gate. "'My lord!' he said, as Croft drove past where he now stood at attention with the gate swung wide. "'My lord!' Robier flung him a bit of silver and a laugh. Then they were out of the tunnel through the wall and rushing up the well-built road. "'That fellow thought us Zitem Kwe himself, to judge by his expression,' he chuckled. "'Jesor, my friend, go faster, let—' "'Let her out!' Croft could not resist the expression of earth. "'Aye,' said Robier, staring. "'Let her out. "'Where got you that form of speech, my friend?' "'I—it was used on the moment to express the idea intended,' Croft replied. "'It is as though one released the reins and allowed the Nupas to run free.' "'Robier nodded. "'Yes, I sense it. "'Let her out.' Croft complied. They sped south. Without a speedometer, Croft could only estimate their rate of progress, but he judged the new engine made thirty miles an hour at least. Robier was amazed. So were others after a time. The speeding car met the first of the early market throng and cleared the road of everything it met. Men, women, and livestock bolted as the undreamed engine of locomotion roared past. Their cries blended into an uproar which tore laughter from Robier's throat. Croft himself gave way to more than one smile. Swiftly they passed the area of cultivation and entered the desert road where Croft had seen the Sarpelka caravan on his first Pelosian day. On, on, they roared along the level surface between dunes of yellow sand and across golden arid flats. The exhilaration of motion was in their veins. Head down above his wheel, Croft sent the car ahead until, dashing between two dunes, they came to where a second road joined that on which they ran. Robier cried out. Croft flung up his head. One swift glimpse he had of a team of purple-plumed nupas reared on their haunches, their forefeet pawing the air, their nostrils flaring, their eyes maddened with fright, and of a burnished carriage behind them. Then he was past, throttling the engine, seeking to bring the car to a stand, while from behind the sound of a strong man shouting came hoarsely to his ears. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of Pelos of the Dog Star Pack」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Shishang Jakmula. Pelos of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Geisy. 
how Naya first saw Jasser. The car slowed down and stood still. The rover sprang to his feet. Croft turned to look back. The carriage was off the road and dashing across a level stretch of sand. How it came that Prince Lacken's carriage was here, neither man knew. They were to only learn later that Naya, wearied of her preparations for the coming feast of Betrothal, had induced her father to take her to her mountain home on the previous night, and that now she was returning in time to avoid the later heat of the Syrian day. Yet both men had recognized the purple-plumed nupas and the conveyance which now swayed and rocked behind their fright-maddened flight. Lacons, Croft gasped. I, by Zitu, Robert gave assent, and should Crythron fail to hold them soon, death lies in that direction at the bottom of the gorge. Sit down. Hold fast, even as Robert spoke. Croft sensed his full meaning and planned. Under his touch, the engine roared. He let in his clutch with a jerk which shot the car into motion with a leap. Death lay ahead of the careening carriage behind the beasts he had frightened out of their driver's control. Whether Kythron alone or Lacken or the prince and his daughter rode in that rocking conveyance, it was his place to do what he could. Leaving the road with a lurch, which nearly unseated Robur and himself, he swung the car about and increased its speed. He had told Jadgor he would build an engine to outrun the Tamerisian Nupa, and here at once was the test. True Croft thought not of that in any such fashion as he drove. His only fear was lest he fail to overhaul the flying beasts in time. His greatest fear was that Naya herself might be in that frantic rush toward death, hurtling to an end invoked at his hands. His soul sank in a sick wave of horror, yet he set his lips and clenched his jaws and drove. Faster and faster leaped the roaring car behind the leaping things of flesh and blood he sought to overtake. And he was overtaking them now. He crossed the second road with a nerve-wracking swing and jolt. Unable to procure rubber for his wheels, he had faced them with heavy leather, some two inch thick, which lacked the resiliency of air. His arms ached from the wrench with which he crossed the road. But that passed, he gathered speed with every revolution of the wheels. Faster, Z2, faster, Robert urged at his side. Faster, Jasor, the gorge is just ahead. Croft made no reply. He was almost abreast of the carriage now. But he himself had seen the break in the surface of the flat across which he drove. He set his teeth till the muscles in his strong jaws, bunched and drove toward it at top speed. His one hope was that the thing which had set the Nupas into flight might be able to turn them back. And he was past them now, past them with the gorge directly ahead. He began to edge in upon them. He would stop them or turn them at any cost to himself. And the margin was scant. Nearer and nearer to the lip of the sheer descent he was forced to turn in order to hold his lead. Jump! Save yourself! His voice rose in a cry of warning to his companion in the car. The gorge was very close. He turned to parallel its course and found it angling off at a slant. And the Nupas were turning, too, edging away from the thing they feared. Edging, edging away. Croft etched with them, turning them more and more. Kythron was sawing on his reins. Suddenly, the beasts stopped in a series of ragged lunges and stood quivering and panting. Croft stopped the car. By Zitu, Jaisor, you are a man. 
he became conscious that Rober was still with him on the seat and that he himself was a quiver in every limb. Yet he forgot that as the purple curtains of the carriage were swept back and Prince Lacken leaped out, gave Rober and him a swift glance and assisted Naya to alight. Rober and he leaped down. They advanced toward Lacken and his daughter. My uncle and my cousin, Rober began, we crave your pardon for causing you this inconvenience through no intent of our own. Yet must you give thanks to our brave Lord Jaser here for undoing our work so quickly as he might and turning back the noopers from their course. By Zitu, I am assured, had he not succeeded, he would have gone with you into the gorge. Lacken bowed. My Lord Jaser, said he, it appears that I owe you my safety as well as that of my child. Accept my service at your need. I have heard of you and yonder wonder carriage you have wrought. After tonight, I go to my villa in the mountains. You must be our guest for a time. Naya, my child, extend your thanks to the noble Jason for your life. Croft found himself looking into the purple eyes of the woman he loved. He thrilled as she lifted her glance. Then, as her red lips parted, he opened his own. Nay, not your life. Princess Naya, some bruises had you leaped from the carriage, perhaps. My thanks for the service, nonetheless, my lord, she made the answer in her own well-remembered voice. I like not bruises, truly, and at least you did save me those. She extended a slender hand. Croft took her fingers in his and found his pulses leaping at the contact. What more favourable meeting could have brought him before this girl in the flesh? Prompted by a sudden impulse, he bent and sat his lips to the fingers he held, straightened and looked deep into the wells of her eyes. A swift colour mounted into the maiden's cheeks at the unwanted form of homage and the fire in Croft's glance. She dropped her lids and seemed confused for the first time during the course of the whole affair. Robert broke into the rather tense pause. What say you, Lacken? Your noopas are hardly fit to be trusted more today. Enter this car our Huper has built and be the first prince of Afer to enter Himaira thus. Lacken smiled. He spoke to Kaithron, ordering him to drive the noopas to the city as best he might. Then, with Croft acting as Naya's guide, turned with Rober toward the car. Nor was he niggard in his praise as Croft started the engine, and placing the girl beside him, drove back to the road and along it to the city gates. He even laughed with enjoyment at the further consternation their progress caused along the road. And when a team of draft noopers bolting scattered a mass of broken crates full of the strange waterfall Croft had found the first day, in a squawking confusion, he scattered largesse to the owner of team and load and bade Croft proceed. As for Croft, that ride with the girl of his ultimate desire at his side was a delight such as he had never known, coupled with the sense that he had saved her from possible injury at least, if not from actual death, and at the same time proved his own daring, was blended the sheer enjoyment of her presence and the sound of her voice as she questioned him concerning the, to her marvellous conveyance he drove. Those questions he answered freely, knowing her loyal to Tamarizi at heart. So in the end, they passed the city gates and made their way to Lacken's house, where Croft turned in toward the massive moulded doors. Naya showed some surprise. My lord, she said, you know our dwelling, it would seem. I have looked upon it with longing ere this, said Croft, growing bold through the kindness of fate. For fate, he felt it was which had brought them together in a fashion such as this. And Naya gave him a glance 
and once more veiled her eyes while a tide of responsive color dyed her face. Plainly, she caught the meaning of his words. Your name is among those of our guests for tonight, she said. Your welcome will be doubly great after today, and you will accept our invitation to the mountains. If you add your invitation to your father's, so soon as I may arrange the work on other motors, Croft agreed. Then you will come, she told him softly without lifting her eyes, and Croft thrilled at her manner as much as at her words. He stopped the car, reached up, and rang the gong as Skythron had done the first day he came to Afer, leaped out and assisted Naya to alight. End of chapter 13、Chapter、14 of Palos of the Dog Star Pack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. Palos of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Giese. The Slip Twixt Cup and Lip. And that night, all Himira was on fate. Under the light of fire, oil lamps, and flaring torches, whose glare lit up the sky above the walls, the red city of Afur made holiday. Crowds swarmed the public squares and clustered about the free entertainments, the free refreshment booths erected by order of Jack Gore, Afur's king, to celebrate the coming alliance between Cathur and the state. Processions of the people moved through the streets, laughing, singing, shouting, and making merry in honor of the event. Once before, when Robor brought a princess of Milada to Himira, the city had fled thus red in the night. Now again, Jack Gore was making greater his prestige of power and increasing Afur's political might. Croft, returning to his quarters in the palace from a day spent in starting intensive work on a hundred engines and a marine adoption of the same, met a surprise. Upon his copper couch was a noble dress consisting of a golden cuirass embossed in silver, a kilted skirt, gold and silver leg casings and sandals, a leathern belt, And a tempered copper sword. As he came in, a Mazarian servant rose and bade him to one of the palace baths. Returning from that, Croft donned a sleeveless shirt of silk like tissue and the cuirass over that. Kneeling, the servant adjusted the sandals and rose to buckle on the sword. These things, he mentioned, were a gift from Jack Gore himself, a mark of Croft's service to the state. Jason had been less than human had he not felt a glow of satisfaction in this sign of royal esteem and friendship. But greater far than that was the knowledge that this night in Lacon's house he would meet Naya herself as a friend already known, and be lifted to high rank before her eyes. That tonight would see her pledge to Kyphalos, he chose to overlook. A year must follow before she became the Cathurian's wife. Much could happen in a year. As he had said to Robur days ago. Something he had read came into his mind. Let him who wins her take and keep Faustine. He thought that that was the form of the quotation. At least it was the sense. He nodded to himself. Let him who could win her take and keep Naya of Afur. He, Croft, had a year in which to win the woman he desired. Robur came into the room. Gaia had gone to Lacon's earlier in the day to act as Naya's lady in the ceremonial preparations. He suggested that Croft and he be off. A furry and etiquette decreed that the principal guest be the last to arrive in order that the assembled company might do him honor when he came. Jack Gore and Kyphalos would follow, said the prince. Croft assented at once. Lifting a circlet supporting a tuft of orange feathers, he set it upon his head. And Robur and he set out in the prince's own car, drawn by four beautiful nupers, their bridles trimmed with nodding scarlet plumes. Before Lacon's house, they found themselves in a press of other carriages and chariots from which were descending the best of Afur's life. The huge doors of the court stood open, and the court itself blazed with light. 
a double line of guards stood within the portals as the guests streamed in, and a herald in gold and purple cried the name of each new arrival aloud through a wide-mouthed trumpet held before his lips. Inside, the tables were spread much as on the former occasion Croft had witnessed, save that now a dais had been constructed at one end, where were the places of Kyphalos and Naya, Jackgor and Lacon, and as Jason was to learn, of Roba, Gaia, and himself. Lacon stood at the end of the double row of guards and welcomed his guests. He gave Croft his hand with a smile which lighted his eyes. Welcome, Lord Jasor, to mine house, to Himira's happiness, to the honour of Afur, he said and bent his knee to Robo as the two men passed. It was then Robo led Croft to the dais and mounted the steps as one who knew beforehand his place assigned. Croft hung back and his companion laughed. Up, he cried. Tonight you are honoured of a fur above most men. Tingling at the knowledge, Croft mounted and seated himself at a wave from Robo's hand. The prince gazed on the brilliant scene with a smile of something like pride. A goodly company, he said. Croft, too, gazed around before he replied. Surely, Robo had spoken aright, he thought as he swept the body of the guests where colours blended in endless harmony of shades, and the white arms and shoulders of matron and maid gleamed in the play of the lights. Lights! He cast his eyes about the myriad of flaming lamps, and suddenly he smiled. Yet would it be even more brilliant were the oil lamps removed, and in their place we were to put small globes of glass, which would emit a radiance not due to oil, but to a glowing filament shut within them, so that they would need no filling, but would burn when a small knob were turned. Zitu, Robo gave him a glance. Are you at it again with your wonderful dreams? Yes. Once more, Croft smiled and grew serious as it recurred to his mind that before long he must again return to Earth. Call them dreams, Robe, he said. Dreams they may be, yet shall you see them come true. And, Listen, my loyal friend, it may be that before long I shall dream again as I dreamed before, that my body shall lie as Jasor's body lay in Skira, shall seem to die. What mean you? Robur cried. This you have said before. Croft shook his head. I may not tell you more, yet I would exact your promise that when the time comes, as I know it will, you shall set a guard about my body and forbid that it be disturbed until I shall again awake with a full knowledge of what more shall be done for Afur's good. You mean this? You do not jest? Robo's voice had grown little better than a whisper, and his eyes burned with a question into Croft's brain. Yes. Will you promise, Robe? I will promise, and what I promise, I fulfill, said Robo. Yet you arouse fancies within me, Jasor. One would think Zitu himself spoke to you in that sleep. No, yet what I do, I do by his grace, Croft replied. And from each sleep, I am assured, shall come good to the Tamarisian race. And suddenly, as trumpets announced the arrival of Kyphalos and the king, he felt light, relieved, free. He had arranged for those periods of unconsciousness for Jasor's body, and need not trouble more about it with the promise he had won from Jack Gore's son. He watched while Kyphalos came in with Jack Gore now and approached the dais. Then, attracted by other trumpets, he turned towards the stair. As before, Naya stood there with Gaia by her side. Yet now, she was not the same. Then, she had been radiant in gold and purple. Now, she stood simply clad in white. White was her robe, edged in silver. White were her sandals, and white the plumes which rose above her hair. Kyphalos and Jack Gore waited while the guests took their seats. Lacon advanced to meet the two women on the stairs, gave his hand to his daughter, and turned to descend. Another figure appeared. It was Mager, the priest, robed in blue, accompanied by two young boys, each bearing a silver goblet on a tray of the same material. He advanced and met Naya and Lacon as they reached the foot of the stairs. 
Who comes? His voice rang out. A maid who would pledge herself and her life to a youth, O Prince of Zitu, Lacon replied. The youth is present? Magor went on with the ritualistic form. Aye, he stands yonder with Uffer's king, Lacon declared. Who sponsors this woman at this time? Magor spoke again. I, king of Uffer, brother of her who gave her life. Jack Gore's voice boomed forth. Come then, Mago said. The party advanced again across the crystal floor. They joined Kyphalos and the king. They ascended the dais and stood before the assembled guests who rose. Mago spoke anew. Naya of Afur, thou woman, being woman sister of Ga, and hence a priestess of that shrine of life which is eternal, and guardian of the fire of life which is eternal, is it your intent to pledge thyself to this man of Cathur who stands now at thy side? While Croft watched, Naya's lips moved. I came her response into the ensuing silence. Myself I pledge to him. And thou, Kyphalos of Cathur, do you accept this pledge, and with it the woman herself? to make her in the fullness of time thy bride, to cherish her and cause her to live as a glory to the name of woman to whom all men may justly give respect? Aye, so I pledge by thee too, and a zeal, giver of life, said Cathar's prince. Then take you this, made of a fur. Magor drew from his robe a looped silver cross and pressed it into her hands. Hold it and guard it. Look upon it as the symbol of that life eternal which through you shall be kept eternal and which, taken from the hands of Azil the angel, shall be transmuted within thee into the life of men. Turning, he took the two goblets and poured wine from one to the other and back. One he extended to Naya and one to Cathar's prince. Drink, he said. Let these symbolize thy two bodies, the life of which shall be united from this time on in purpose. Drink, and may Zitu bless ye in that union which comes by this intent. Cathur raised his goblet. I drink of thee deeply, he spoke, addressing Naya. And of thee I drink, she made answer, and set the wine to her lips. As she did so, her eyes leaped over the silver rim and met the eyes of Croft. For a single instant, his glance burned into hers, and she faltered. Her hand lowered the goblet quickly, and she swayed. Yet even so, she caught herself on the instant as a storm of applause broke from the guests and sank to the divan, supported by Kyphalos's hand. As for Croft, for him the light of the oil lamps flickered and paled. He sat momentarily lost in a mental tumult roused by that glance in Naya's eyes. In that moment he felt he had spoken to her soul, had reached to her inmost spirit and made himself known. He had not meant to do it. He had not realized while he leaned forward watching the betrothal rite that all his loathing of it, all his protest of spirit against it, had kindled in his eyes. Not, indeed, until he had plumbed the purple depths of her eyes over the rim of the goblet had he known, or dreamed that she could see and know, as now he felt she had known. Now, however, he stole a second glance to where she sat and found her deathly pale, with set lips and a bosom heaving so strongly beneath the pure white fabric of her robe that it seemed to actually flutter above her rounded breasts. Her hand stole out, and lifted a goblet from the table, and she drank. It seemed to Croft that she sought so to steady herself before she set the wine back and forced herself to smile. Thereafter came the feast, the music, the dancers, a troop of singers and another of acrobats, the usual gamut of a Tamarisian state entertainment dragging out its length before Jack Gore rose at last in his place and a hush fell over the court. Croft, who throughout it all had been strangely silent, 
roused to the pressure of Robur's hand, and as the prince prompted, he rose. Thereafter, he left his place and knelt before Jack Gore, while the king drew his sword and struck him upon the breast and dubbed him so a prince of a fur, and rising, bowed to the king and to the guests who rose to salute him in his newfound rank. But of them all, to Croft it seemed that he saw only the fair young girl beside the Cathurian prince. And now, as before, his eyes leaped swiftly to her face. Only now, instead of an expression of something like a startled knowledge, there leaped toward him a purple light of pleasure, of approval, of congratulation, and she smiled, as one may smile in recognition of an old and well-known friend. Then he found himself clasping hands with Robor, with Lacon, with Kyphalos, since the thing could not be avoided. Gaia, too, gave him her hand and a word of congratulation, and Nye was holding forth her rounded bare arm and the slender fingers which that morning he had kissed. He took them now and held them in his own. He trembled and knew it, and even so dared again to meet her eyes. Once more he found them startled, puzzled, almost confused. A faint colour crept into her cheeks. My lord, she said, Afa has given her highest appreciation of your worth. That should mean much to you. I, Croft found his tongue, since it accords me the privilege of a further word with you. She drew her hand away. Is a word with me of so great a value? She questioned with a somewhat unsteady laugh. To speak with Naya of Afur, I would dare death itself. Croft did not tell her how much he had already dared for that word indeed. You are a bold man, she said, as he paused, and went on quickly. Yet, since you value it so highly, forget not our invitation of this morning, or that house in the mountains which is ours. I shall not forget, Princess Naya, Croft replied. His brain was in a whirl. She had repeated the invitation. Did she really wish him to come? Had he read her glorious eyes aright? Had she sensed the truth as he had sensed it the first time he had seen her? Did she feel it? Did she know? Had the call of his spirit reached the spirit which was hers? Croft hardly believed that it had. He scarcely believed that her knowledge of that call was a definite thing as yet. Still, he was sure she felt something she herself could not wholly fathom, that her invitation was sincere, dictated by the call she as yet did not understand. Therefore, he promised himself, as well as her, to accept, and he vowed that before that visit to her mountain home was ended, she should recognize the truth. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of Belus of the Dog Star Pack – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Shishang Jakmula. Belus of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Geise. The Man's Demand Toward that end, and what it should finally bring about, Croft now made his plans. Kaphalos, he learned, would leave on the morrow for Skira, and, as he knew, would very shortly thereafter make that promised journey to Naira, where he would once more come under the attraction of the Zolarian magnet, that tawny Kalamita, who had attended the feast on Anthra, before he started south. On the following day, therefore, he asked audience of Jadgur, took Robur with him when he appeared before the king and suggested the use of a spy on Carthur's heir, telling so much as he felt he did to support his plea. At first, Jadgur was amazed. How know you these things, Lord Jaser? he cried. I have heard things in the north, Croft replied without naming the location, letting Jadgur suppose it was during his days in Skira if he would. 
and it seemed that Jadgor did that very thing, since after a time he asked exactly what Jaisar would propose. Croft suggested a consultation with Magar and the sending of word to Abu in the name of both Jaisar and the chief priest of Himaira to see what Kaifalos did. That there was reason for his suggestion the very next day brought proof. A sailor from a Cathurian galley was found concealed in the shop where the new engines were being made. This, following hard on the heels of Kaifalos's departure, Croft held suspicious indeed. He smiled in a rather grim way when Robur told him of the occurrence, rushing into the room where he sat engaged in the drawing of some further plans. But he took no steps, save to have the sailor taken back to his ship and his captain cautioned to keep him out of harm's way and to recommend that Robur place a guard about the shop. Indeed, he was not greatly worried as he knew of one way in which he could watch Kaifalos and learn what he planned. On the sixth day, having seen the work on the engines well underway, he took the car, filled its tanks with spirits and drove out the north road toward that white palace in the mountains where he had been hidden as a guest. He had sent no word of his coming yet he felt assured that a welcome would be his. There was a smile on his lips and a payan of joy in his heart as he stormed up the mountain grades and out across those gorges the road crossed on massive arches of stone. So at last he stopped before the steps leading up to the door of the white Ephurian mansion and sprang down. He mounted the steps and found once more the blue servant he had seen on another occasion, watching in awed expectancy just inside. To him he gave his title and asked for Naya herself. The blue man bowed. She lies yonder, Lord, he replied. I shall lead you to her. Following the servant, Croft came about a cluster of flowering bushes to find the hostess he sought. She lay upon a wine-red wood divan, while beside her sat the blue girl Maya, her supple body swinging in easy rhythm as she waved a fan for the comfort of the woman she served. By now, Croft was fully accustomed to the disregard of clothing displayed by the Tamarisian servants and even the nobles themselves in their more private life. Hence, he was not disturbed by the fact that Maya's well-turned torso swayed before him unclothed, or surprised that since she knew not of his coming, no more than a tissue so sheer that the flesh beneath it lent it colour, draped Naya's perfect form as she rose, to stand before him and stretch forth her hands. My lord, Jaser, she exclaimed, your coming is as unexpected as welcome. Would you feel flattered were I to confess that I was thinking of you before you appeared? Nay, not flattered, but filled with a delight beyond words and a fear lest I deserve less than that, Croft smiled, as he took her warm flesh in his hands and gazing down into her eyes, found in their wide open purple depths no surprise or startled question, but only pleasure as it seemed to him then. Huper, the great hound-like beast who had been lying beside the two women rose and lifting himself upon his massive haunches laid his forepaws on Croft's shoulder and stared into his face. Ah, Huper gives you his favour, granted a few. Remove your cuirass and rest. Naya said resuming her seat and signing the Mazarian to assist her guest. Then, as she slipped out of the metal harness and stood in the soft shirt beneath it, she invited him to a place at her side and directed both servants to withdraw. You are come for the promised visit, she began when they sat alone. If the time fits in with your convenience, Croft replied. Naya looked down at her sandalous feet, high arched and pink of nail. I will be frank, she went on. I have been picked because you delayed your coming. She glanced up 
with a little laugh. An eye that I could not come the sooner, Croft blended his laughter with hers. You came in your car? Yes. Tell me, she said, and laid a hand on his arm. My father declares that Jadgor thinks you inspired of Zitu to make Tamarizia great. Tell me about these motors and your work. Next to his love, these things were first in Croft's mind. For an hour, he talked to the girl at his side, and he talked well. Her presence fired him, loosened his tongue. He painted for her a picture of Aphorian transportation transformed, of motors filling the highways, of motor-driven ships on river and sea, and swept on by his own conceptions, spoke of motors as possible things of the air. Zitu, she cried, my lord would dare what none save the birds dare now. Even so, said Croft, so shall Afer become strong, stronger than any other state of Tamirizia, strong enough to guard the western gate without another's aid. He had made the remark of deliberate purpose, and now he heard the girl beside him catch her breath, and glancing toward her, found her eyes wide and very, very dark, with a strange light in their depths. You, my Lord Jaser, you can do this thing? And will, he declared. He saw Naya of Afer quiver. One who did that might ask what he would, and receive it of the state, she said slowly. And then once more her fingers touched his arm, and he found them icy cold. My lord, does Z2 answer prayers? Croft's mind leaped swiftly from her words to a night when he had seen her kneeling before the figure of Azil in the selfsame house when he had heard her plea, lifted out of an anguished spirit, to the one eternal source. What mean you? he asked. If one in so trouble, one with a spirit which rebelled at a task to which it was said should cry for aid, would see to give heed? O girl of gold, sang the heart in Croft's breast, O wonder woman of all the universe of life, how well he knew her meaning, how well he sensed that in his words of promise for a future strength in her nation, which would render needless her living immolation on the altar of patriotic duty, she saw a possible answer to that prayer she had lifted to Zitu and Ga and Azel, the giver of life, and how he longed to turn and sweep her supple form into his arms, crush it against his breast, and speak to her soul the words which should assure her that he stood even now between her and the coming fate she loathed. As it was, he sought to reassure by his reply. Yes, Naya of Afer, I think that indeed Zitu hears a troubled spirit's prayer. As for the form his answer may take, what man knows? Her lips parted. I, who knows? She repeated. How long a time shall it require to bring these things to pass? They shall be affairs before a cycle has run out, said Croft. Zitu. Then, then Afer shall be strong beyond Jatkar's dreams ere, ere so short a time is gone. Again, Croft's heart pounded in his breast. Almost, she had said air. She was forced into hated wedlock with Kaifalos, he thought. He inclined his head. But why? Naya went on more calmly. Being of Nodhur, did you come with these plans to Afur, my lord? You have said it. Croft turned to face her fully. I? She drew herself a trifle back as in surprise. Yes because I am your lord. Croft did not hesitate now. And suddenly he saw once more that strange, startled look of half-recognition which had leaped at him over the rim of the silver goblet the night of the betrothal feast. My lord? Naya began and faltered and came to a pause. I, yours. Croft bent toward her. Because I knew of you, and so knowing, knew you, the one woman in all Tamerizia, or in all the worlds Zitu has made, whom I wished 
to possess as wife. Because I love you, Naya, Princess of Afar. Because you are mine and I yours and have been since Zito himself sent our two souls to dwell in the flesh. Because your flesh cries to mine, your soul calls to mine, your spirit seeks to be one with mine as mine with yours. Therefore, forgetting caste in all else, came I to Apur and to you. Caste I have overridden and risen above. Think you I shall let Cather stand between me and the heaven of your lips, the soft prison of your arms. For one wild instant, while he spoke, he thought her about to answer word for word. For she smiled. The thing started in her eyes and spread in a slow, divine wonder to her lips. Then she sprang swiftly to her feet and faced him tensely erect both voice and figure vibrant as she cried, Stop, Jasser of Nodhur, you forget yourself. Think you so lightly of my plighted word that you dare to address me thus? To Cather I am pledged, to a maid of Tamerizia, or a woman of my house, and to all the courts of our nation that promise is sacred not to be broken or put aside save by an act of Zito himself save it be broken by death. Kraut had risen too, an act of Zitu, he said, as she paused, and may not my coming to Apur in itself be an answer to your prayer for deliverance from the embraces of Cather's unworthy heir. My prayer, some of the resentful tension left Naya's form. What know you? I know much. Kraut cut her short. Am I dull of comprehension not to sense the name of her who prayed to Zitu in her travail? And what should wring such prayers from your flower-sweet breast, save that defilement it is planned to bring about to add to Afer's strength? Once more she flamed before him. Were I to speak your words to Lakan or to Jadgur, it would mean your death, she hissed. Then speak them, if you wish, beloved. Croft smiled. As quickly as she had threatened, she drooped now at his words. Something akin to fear came into her eyes. Who are you? She began in the voice of a child. One who loves you, said Croft, who has loved you always, who always will, one whom you love, hold. Once more, she checked him. But he shook his head. What need of the sacrifice when I shall give Apur and all Tamerizia that strength they would purchase now with you? Yet for that strength your price would be the same. Nay, Krav denied, unless it were paid gladly. And if it were not, still would I give Tamerizia strength. Suddenly, Naya of Apur smiled. To Croft it seemed that she was well pleased with his answer. But barely had her lips parted, as though for some further reply. Then the Mazarian passed toward the outer doors of the court. The princess's whole expression altered. My father comes. I cannot speak further concerning this matter now. Did he dream of our discussion? There would be no bound to his wrath. Did he know that I could consider such things? Zitu himself might not quench his rage. Yet you will consider them, my Naya. You will give me an answer. Later, she told him quickly. I, we may not discuss it further now, my lord. End of chapter 15。Chapter 16 of Palos of the Dog Star Pack。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. Palos of the Dogstar Pack by John Ulrich Giese. The Woman's Answer. Hours later, Croft looked from the windows of his room. The evening had been spent in a far more formal fashion than the late afternoon. Lacon had come in. He had welcomed his guest. Naya had gone to her rooms to dress for the evening meal. They had dined. Over the meal, 
Croft had described again his plans to the flattering attention of his host. Nye had lingered with them for a time, now and then meeting Croft's glance with a smile of her crimson lips before she had gone to her room. Now, as he leaned from his window, he found all the garden beneath him. The mountain valley, the lake flooded in the light of the Pelosian moons. The night called to him, and his heart was too full, his brain too busy with thought to feel the spell of sleep. Drawing back, he left his apartment, passed down the balcony corridor to the small door giving onto the garden stair and ran quickly down. The breath of flowering shrubs was about him. Light and shadow filled the place with a quiet beauty. Choosing a path which ran off before him, he strolled along. So by degrees, he approached the white walls of the garden bath, doubly white now in the night. And having approached them, he paused. The sound of a gentle splashing came from within. Croft smiled. Another had felt the call of the outside world beside himself, and surely he felt that he knew who that one was. Princess, he called softly from beside the entrance screen. I? The word came as soft as his own and was followed by a gentle laugh. Wait, Jason of Nodur. There came a louder sound of movement, followed by a silence, and then, And now, my lord, you may come. Croft passed the screen. The maiden stood before him. Her hair was coiled about her head, her shoulder and arms showed glistening in the moonlight from the moisture of her skin. Naya, said the man. My lord, she smiled. Nay, call me Jaso at least he returned. Jaso, said she. They were alone, a man and a maid. The white walls of the bath shut them in from all prying eyes. The pool lay, silvered by the moonlight, beneath them. And suddenly, Croft reached out toward her and swept her into his arms. That bold spirit which was his brooked no longer delay. He drew her to him. His arms sensed the lithe coolness of her figure as its dampness struck through the single garment hastily donned at his call. So he held her and sensed all her maddening presence. Mine, he cried, pressing her close in the circle of his arms. Mine, woman whom Zitu himself has made for me. Hush, her hand fell over his lips and he felt her tremble. Jaso, how knew you I was here? I knew not until the night called me into the garden, and I heard the sound of the water, he replied. Then your presence told me of itself, and I spoke your name. There was a stone seat at one end of the pool. She led him there and seated herself at his side. You are bold, she said, speaking quickly. Jaso, I came here to think as I have thought ever since we spoke together today. And having thought, will you give me my answer now? She lifted her eyes, dark in the silver night. Can you truly do those things you spoke of? She questioned him again, as she had questioned before. Do you doubt it? He questioned in reply. Nay, I think not. You would do all you say for me? All and more for you, or to save you a sorrow, Croft said. Think you, said she, that Kaiphalos of a fur is aught to me? No, Croft laughed. I know you hate him, princess. Name him the beast he is. You know much, she said in response, and her voice was vibrant with a tone he had never heard her use before. Yet things there may be you know not of. Listen, my lord. My lips touched not the wine in the silver goblet the night of the betrothal feast. Naya! Croft came to his feet. Naya of Afur rose also. Her eyes were stars in the night. She stood before him a slender, swaying shape. She put forth her hands. My eyes looked into yours above the goblet, she said softly, still in that strange new tone. 
they forbade my lips to drink. Hence, Jesor, this is my answer. I am yours, can you win me in time? And now she came into his arms of her own volition. Croft found her upon his breast, clinging to him with her slender hands, looking up into his face. Some way his face sank to meet hers. Some way his mouth found her lips. Then she had torn her mouth away. Zitu, what have I done? she cried. No maid of a fur may touch the lips of a man not of her blood, unless she is his bride. But, but this thing is stronger than I. Days span the time since I have known you, yet Zitu knows it seems I have known you always, have waited for you to come, and knew it not, until that night when your glance met mine and told me I was yours. Jasor of Noda, you must save me, win me, now. Aye, I shall win you. Once more, Croft claimed her lips, and she did not resist. A mad exultation filled him. He had won, nigh of a fur. She lay in his arms. She had given him more than a maid of her race had any right to give according to convention's code. No question then but that her heart, which beat so wildly against his breast, beat with a pulse of love. He had won, and he would win. Not only this, but all that she could give. Swear it, she panted, when once more her lips were free. Oh, Zitu, swear I shall be wholly yours. Think you I could yield to Kaiphalos now? Nay, I had rather die. I swear, said Croft, and tomorrow I shall return to Himyra and my work. Tomorrow? Disappointment rang in her tones when I have counted each day until you should come. Himyra is not far in the car already made, Croft said, ignoring her ingenuous confession. I shall come to you again, I, again and again. Yet we must be discreet, Nair exclaimed. You must come, I must see you, but we must keep this secret in our hearts. Did Lacon dream that Nair had dared to break her spoken pledge? She paused. A tremor shook her as she leaned against him with his arms about her waist. You must return to your room, he urged. Fear not. Yet when you pray, ask of Zitu that he give me speed and knowledge in my work. And should you not see or hear from me for a time, be sure that all I do is for you, that you are ever in my thoughts. As you will be in mine. Once more, she turned to face him. Yet, before I go in now, my lord, give me again your lips. Beloved, Croft held her a final moment and saw her depart. Himself, he lingered by the pool. His soul was on fire. He had won. Nigh of a fur in her soul was his. The soft warmth of her lips still lingered upon his own. Aye, he had won her surrender to himself. That final kiss showed how complete that surrender was. So complete was it that she had overstepped all the code of her nation and caste in order to give it expression, had placed herself where, should her act be learned, she would stand before her people disgraced. Nor was his love less than hers. It was a great love which had brought him to this time, so great So all-compelling, he felt now that even in his student days in India, it had drawn him in a strange, subconscious fashion not then understood. So great that for it he had dared the unknown, to find the feminine complement of his spirit, whom tonight he had held within his arms. No mere lure of the flesh was his divine passion, which had drawn him and fired him now to a resolution to work. Work for it? and it alone until he had won not only Naya's love, but Naya as well. She had said the thing was stronger than herself. Croft knew it was stronger than himself as he sat beside the moonlit pool. It was one of those great loves which have made history before this and will again. Hence tomorrow he would go back to Himyra, and there he would work and plan. 
And, thought Croft, he must spy on Cathur's prince in the way only he could compass so far as he knew. Kaiphalos must be in Skira now, unless he had gone back to Anthra. Kaiphalos must be watched. There was that trip to Nera he had promised Kalamita to make. Would he tell her what had occurred in Hemira? And if so, what would Zalaria's magnet of white flesh do? That she felt any emotion for Kaiphalos, other than as a pawn to her hand, Croft did not believe. He knew her type, and frankly, he believed her an agent of a nation set to ensnare the heir of Cathur and further Zalaria's plans. He nodded his head and rose. He would find this Cathurian prince and see what he did and where, at present, he was. Quickly, he went back to his own apartment and laid himself on the couch. Naya, he fancied, was lying so even now in that room where Azil lifted his carved white wings beside her mirror pool. He smiled. Some day, he promised his heart, his empty arms. They should not lie apart, but together on a moonlit Pelosian night. Then he put all that out of his mind and fixed its full power on his task. Swiftly, that conscious entity which was the real man flitted across the central sea and found itself in the palace of Scythus, the Cathurian king. About it he prowled, invisible and unseen by the nodding palace guards. And in it he found no sign of Scythus's son. Once more he flitted free. To Abu he went and found the monk asleep in a room of the Skira pyramid. And from there he flashed to Anthra and found the gilded galley of the fickle youth tied up in the harbour basin and Kaiphalos lost in dalliance with a slender and beautiful dancer. He turned away with disgust, yet not before he learned that Kaiphalos went to Nera tomorrow, as he had promised Kalamita he would do more than a month before. Back to his chamber and the body of Jason of Nodur went Croft. At least now he was satisfied that he could watch Kaiphalos and mark his every move. Then let Kaiphalos beware. He gave a final glance to the moon-flooded night and slept. And in the morning he entered the motor and ran back to Himira before the heat of the day. Work. Work. That was to be his motto for the golden days to come. But first he must again return to earth. That day, therefore, he spent in coaching Robur toward keeping the work moving on the engines. Also, he requested that he have a great shop erected beyond the one they were using to expedite the work, and drew for him the plans for a sort of dock wherein motors might be installed in a number of ships. Why give these to me? Robur asked after Croft had explained. Since that tonight, Robe, I shall fall into the sleep of which I have told you, Croft replied. Zitu, you feel it upon you? Roba half started back. Yes. And it will last for how long a time? I know not, said Croft. It shall endure until I am possessed of the next means for making Afur strong. Do you remember your promise to guard my body well? It shall be well guarded, my strange friend, Roba promised again. Yet that night, a sudden panic seized upon Croft. What, he asked himself, if some unknown peril should threaten Nia while he was studying munition-making on Earth? He considered that for a time before he saw a way around. And then he sought out Gaia, and finding her alone as luck would have it, explained to her as he had explained to Roba before the nature of his coming sleep. She heard him, wide-eyed, and before she could break forth in comment, Croft went on. But... Gaia, wife of my friend, should any peril or danger threaten Naya, daughter of Lacon, the cousin of your lord, and I be still asleep, come quickly to me and bend to whisper, Naya needs you, and I promise I shall wake. Gaia gave him a wide-eyed, startled glance. Her name will rouse you from this sleep of death-like seeming, she exclaimed. I, Croft smiled. Gaia's expression had told him in a flash that she understood. Wife of my friend, 
I think her name might wake me from death itself. Jasor, Gaia cried. My lord, can this thing be? That my heart lies at her pink-nailed feet? Croft retorted. Aye. Yet she is pledged to Cathur. Gaia grew swiftly pale. Jasor, my good lord, and you love her, speak not concerning it to any other save myself. I swear by Zetu to keep your words in my heart. Do you control your tongue? Croft smiled into her troubled face again. My tongue I may control, he declared, but my heart can I not curb in its mad passion for the maid, nor make it less rebel against this plighted troth. Roba approves not of it, nor I, Gaia told him softly. Love brought Milida and a fur together, but this, this is of, of other design. And suddenly she knit her well-formed brows. Jasor, said she, speaking very quickly, you are strong, you have thoughts above other men, and something tells me the maid would lie happy in your arms. Croft sprang to his feet. You would approve it, Gaia, my sweet friend? He exclaimed with flashing eyes. I am a woman, she replied in almost breathless fashion. Naya loathes this Cathurian prince. And a cycle lies before us, ere he claims her for his own, Croft smiled. What mean you? Gaia half rose, her hand lifted to her breast. Nay, Croft shook his head. I cannot tell you. Yet as you say, I am strong, and I shall make Afur and Tamarizia strong as myself, and stronger a thousandfold. Remember, therefore, the words I have told you to speak, and say them close in my ear, in case any need should arise. End of chapter 16Chapter 17 of Palos of the Dogstar Pack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. Palos of the Dogstar Pack by John Ulrich Giese. The Teutons in the Sky. Naya. Naya of a fur would lie happy in his arms. And, by Zitu, some day she should. This was for her. Croft laid himself on his couch and fell into that death-like sleep of the body he had learned so well to produce. But his spirit fled across the central sea to nearer, willing itself into the presence of Cathur's heir, wherever he might be. He found him in the room of a redstone palace, overlooking the sea from the terraced side of the shore on which it stood. He lay on a copper couch, covered with silken cloth of a clear, pure yellow, and he wore an expression of sullen pique upon his face. For he was not alone, nor was this his private apartment as Croft understood in a glance. It was the suite of Calamita herself and the tawny beauty was present in quite shameless fashion, plainly preparing herself for some coming function, as it appeared, from the litter of feminine articles of toilet which lay on the red wood table at which she sat. Nay, think you I have no other source of information beyond your own rosy lips, good Kaiphalos? She broke forth in an almost taunting voice. Or that I know not men for what they are? This flower of a fur is pretty, as I have heard, as Zad, who has disguised himself and journeyed to Himira as a common soldier and seen her, tells me of his own knowledge. Also, it comes to my ears that you drank too deeply of the Afurian wine. A drunkard and a pretty fleshy toy. Zitemke himself never fashioned a stronger design for the making of trouble and fools. Think you I cannot understand? Kaiphalos frowned. One would think you Guyana, he grumbled as Calamita paused. She shrugged. Nay, I am no priestess of Ga, nor a virgin, as you know. Nor do I ask that you look no less clay. 
What are your pastimes with dancers and women of the people to me? Yet Calamita gives not herself to be cast aside for a woman of a first choosing, or a woman of equal rank. So that was it, thought Croft. Kyphalos was in this woman's power indeed, and now Kyphalos quitted his couch and crossed to her side. He caught her and raised her in his arms. You are the fool, he cried. Yet by Zitu, I delight to see you heated by word of another than yourself. Listen, and this time believe. I found myself in a trap of Jackgall's devising, as I have said. Had I refused this right of betrothal, how think you he would have looked upon my act? Could I allay all suspicion of those things which shall bring you, Queen, to Zetra's throne in better fashion than to accept? Think not all the wisdom of mankind lies wrapped in your beauteous head. Kyphalos of Cathur is no more a fool than another. Hence, I stand pledged to Naya of Afur, whom Zad himself may have for a toy, should he wish, so long as I keep Kalamita in my arms. Thus, have I gained the time of a cycle for the further perfecting of my plans? This is the truth? A flash of selfish satisfaction crept into the woman's eyes. I, as I tell you, small need of your spies in a fur to bring you word. Myself, I left a spy to find out the secret of this new car which runs itself, as I told you. I, Cathur too, knows how to plan. Croft felt a thrill of humour at the words. He knew well what had happened to Cathur's spy. He watched while Calamita freed herself from Kyphalos's embrace and began loading herself with jewels. And how does Cathur plan when the cycle is run out? She inquired at length. What of this pledge with Afur then? Zalaria will be ready, then, Kyphalos said. Zalaria would be ready. The thing was plotted then, arranged. There was a full understanding between Kyphalos and the nation which had used this beautiful vampire to bait its trap. And if not, she said, the pledge can be forsworn, and Afur can do what she likes. Your father? Knows not his own mind from day to day, as you yourself know. Even now he speaks of giving me the throne. Calamita smiled. Yet Zad says Naya is very fair. She narrowed her eyes. Zad speaks truth, yet have I not come straight to you, as I said on my return? Aye. Good then, my lord. Tonight, let us speak as one of this journey to the south. Myself, I shall seem as one who knows and understands and am satisfied in all that has occurred. Do you maintain your action solely to gain time and allay all suspicion in Afur's mind? Tonight, shall you know Zolaria's final plans which shall bring you to Zetra's throne? She rose and stood before him. Do you love me indeed, my lord? Yes, by Zetu. Kyphalos's voice was thickened. He reached out eager hands. But Kalamita laughed. Not Kyphalos alone may pledge himself for reasons of state, she taunted, drawing back. I also have given my troth to another since you left. You? For an instant the Cathurian seemed bereft of further power of speech. He grew deadly pale. Then the red blood surged back into his face. It grew dark with a deadly passion. He sprang forward and seized her by her jewel-banded arms, holding her in a grip she might not resist. What mean you? Say quickly your words are a jest, or by Zitu and a zeal you shall find no time before I crush in your unfaithful breast. It came over Croft that the Cathurian loved her, with such love as a man of his type could give, that for her he was ready to sacrifice honour and country and all a true man would hold sacred, that this explained all he had so far heard, and it came into his mind that the woman was in danger. But she smiled in mockery into the threatening face. For reasons of state, my lord, she said. What? Kyphalos caught a breath. 
Kalamita loosened his grip on her arms, carried his arms downward beside her, and drew them about her form. Plans have gone forward since you departed for the south. When all is ready, you shall invite me to Anthra, and once in your power, you shall refuse to permit my return. Zolaria and he to whom I am pledged shall demand it, and still shall you refuse. Then shall Zolaria wage war on Cathur, and Cathur shall appeal to Tamarizia for aid. And since Cathur guards the gate to the Central Sea, and her loss would spell the downfall of a thousand cycles of power, that aid may not be refused. The Rape of Helen The Siege of Troy Woman Woman, the source of life and the cause of so much death. Croft felt his senses swirl as he saw the subtle way in which nothing less than a war of conquest had been planned and practically assured. Kyphalos spoke. And Cathar's unprepared army, thanks to Tamis's thoughts of peace and of others before him, shall scarcely stop the armies Zolaria has trained and armed and taught for fifty years. Then shall Kyphalos and Kalamita mount the throne of Zetra and Naya. Once more the woman taunted with a smile. Zad can have her, if he takes her, Kyphalos cried. Zad, the blue Mazarian chief, Naya to a savage. Croft's spirit quivered and shook with a righteous rage. The last vestige of any compunction he might have held against leading the girl to declare her passion for himself disappeared. Not an impossible fate he heard Kalamita speaking and noted a crafty light creep into her yellow eyes. Come then, let us descend. Play your part strongly, my lord, and all, I think, shall be well. Croft followed them downstairs to the court where a table was spread. Save Kalamita herself, the guests were holy men. He recognized Bandor, her brother, and the Mazarian Zad. The others, Plainly Zolarians and men of Mazare, by their appearance and speech, were as yet unknown to him. The appearance of the Zolarian magnate and her captive victim was a signal for all to take their seats. Thereafter, as the meal progressed, Croft learned the final details of the plan. It was mainly such as he had already conceived, save that the Mazarian nation was to aid Zolaria in the war of annexation she planned. For this, Mazaria was to be given a seaport on the Central Sea and free use of a river leading from it through the state of Bithur, as well as the eastern half of Bithur itself. War would be made by Mazaria on the eastern frontier, while Zalaria threw her main force against Cathur and crushed her smaller army by sheer force of weight. Thus, said one of the party, a man unknown to Croft, yet one, he felt, could be no less than a representative of the Zolarian ruler himself, from the deference paid him by the others. Shall Zolaria make good that freedom of the seas she has long desired, and prove her good faith and her friendship for our Mazarian allies to the east? Thus shall Zolaria and Tamarizia become one nation, with Cathar to rule the southern half. As for the fashion in which our good prince Kyphalos met Afur's plans, it is well. For since war is to be the outcome of all our planning, what matters one pledge broken more or less? This was Zalarian statecraft, Croft thought. This was the weight of Zalaria's word. This was the right of might. To take what she wished, to trick, betray, seduce, that she might gain her ends thereby. Nothing which mankind held sacred was sacred to her, it appeared she sent a royal woman of easy morals to lure Cathur into a snare. She would make this tawny enchantress her final excuse for war. She was callous, overbearing, greedy of power, gross, save for a surface seeming of culture she used as a mask, behind which lurked the true nature which inspired her plans and acts. To her, Kyphalos would sell his birthright, his state, his nation, for the favour of the wanton beside him, and a place upon a secondary throne. And it was Kyphalos who spoke now. And thus shall Kalamita be queen at Zetra when all is done, 
a toast to Calamita now. To Calamita, Queen of Women now, Queen of Zetra later, the unknown noble cried and lifted a goblet brimming with wine. To Calamita, the party drank. And now, said the unknown, rising and lifting the goblet above his head, another toast, my friends, to those things we have planned and their fruition, to the day, whenever it shall be. To the day, they drank it standing. Bandor, in whose palace Croft judged the conference has occurred, clapped his hands sharply and a band of dancers trooped in. Croft left. He had learned all he had hoped and more. He knew now what Tamarizia faced. War. And he knew more. He knew that Naya of Afur was his. He knew that Cathur meant to forswear her, that there would be no need on his part to win her other than by winning this war. His part now to arm Afur, Nodur, Milidur, so much of Tamarizia as he could in the space of a year. His part to bring disaster to these carefully laid plans of a greedy nation and a traitor prince. That was his work. It was best he should be about it. To do what he must, the time was painfully short. Turning his mind upon the first step which should lead him to its completion, he focused his mind upon it with all his power and left Palos for Earth. End of chapter 17、Chapter、18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18 18
Then let Zilla the Destroyer take me unless we meet them, spear to spear and sword to sword. Jason of Nodur, I understand you not, nor yet how your knowledge is obtained, save Zitu speaks through you as a mouthpiece for his own designs. Yet know I that what you say falls out. Wherefore I shall once more heed your words. This falls on a fur, no der, milliter, I think, with Tamis, man of peace, on Zetra's throne. Yet shall a fur, no der, and milliter prepare. Inside a cycle, should we work together, we shall have a very horde of ready spears and swords. Nay, scarcely that, said Croft. What else? Jack Gore stared. Stronger weapons than those for which I bring the plans. If made in time, a thousand men instructed in their use can end this war almost before it starts. Let Afur, Milladur, and Nodur plan together that these weapons may be produced, some in Himira and some in Ladra. The work is vast, yet shall the final end be sure if this is done before Zalaria strikes. Robur and I shall undertake the carrying out of my designs if Jack Gore gives the word. Then Jack Gore gives it, said the king. On Nodur will I call, and Milladur. No man may say that Afur failed to think of Tamarizia's good, for though I see that should you do this thing, your name will stand above all others in the state. I love my nation more than I love either fame or rank. Hence, Nodur, make your weapons for this coming trial of strength, and I shall give you monies, metals, men, all things you may require. Croft's heart swelled in his breast. Had he ever doubted Jack Gore's patriotic motives for a moment, those doubts died now as he heard him lay aside those dreams of imperial rank he knew had once been his. And in that moment, there was born within his brain the plan he was fated to carry out. A plan which would make Tamis the last emperor of Tamarizia, and after him, no other ever again. Then, he accepted the king's assurance, Roba and I shall plan that this work may start at once. Afa, I crave your pardon for having broken your sleep. That was the beginning of Croft's real work. Oddly enough, on a planet where he had come upon seeming peace, his first task outside the original motor was in preparing for a war, and even the motor entered largely into that. At once, he plunged into a very frenzy of action, almost appalled himself by the amount to be done inside a year. That first night he spent with Robur, drafting to his attentive ears those things which they must do. The finishing of the motors. Their installation in ships. The structure for that end is well nigh completed, Robur said. Good, Croft cried, and went on swiftly to demand the construction or appropriation of buildings for the making of arms. As to the nature of the latter, he held back the details for the time, and spoke of preparing a fleet of swift motor-driven galleys in which to transport the troops they would raise across the Central Sea when the need should arise. Robur's eyes sparkled at that. We shall come upon them ere they dream we can arrive. Jason, my friend, your name shall be greatest among Tamarizia's men. No greater than that of Jack Gore, Croft replied. Robe, your father is a man above other men. None save a man of noble spirit forgets himself to assure his nation's good. In the month that followed, Croft did many things. He began the training of a number of men in assembling the motors, choosing only such as seemed peculiarly adapted to the work. He installed a motor in a galley and drove the craft through Himira, along the Nar, at a speed which had never been seen in a ship in Palos before. In this, with Jack or himself and Lacon, whom he persuaded to bring Naya along, he journeyed on up the river to make his long-promised visit to Jason's parents at Ladra and enlist Belzor, king of Nodur, in their plans. Sinon and Melia scarcely knew how to take him, they thought their son. By Zitu, you have done it! Sinon cried as he rode the galley across the Nar's yellow flood. Later, loaded with honours, both by Jack Gore and Belzor himself, he grew abashed. That my son should raise me to noble station, he faltered to Melia at his side. Strange days are coming to Tamarizia, wife of my heart. 
when he who was a dullard sits in the council of the kings. For Croft had appeared before Belzor inside the first day after Ladra was reached. And Belzor, startled by the fact of a galley which ran up the turgid current of the mighty river without oars or sails, had listened to him and Jack Gore, and joined his support to their plans. That settled, he arranged with Sinon to send several galleys to Himyra to be equipped with motors, and returning to that city for a few days, dropped downstream, entered the central sea, and sailed to the capital city of Milidur. On this trip, Gaia made one of their party, and though Croft perforce acted as engineer, he managed more than one word with Naya during the course of the voyage, and once the fleeting bliss of a stolen kiss. In Milidur, Gaia's voice helped to turn the tide to Jack Gore and Croft. A princess of state, she brought all her influence to bear. And since Milidur was asked only to form a part of the army, to be equipped before Zelaria struck, the matter was soon arranged. Back in Himyra at length, Croft found the work on the motors progressing swiftly under Robur's direction, and at once began the actual construction of machines for the fashioning of arms. Now and then, he stole away for an evening and drove out to Lacon's mountain palace for a meal. Not only did he find pleasure in the going, but Naya pleaded for the all too short hours they managed to spend together, and to Croft it seemed that each time he brought back from her presence a freshened and driving energy to his work. That work progressed. Of that progress he spoke to her from time to time. And always she spurred him on with eyes and lips through the task, at the end of which she herself was the waiting and willing prize. Day and night the fire of creation flared in Himyra, and so soon as work was started, and he had shown Robur how to keep busy the many men Jack Gore had furnished for their needs, Croft put some of the new motors into commission between Himyra and Ladra and started other work there, in a mighty building set apart by Belzor for his use. Those necessary bits of machinery first installed in the Himyra shops he had made, like the motor parts, were now made in numbers. Sinon's first galley up the Nar carried as its cargo partly assembled engines of queer design to a Palosian mind, which should, when set up in the shops at Ladra, fulfil their portion of Croft's plan. Thereafter, the fires of the new era flared in Ladra too, and Croft spent his time between the two shops, motoring back and forth mainly at night, regardless of the loss of sleep, until he should have everything running smoothly. Twenty of the hundred cars which were gradually taking shape he set apart, however, after they were tested, and these he had equipped with all metal wheels carrying crossbars on their tyres like short, strong teeth. He put workmen to the task of making metal walls to bolt upon each chassis, and these walls were pierced with slots. Thus he arranged for twenty armoured cars and had them set aside. Likewise, he speeded the construction of numbers of flat-bottomed power boats capable of speed, yet having floor space enough to transport no small number of men. A month passed. Two months. Three. Always the fires in Ladra and Himyra flared. Men toiled day and night. Croft's plans were drawn for each part of the arm he intended to make. Machines were assembled and set up. Motors were harnessed to them to Robur's amazement. Croft found the Tamarisians apt of comprehension and willing to work. Each man employed was sworn to fealty to the state. Each knew himself a member in an army working for the safety of the nation. At the end of three months, he found himself the supreme captain of a picked corps. At the end of a month, he was ready to begin the actual making of arms. Now and then, Croft went back to his earthly body, not only to renew its physical life, but to gain help in the work he was carrying on by learning fresh details on each trip. He gave up any intention of manufacturing machine guns, as a thing requiring too much time. On an average, he spent two days of every week on Earth. His sleeps on Palos had become too frequent to cause any further comment when they occurred. Thus, a fourth month passed. In it, Croft accomplished several things. He did not stop motor production with the first hundred. 
he continued their building and began selling the output of the shops to private owners. The things became a not too unusual sight on the Himira streets, and the first motor caravan was organized and crossed the inland desert to Milladur with success. One special car Croft had built. On it, he lavished all his present ability of refinement, and when it was done, he drove it to Lacon's mountain mansion in the twilight of a busy day. It was for Naya, and himself he gave it to her, and after the evening meal, when the three moons rose, he placed her in it and taught her how to drive. Far down the mountain road and out upon the desert between the foot of the hills and Himira they went. They were alone in the soft light which turned the dun plain to silver. Far off, the red fires in Croft's workshops flared over Hemira's walls. Croft stopped the car and pointed to that red reflection in the lesser light. Suddenly, it seemed to him that in all the world there were just they two, that they were alone, that nothing else mattered. His heart swelled. For you, he said, and drew Naya into his arms and against his breast. For you, he kissed her on eyes and lips. To free you and give you to me always. Those fires are burning away all need of your sacrifice. In the end, they shall make you mine. Yours, Naya sighed in his arms as one content. Here in the desert, you preserved my life. Why should it not belong to you? Your work progresses well, she went on after a time. Beyond my hopes, Croft assured her. Have no fear, all shall be ready, in time. My lord, she whispered. I, your lord, beloved, said Croft. Beloved, she repeated. For a time, Croft simply held her, and then he turned the car and drove back up the mountain road. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of Palos of the Dogstar Pack. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. Palos of the Dogstar Pack by John Ulrich Giese. A summons from Zetra. At the end of the fourth month, the first rifle was done. It was an odd-appearing affair. Tempered copper took the place of earthly steel in barrel and other metal parts. Copper formed the shell for the ammunition, over which Croft had experienced more trouble than in anything else. Lead was very scarce on Palos, but there were vast quantities of gold. That explained the enormous use made of it in draperies and the common trades as he had learned. Yet it was with some compunction due to the opposite conditions on earth and their lifelong effect on his brain that he finally hit on an alloy from which the bullets were made. Powder had troubled him too, though in the end he managed to make it. And for the fulminating centres of his cartridge complete, he was compelled to spend several days on earth. In the end, however, he held the first completed weapon in his hands and gloated over its finished lines. Taking Robur in a car, he drove out along the south road to a place where he knew vast flocks of waterfowl were wont to frequent the Nar. As a boy, he had been a good shot, until such time as he waked in his soul a repugnance for killing the natural creatures the one great source had made, save as necessity arose. He gestured to the wild fowl floating on the yellow water more than a bowshot away. Now watch, Robe, he said, and took the rifle in his hands. Vaguely by now, Prince Robur understood the design of the new instrument of destruction. Yet it was hard for him to comprehend fully a thing such as he had never dreamed before Croft put it into his mind. He smiled. Had we not better draw a little closer, Jason, my friend? he inquired. No. On the word, Croft fired. Nor did he fire blindly into the flock. He chose a bird swimming to one side, and hard on the sound of his shot, 
That bird jerked in the spasmodic fashion of a sorely stricken thing, struggled for an instant and floated away, half sunk in the yellow tide. The entire flock rose at the new, strange sound on the silent air. They swarmed across the sky. Pumping up a fresh cartridge, Croft lifted his rifle swiftly, chanced another hit, and scored. One of the flying creatures checked its rapid course, slanted drunkenly downward, and then spun dizzily over and over to fall not far from where the two men stood in the car. Zitu! Zitu! Rober exclaimed, springing from the machine to retrieve the fallen bird. Croft watched him run toward it in a very unprince-like haste. Then he was coming back with a dead thing in his hands, staring wide-eyed at the drops of blood on its feathers, lifting his face with a strange expression to Croft as he climbed back to his seat. Are you convinced, Robe? Croft laid the rifle aside. I am convinced Zitu himself but uses you as his agent. These things never came from a mortal brain alone, the Prince of Afur replied. Man comes by Zitu's will. Why should not Zitu use man for the things it pleases him to do, said Croft. You do not deny it? Roba spoke in almost startled fashion. Nay, have I not already said that all I did was by Zitu's grace? There were times when Croft found it hard to avoid a direct avowal of the actual state which was his, times when he hungered to make some human soul a confidant concerning all that had occurred, and he loved the strong young man by his side. Now, however, Robur laughed in a somewhat unsteady way. There are times when you cause me to stand in awe of your power, Jason, my friend, he said. Think you not Zalaria will stand in awe of our weapons when they are in the hands of our men, on foot or mounted in the cars I have armoured and pierced with holes for the barrels of the rifles? Croft asked. Aye, by Z2, Robur shouted. Turn around, Jason, and let her out. We must return to our work. But that night, Croft drove out to the mountains, taking his rifle along. Others were being assembled now, and he had seen Jack or himself and arranged for the beginning of the army they must raise. The thing would be started by a public demonstration at which Croft should show the power of the new weapon. The men of Afur and Nodur and Milladur would be invited to join. To each who did so, a rifle would be given wholly as his property for all time to come, and a certain wage would be given also while they were being trained. Fired by the thought, Croft asked for a copy of the Tamarisian alphabet, found it not unlike the ancient Maya inscriptions in Central America, and had taken it to the shop and set his pattern makers to forming moulds for the making of type. He intended printing proclamations of the coming call for volunteers and posting them about the streets, where those who knew how to read might understand and impart the knowledge to their fellows. Thus, to his inventions, he added the printing press, crude and for large work only at first, but printing nonetheless. He had taken all this up with Jack Gore and advised waiting another month until many rifles were finished or being made, since the civic and royal guards would form the nucleus of the army and must be armed before a call for volunteers. Jack Gore had listened to all he said, gazing at the dead waterfowl Robur had insisted on lugging into the palace. He examined the wound made by the bullet and agreed to all his son and Croft had asked. Now, at the end of the day, Croft was speeding forth to show the woman he loved the thing which should win for them their heart's desire and wreck Zalaria's plans. Lacon himself met him as he descended at the door. Despite his resolve, Croft's visits were growing more and more frequent, and Lacon was not a fool. My lord, he said, giving his hand, what brings you again thus soon? Croft drew himself up. Success, he returned. I came but to prove to you the power of the first of the new weapons we have made, and having done so, I shall return to Himira so soon as I may. Nay, a troubled expression waked in Lacon's eyes. Take not my words amiss. He seemed suddenly abashed. 
The weapon does all you said? Aye, I shall show you and the princess, if I may. Lacon's eyes flashed. The meaning of this wonder worker's statement, if proved, which he did not doubt, swept all else out of his mind for the time. What do you require? he asked in a tense tone. Croft glanced about. Below him, near the lake in a mountain meadow, were some of the strange sheep-like cattle knee-deep in grass. He gestured toward them with his hand. Permission to slay one of those. Granted, so be you can do it, Lacon smiled. The distance was twice the range of any bow. Croft reflected the smile as he made answer. If the princess may be summoned, he turned and took the rifle from the car. Lacon eyed it with unconcealed interest. He called the Mazarian from within the door and directed that Nia be bidden to appear. While they waited, Croft opened the magazine and extracted a bullet. He was explaining it to Lacon when Nia hurried forth. A powder within the shell furnishes the power to propel the ball in the end. He finished in time to greet her. And now, Prince Lacon, to take you at your word. He lifted the shining barrel. What would you do? Nia exclaimed. Behold, said Croft, and fired. Far below in the meadow, one of the woolly creatures appeared to stumble, to stagger a pace or two forward before it sank into the grass. Zitu, came Lacon's voice. Croft smiled. Nia approached. Her face was devoid of colour, as white as though the bullet had pierced her heart instead of the body of the unknowing sacrifice to developing science, now lying in swift dissolution beside the lake. Slowly she put forth a finger and touched the shining thing in Croft's hand. This is the new weapon, she said in a sibilant whisper, and lifted her face to his. Aye, and having shown Lacon its power, I must return to Himira. Croft turned toward the car. He hoped she would understand his abruptness, since after Lacon's words, he was afraid to meet the glance of her eyes. Return? she cried protestingly. Must you go so soon, my lord? The need presses, Lacon cut in. Lord Jasor came but to show us the last fruits of his wonderful knowledge. I called you to witness the test. You need not remain. You see, he went on as Nia turned with a quivering lip and slowly mounted the stairs. What? Croft met him eye to eye. That my daughter is a woman, Jasor of Nodur, and that your name is a word on every tongue in a fur, and that the princess is pledged to Cathur. Who will forswear his pledge? Croft interrupted, knowing Jack Gore must have told the counsellor what they had discussed. If your words be true, you doubt them? Nay, yet Lacon is a name of honour, and a pledge is a pledge until broken indeed. And should it be so broken? Croft leaned a trifle toward him from the hips. A fur would refuse you nothing, Prince Lacon said. Croft laughed as he sprang into his seat. Forget not those words, Prince Lacon, he flung back as he started the car. He drove to Himira in a rage. Before him floated a vision of Nia's purple eyes gone black with hurt misunderstanding, of her quivering crimson lips. But his rage was as much with himself as with Lacon, to tell the truth. He had been indiscreet after promising discretion. He had gone to the mountains too often. He had let eye and voice speak too plainly those things in his soul. Lacon had been blind not to see what was ripening under his nose, and Lacon was a man of honour according to his code. He drove to the palace, found Gaia, and told her the whole thing from beginning to end. You mean that the maiden loves you? she cried. Aye, Croft said. You have told her of your love? Gaia seemed a bit breathless as she paused. Aye, Croft inclined his head. You are mad. Nay, I am in love. It comes to the same thing, Croft smiled. Gar and Azil help you both, Guy returned. I can do nothing. 
and you must not imperil her honour, my lord. But I shall make it my task to see her and explain the manner of your return tonight, and, her colour deepened swiftly, to assure her of your love. Thank you, sweet Gaia, Croft rose. You are a blessed hypocrite and a true woman. He bent and gripped her hand. And Gaia smiled upon him because he was a strong man and she was a woman indeed. For the rest, as the days and weeks dragged away, Croft sought to drown himself in attention to his work. All day he toiled and oftentimes far into the night. Jasor's splendid physique stood him in good stead during the months of preparation. There were no labour troubles in a fur. The state fixed the scale of wages, and those who would not work were summarily sent to the mines to dig the metals needed by their more energetic fellow citizens. Thus the fifth month passed. Rifles were being turned forth in a glittering array at Himyra and Ladra, and stored with their ammunition for the time of need. Croft finished his printing press and struck from it the first bulletins which should appeal to the men of three states to come to their country's need. Citizens of Tamarizia, Croft wrote, shall Tamarizia weaken or grow strong? Recall the heritage your forebears left. Yours is the Central Sea. Yours is a government of the people, for the people, under liberal heads of state, who express the people's will as set forth once in a cycle by the state assemblies you, by your votes, elect. But a government by the people is strong only as the people themselves shall make it. Citizens make Tamarizia strong as never before. Let each man step to the fore and agree to serve as a soldier for one year. To each shall be given a weapon which he may keep. Ponder on this. If each year each man of good health and a certain age shall for one year win his weapon and learn concerning its use, how long before Tamarizia shall be so strong in the strength of her men that she shall be safe in the possession of the proud station those brave men your forefathers left to you in trust? Ask of your civic captains concerning this. Enroll yourself as citizens of Tamarizia under them. These bulletins were posted in a fur, nodur, and milidur, and in the capital of each state a public demonstration of the new army weapon was held by a picked squad of Jack Gore's royal guards whom Croft had taught to shoot. At each, a herd of tabers was slaughtered, singly and in groups. All southwest Tamarizia gasped. The word flew from mouth to mouth. The stories fired men's hearts they flocked to the captains of the city guards. Croft began teaching the royal guard and the guard of Himyra, the school of the company and squad, marksmanship and a simple manual of arms. They learned quickly, and inside a month he sent many of them as special instructors to all Afur and the other southern states. Thus far, things had progressed to the end of the ninth month, when the imperial throne at Zetra interfered. A messenger arrived commanding Jack Gore and all others responsible for the warlike activity in Afur and Nodur to appear before Tamis with the least possible delay. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of Palos of the Dogstar Pack This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. Palos of the Dogstar Pack by John Ulrich Gysi. When the Emperor Hedged. The thing was not unexpected to Croft. From the start, he had feared some such event. Hence, without offering explanation to Jack Gore, he had taken steps to convince Mager of Himyra of the death-like stupor in which his body lay at such times as he was absent from it. He had gone on one occasion to the pyramid and deliberately left Jasor's form sitting in a chair while he projected himself to Skira and found out Abu, now for some months engaged in keeping watch on the moves of Cathur's prince. Returning to find Mager standing above him in something like awe, he had told exactly what Abu was doing at the time, 
and requested Mega to verify his words in any fashion he chose. Now, faced by the Imperial interference with all his plans, he called Mega to his aid. He took him to Zitra with Jackgore, Lacon, and himself, making the journey quickly in a motor-driven craft and taking the messenger along. Croft marvelled at Zitra, despite all he had seen of Tamarizian architecture before. It rose crystal and silver and white, save that the temple of Zitu, surmounting a pyramid twice the size of that at Himaira, was of an azure blue stone, the colour of the highest priesthood, as he was to learn. The palace of Tamis was a marvel to the eye, vaster than Himaira's mighty white structure built wholly of white and crystal and roofed with burnished silver, paved with alternate squares of silver and crystal and gold. The thing was unbelievable, Croft felt. He moved as in a dream. This was the central city of empire, impregnable to any weapon then known on Pelosian soil. Its walls rose sheer from the sea on the side which they approached. The harbour was within them. Sea gates closed the entrance with leaves of copper covered by silver faces. The walls themselves were white. Darting through the gates, their galley entered the gulf of a harbour smooth as glass, wherein were mirrored the quays and structures along the water's edge. The cool green of trees banked the terraces and relieved the well-nigh blinding radiance created by the sun upon the glistening white. He forgot everything in the beauty of the vision and exclaimed aloud. Mago watched him, well pleased. His pleasure grew as Croft turned and faced the monstrous pile of the pyramid and the pure blue temple on the top. They landed, and while the wharfmen were unloading a motor which Croft had brought as a present for Tamis, and the messenger hurried to the palace to announce their arrival, he led Croft to one side. I would have you meet Zood, high priest of all Tamarizia, he said. We who keep alive the love of Zitu in the hearts of the nation are not devoid of all material power, my friend. Croft inclined his head. He had hoped for something of this sort, had planned for it indeed. I also serve Zitu in my way, he declared. I should be honoured to enter the presence of him he has seen fit to exalt to so high a degree. An armed guard appeared, escorting a number of Nupra-drawn chariots. At the invitation of a noble in glistening cuirass and helmet, the party from Himaira entered the cars and drove toward the palace through the streets paved in broad, flat stones. Croft, however, insisted on driving the motor he had brought, and with him went Mager, the priest. Tamis would grant them audience that evening, it appeared. Mager smiled. He beckoned the noble to his side. Then will Jason of Noda, who sits before me, visit first on Zood, he announced. Say this to Tamis when you reach the palace with Lacon of Afur and Jack Gore, Afur's king. The man saluted and withdrew without question. Once more, Mager smiled. Croft started the engine and moved off in the wake of the Nupers that he might not frighten them out of their wits. Turn here, said Mager after a time. Inside ten minutes, they stopped in front of the main approach to the mighty pyramid. Mager told of what he had seen and of what he had heard. The high priest eyed him when he finished. Mager believes these things? he inquired. I. As in Zutu, I believe, Mager inclined his head. That these things are of Zitu, through Jesor of Noda's mind? I, Zud, servant of Zitu, so I believe. Zud turned his eyes from the priest to Croft and back. First he came to you, at Himaira, from Abu the brother at Skira, he recited Mager's words. I. As a servant of Zitu's undreamed designs to come. Zud speaks the words present in my mind. Before the audience, my request to be present shall reach Tamis, Zud decided. And now, Jasor of Noda, how come you by the knowledge of things undreamed? Croft told him so much as he dared. My body lies as dead. In truth, my spirit leaves it 
and, while absent, acquires the knowledge with which it returns. As a voice? said Zood. Nay, as something shown to me, together with the manner in which it may be made. Zood rose and lifted his hands. Who may understand Zitu? he intoned in a voice of amazement. Croft felt he was convinced. Hence, when he stood that night before the white-haired Tamis, he felt a quiet assurance born of the belief that Magur and Zood, both present, were his friends, and they were the friends of his cause. Jakko of Afur, Tamis began, I have now summoned you before me, since for some time I have had you beneath my eye. You have married your son to a princess of Milladur, and within half a cycle you have betrothed your sister's child to Cathur, and Belzor of Nodur and yourself are friends. Thus only Bithur seems not swayed in more or less degree by those wishes which are yours, and you work strong in power. Why have you done these things? Tamis of Tamarizia, Jack Gore replied. These things I do not deny. Roba of a fur wedded the princess Gaia for love. Noda's interests are one with a fur, since both possess the Na within their lines. Naya has plighted her troth to Kaiphalos of a fur at my wish to make strong the guard of the western gate and to assure to Tamarizia those things she holds. He spoke boldly and faced the emperor of his nation with an unflinching eye. But Tamis frowned. That is not all, he said. It has come to my ear that you have in Himira a man, Jesor of Nodur, who stands now before me, a man who works new marvels undreamed of before, that some of them are weapons designed for the work of war, that Afur and Nodur and Milidur increase the men in their guards to an unwarranted degree. What say you to this? That you have heard the truth, O Tamis, Jack Gore again replied. These things have been made. The guards have been increased. These things also have I done to make Tamarizia strong. The lines of Tamis's countenance contracted further. His features grew dark, and he clenched a hand. You are a man of power, Jack Gore of Afur, he cried. Power is beneath your nostrils. Hence you dream of war, yet is war not of my creed, nor shall be. For fifty cycles has Tamarizia known peace. Aye, and fifty cycles past lost she the state of Mazur, because she knew not the art of war as she knows it now. Jack Gore flared into interruption. Strong man that he was and crafty, he knew not the diplomatic speech. Is she to lose Cathur now as well? He rushed on and paused. Tamis smiled as one might at a child. Jack Gore of Afur, the warning I have received concerning your aims comes to me from the loyal house of Cathur itself. Cathur thinks your eyes turn toward the throne. To me, that is of little consequence. Yet you hesitate to see one mount the throne of Zitra to plunge our nation in war. You think perhaps to win Mazur back? And if I should, should I make Tamarizia whole again? Jack Gore's voice rose with a fervid fire of patriotic feeling. As for Croft, he felt assured he understood the situation better now. Cathur's spies had carried word of what was forward as he had felt assured they would. Cathur, of Zalaria's prompting, thus sought through the peace-loving Tamis to tie the hands of Tamarizia while she made ready for the blow she expected to strike ere long. He said as much to Mager, who repeated it to Zood. Tamis smiled again. Should you attempt it, you would send our sons to death for a little ground. Let be, Jack Gore. Hold we not the western gate as always? Are the wails of dying men and the sobs of women things grown sweet to your ears? Nay, but if Cathar falls, if Solaria makes war and we cannot defend what yet remains of our ground, 
Jack Gore's voice shook as he saw the end of his dream of strength in view. Would Zalaria have waited fifty years to make war had she it in mind? Tamis asked. Then what does Tamis wish? Jack Gore inquired with a sigh. He was no traitor, and under the law he must heed the Emperor's word. That you cease those unwise undertakings, that you send the men from the shops of their making back to their father's trades, that you cease to dream of war and pursue the ways of peace in which we have prospered in the past, that you turn Jason of Nodur's mind to other things than the making of the instruments of destruction. I have heard he has builded chariots which run seemingly of themselves, and galleys which propel themselves up rivers and across the seas. Those things are well, Jack Gore. I command that you forsake. Hold, Tamis! It was Zood, the high priest who spoke. Truth you have been told, yet not all the truth as it appears. None know the plans of Zitu save Zitu himself. A priest I am as yourself, a man of peace. Yet Zitu himself may send a war at times too, like a sorrow, purge the soul of the nation and recall it to him, even as a grief may turn the soul of a man to higher things. Jason of Nodur was a dullard till Zitu opened his mind. He died as his physician declares, yet now he lives again, and speaks with a mind inspired. Himself, he says these things are delivered unto him while his body lies as dead. This I have from Mega of Himira, who has seen him in such a sleep, and Mega has the account of his changing from Abu of Skira, who administered to him the last rites of life ere he seemingly died. Hence Zitu's hand appears in this to the minds of Mega and myself. Shall Tamis seek to interfere when Zitu directs? For the first time, the emperor wavered in his course. Man of peace and believer in the state religion, the priest's words had a powerful effect upon his mind. If he comes as an agent of Zitu, why came he not first to Zitra? he questioned at length. Zud smiled. Zitu acts many times through the means at hand. It were easier to convince the mind of Jackor, perhaps, than to persuade Tamis, he replied. The emperor winced, and turned to Jack Gore again. Swear to me by Zitu that your act were meant for Tamarizia's welfare, and for no advancement of self through an increase of your power, he required. Jack Gore's face set into lines of a swift resentment. His colour mounted, but he controlled his voice. I swear it, O Tamis, he said. These weapons are for Tamarizia's defence alone? As Zitu sees my heart. Tamis chose a middle course. Keep then what you have, he decreed, yet fashion not any more, nor urge your men to look for war when peace is in their land. I have heard of strange writings posted on walls inviting men to join your guards. Jack Gore's face was dark, but he bowed in submission to the Emperor's command. What of the men who stand pledged at present? he asked. I have promised them a stated wage for a cycle. It is understood. My word has passed. At the end of the cycle, let them be dismissed, said Tamis after some thought. Again, Jack Gore bowed. Yet Croft found himself not unduly cast down, and he thought he caught a smile in Lacon's eyes. Suspecting some such event as had just transpired, he had instructed Rober to speed the assembling of all rifles both at Himyra and at Ladra before leaving for Zitra himself. Tamis's decision regarding such weapons as already existed, he determined to accept in its broadest sense of application. And, as for the dismissal of the guards, now in process of training, at the end of a cycle, he knew full well that they would probably not be needed after that time, or so hotly engaged that even Tamis would rescind his decree. 
Hence, he felt that things had not turned out so badly as they might, and he fancied Lacon's view of the matter was practically the same. In fact, his feeling was now as all along. A wonder that Tamis had not interfered before, as he had oftentimes feared he would. That he understood better now, having seen the man. He was old, wedded to a theory rather than of a practical type. His very begging of the issue as shown by his final ruling showed this. He carried his desire for peace even into this conference to which he had called the men before him, and reached a useless compromise which, while nominally affecting the end at which he aimed, yet literally made small difference to Croft's plans, and, as he suddenly saw, would, when reported to Kaffir, and by Kaffir given to other ears, result in no more than a determination on Zelaria's part to carry out her intent. This, since she would now in all likelihood believe she had tied Jackal's hands by stopping the manufacture of the weapon Croft had devised. He said as much to Jackgaw and Lacon once they were alone, and for the first time Jackgaw appeared pleased. Nor, said Croft, has Tamis forbidden the construction of other weapons, my friends. Hi, Jackgaw's tight lips relaxed. He gave Lacon a glance. By Zitu, so he did not. Jasor, you have other things in mind? Croft nodded. It had occurred to him that, with powder and plenty of metal, it would not be impossible to construct some very effective forms of grenades. He explained, and Jack Gore's eyes flashed fire. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of Palos of the Dogstar Pack This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. Palos of the Dogstar Pack by John Ulrich Deasy. Much mischief afoot. The morrow saw them on their return journey to Himira, with Croft pushing his engine top speed. He wanted to get back to work on the grenades at once, for two reasons. First, that they would offset in part at least, the embargo against the manufacture of more rifles, and because it occurred to him that they would be of vast service should he have to force entrance to some enemy town. For now, Croft was planning his campaign. His knowledge, gained through his unsensed presence at the council at Nera months before, made him believe that Zalaria would throw her entire weight on Cathur's northern frontier, while Mazaria attacked Bithur and possibly eastern Milladur. From a second motor shop, established at Ladra and equipped with men trained in the Himira plant, he had already sent a motor fleet to the capital of Gaia's home state for the rapid transport of troops to the frontier in case of need. He had organized a fleet of motor-driven marine transports to take men from Afur and Nodur to Bithur's aid. This expedition was to be led by Robur in person, and with him, Croft had outlined each step so far as he could. They would proceed up that river promised Mazaria for her aid in the war of conquest Zalaria planned, and debarking near the frontier, carry the war straight to the foe. As for himself, he planned with Jack Gore to cross the Central Sea almost due north, capture Nera, and penetrate the state of Mazur, thereby establishing a dangerous flank movement which, if successful, would result in withdrawing the Zalarian army operating against Cathur's frontier. Two of his armoured motors would go with the Milladurian expedition, and two with Roba against the Blue Men of Mazaire. The other sixteen would accompany the expedition north. These things he now explained to Jackgaw, Lacon, and Magor while they rushed back to the capital of Afur. They heard him and nodded agreement. Jackgaw smiled and turned to the priest. It appears Zitu has sent us a general as well as a genius of design, he exclaimed. If Zitu inspires not his mind directly, then is he the most wonderful man Tamarizia has seen? Raised up for Tamarizia's hour of great need, O oh Jack Gore, Magor declared. And who should raise him save Zitu, who knows the future as we know the present and the past? 
Zood says as much, and I believe it. Praised be Zitu's name. He made the odd horizontal sign of the cross Croft had first seen Abu of Skira use. Nay, I doubt it not, Jacko replied. Tamis shall yet live to learn the truth of this. Yet Croft, despite the religious superstitions of these truly patriotic minds, was human after all. He plunged into a frenzy of work on his return. He explained all to Roba, saw him thoroughly versed in the making of the grenades, leaped into his car and drove to Ladra to begin operations there. Two weeks elapsed while he was getting everything to his satisfaction, and during those two weeks, other things happened which he could not foresee. He returned to Himira late one afternoon, drove to the shops, saw everything running smoothly, listened to the reports of Roba, who was enthusiastic over the progress being made, and drove on to the palace to bathe and rest for an hour, since even the splendid physique of Jasor's body was beginning to feel the strain of the months of scheming and toiling. Fresh from his bath, he was suddenly minded to seek Gaia and learn if there were any word from Naya, such as she frequently sent him by Robo's wife. He found her awaiting Robo's return and proffered his request. That Gaia was glad to see him, there could be no doubt. His coming seemed to afford her relief. My lord, your coming lightens my heart, she declared after Croft had greeted her by sinking on one knee. The maid sent you her farewell, and asked that I say this much more. Tell him to forget not his promise. She did not explain, yet I have felt you would know the meaning of her words. Her farewell? You say she sent me that? exclaimed Croft, staring into her face. By Zitu, Gaia, my friend, what meant she by that? You know not of her absence from a fur? Gaia widened her eyes in surprise. You have not heard? I have heard nothing. I came to you for word, Croft began, and paused with an odd grip taking hold of his heart. I, Gaia wrinkled her brows. Some days ago, an escort came from Cathur, asking that the maid and Lacon, her father, visit Skira, in order that Kaiphalos might present his bride-to-be to his people before he ascended the throne. Kaiphalos on the throne of Cathur? Croft frowned. Has Scythus then laid down the scepter in favor of his son? Scythus has died, Gaia said. Wherefore, despite the fact that the cycle of betrothal has not run out, Kaiphalos craves the privilege of entertaining Naya and her father and assuring his people that he has chosen a worthy queen as his consort on the throne. And, and she, and they have gone? Croft stammered as he spoke. I, Gaia looked into his eyes. Jasor, what of it? I, I am a woman, and I have thoughts, fears perhaps, or fancies. I like this journey not. What does it portend? That I know not, yet shall I ascertain, Croft replied between set teeth. She told me to forget not my promise. By Zitu and Azil and Ga, I shall not. Gaia, my sweet woman, how long have they been gone? This is the third day since they departed, my lord. They went, how? In the ship which brought the escort, one Kaiphalos sent. The day after tomorrow they arrive. So then there is time. Croft relaxed somewhat the physical tension which had held him, and his voice grew less sharp. He sighed. Time? Time for what, Jasor? Gaia inquired. Tonight I shall sleep, Croft told her frankly, and while I sleep I shall learn what is the true intent of this sudden desire on Kaiphalos's part to show Cathur their queen. Gaia's eyes grew wide. You shall sleep? As you sleep to learn? She faltered. Yes, Croft smiled. And I shall learn, wife of my friend. Zitu made Naya of a fur a maid to madden men's blood, not for Cathur, but for Jasor. Yes, I shall learn. But despite his confident tone, 
He was more than a little disturbed as he sought his own rooms that night and stretched himself on his couch. What intent lurked in the mind of Cathur's prince he could not see. Nor could he understand why, knowing what already he had told them, Jacko and Lacan had decided to accede to the Cathurian's request. Unless they had followed the other man's course at the time of the betrothal, and acted in order to blind suspicion of their counter-preparation so far as they might, or at least to avoid an open rupture at this time. Hence, it appeared doubly important that he should learn what was toward in Cathur now. He focused his mind. His body relaxed. He projected his intelligent ego toward Skira to discover what it might. At first, he went to the cell of Abu, in the Skira pyramid to learn, if he might, what Abu was about. He found him speaking with a brother priest, was half-minded to leave, yet lingered, held by the first remark of the unknown monk. A nice time for Kaiphalos to be at nearer, with his promised queen approaching Skira on the sea. He will return in time to greet her, Abu said. Yet I like not his frequent journeyings to nearer, nor his association with the Zilarian nobles who make it their resort, nor does Cathur like it overly well. Abu frowned. Nor does Cathur like the stories which come back from Anthra concerning the things which occur there in the palace. Adita, they tell me, is more worshipped than Zitu. Gar, the true woman, or Azil, her son, have small consideration. Tis Adita, woman of folly and beauty, whose shrine is there. I have heard said that, while a creature of beauty, this Afurian princess is not given to folly, his lay brother replied. Mayhap she shall win Kaiphalos from his present course, and so prove a blessing to Cathur in cycles to come. If so be she mounts the throne at all. You think she will not? Abu shrugged. Who knows? Cathur mutters even now, as you know. Scythus was a dotard. Kaiphalos is a degenerate. Cathur is the worst governed state in all Tamarizia, the most beset with taxes, with the least returns to show. But Cathur is loyal to Tamarizia as a people. Think you they will long brook a king who makes merry with Zalarian nobles, while affairs of state go to pot? Come, cried the other. You have heard something, Abu, it would seem. Abu nodded. Perhaps I keep my eyes and ears about me when I leave the pyramid. Croft left. At least, he thought, Abu was attending to his duties as a first spy in so far as he might. And Cathur was muttering against their soon-to-be king. Cathur, then, was loyal. What if Kaiphalos found her betrayal less easy than he expected? He smiled and willed himself to nearer, since now it appeared the Cathurian profligate was once more there. And if there, Croft thought he knew where to find him. He would be, almost without doubt, in the presence of Calamita of the tawny eyes and hair. And it was with her and her brother Anzad, the Mazarian chief, he found him, in a room of that palace overlooking the central sea. They sat together in a low-toned conversation. Evidently, something important was forward, since they had closeted themselves thus, thought Croft. Calamita stretched her supple length like a cat about to yawn, and turned a slow smile on the Cathurian prince. So then, she said, it is all thought out. You men, with your spears and swords, are far stronger than subtle, my lords. Leave the subtlety to a woman in your plans. I see no chance of failure in this, I confess, Zad spoke as she paused. Croft noted a flash in his eyes. Not unless you bungle, Calamita laughed. I, Zad growled, by Adita, goddess of beautiful women, I shall make no mistake. See, I shall repeat it step by step. On the fourth day after the princess arrives, Kaiphalos of Cathur invites her and her father to visit Anthra, and they take the ship the next day. 
Meanwhile, I placed my galley under the cover of Anthra and wait. At the same hour they set sail, I slip forth. Midway we meet, and I sail close in passing. A collision seeming imminent. In the confusion, a wrong order is given on board Kyphalos's galley. The prow of my galley strikes his ship as it seeks to cross my bows through turning in the wrong direction. Kyphalos and the maid are saved. Lacon drowns, and any surviving sailors on board the Cathurian ship are destroyed so that none shall survive to tell what happened really. I sail to Skira and put Kyphalos ashore. We tell a story of disaster in which all perished save only him. According to it, this Naya died with her father. I sail away. She is mine, and once in Mazaria, think you I shall not enjoy her beauty? By Adida, I think I shall. Kalamita nodded. You have it, Zad, she declared. And soon you shall have her to do with, as you please. They tell me she is very fair indeed. She should bring you joy for some time. A blind rage, a fiery disgust and loathing filled Croft's soul as he heard the wanton's words. This was the fate her soiled brain had evolved for the pure, sweet jewel of womanhood for whom his spirit cried. Yet, since in his present state there was no chance for expression of those feelings, he controlled his horror at the thought of Naya as the plaything of this cold-faced blue savage, and learned all he could. Thereafter, Bandor spoke for the first time, with a thin-lipped leer. Our good lord Kyphalos shall come to Anthra after a period of mourning and invite our sister to visit him for a time. But upon her desiring to leave, he shall refuse. A man of her ship's crew shall escape Anthra in a boat and bring tidings, whereupon him to whom she is pledged shall lay the affair before the emperor himself. Our army shall be ready, an expedition shall proceed to Anthra to rescue Kalamita. In the meantime, Kyphalos shall have taken her to Cathur and have concealed her, placing her in the sanctuary of Ga, where the Vestals will have her in charge. Then shall Zalaria attack, and Mazer. Tamarizia, finding herself assailed on all sides, shall break like the crushed-in shell of an egg. He contracted the fingers of a mighty hand until they were flexed in his palm. Thus it shall be. Thus it shall be. Would it? Man proposes, but God disposes, Croft thought to himself. Naya of a fur, the toy of a man of blue, a member of the servant's caste nation, Cathur to Zalaria. Tamarizia crushed. Kyphalos and his lighter love on the throne of Zetra, where now the Pacific old Tamis sat. A pretty plan. Zad and Bandor, Kyphalos and Kalamita, in her scented and voluptuous beauty, seemed very sure it was coming about in time. To Croft, as he left them at their scheming and flitted back to his room in a fur's palace, it seemed somewhat less likely to occur. End of chapter 21「Chapter 22 of Palos of the Dog Star Pack This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones Palos of the Dog Star Pack by John Ulrich Giese in the habit of Z2. Once in the flesh again, conscious of all he had seen and heard, he sprang from his couch and dressed. He was going in the flesh to Skira. That one thing was clear in his mind. He would go to the capital of Cathur as quickly as his swiftest motor galley might take him, and get into touch with Abu, and through him with Naya. After that, things must be met as they arose. Only, there was another thing on which he was equally determined. The girl should never embark for Anthra on the Prince of Cathur's craft. Leaving the palace, he entered his car, 
kept in the court now always for any emergency, and drove straight to the dock on the Nar, where the fleet of motorcraft were kept busy. Here he selected a galley, one of the latest models he had prepared, sent runners to rout out the crew and order them aboard, ready to sail at once. From the dock he drove to the shops, flaring with light as the night shift worked, called one of his most expert motor builders to one side, and directed him to report aboard the galley as quickly as he might. To him he gave authority to open a warehouse and provision the boat for a voyage of some days, and instructions to bring it to the quay below the palace so soon as ready to sail. Then he went back to the palace itself, and sent a nodding guard to rouse Robur and ask him to come to Croft's rooms. He waited there in a vast impatience until the door opened to admit a first crown prince. That Robur was keyed to some expectancy he saw at a glance. The man's eyes were wide, his whole expression eager. Croft suspected Gaia had whispered wifely confidences into his ear earlier that night. He plunged into his theme at once. Robe, I've slept. One of my certain sleeps. Gaia told you, I suppose. Robur nodded. Yes, and you have learned, Jasor, what? Croft told him and Robur swore a strong Athurian oath. They plan that, do they? Nigh to Zad, of Man of Mazare? By Zitu, Jasor, I am with you in whatever you mean to do. Croft shook his head. Nay, Robe, my friend, your duty is to Tamarizia first. You know all we have planned. Your place is here, to general the Bithurian expedition when it is time. Mine is the duty to the maid. You love her. Robur made the statement direct. Aye. Croft met it and looked him in the eye. Robur put forth a hand. Azil be kind to you and her, he made answer. What have you planned? Croft explained his intent in a very few words. I await now the lights of the galley at the quay below, he finished. I desire to slip forth unknown to any save the guards. Will you drive me down with what arms I shall take? I said Afur's heir. You can reach Skira how soon? In two days, the day after Naya and Lacon arrive. Robur smiled thinly. Should you save Lacon's life as well as his daughter's a second time, his gratitude should overcome much. Croft shook his head. I plan not on gratitude, Robe. I myself shall overcome much. Kyphalos, Zolaria, and Mazare. So shall I reach to the woman Zitu formed for me. I shall enter Skira at night and go to the pyramid, and hold. Drive now with me to Mager. He must lend me a priestly robe. Come, Robur's eyes flashed. Once more he smiled. A priest shall reach Skira, my friend. He shall go to the pyramid, I understand. The two men left the palace, entered the car and crossed the bridge, swung into position on Robur's order. They stopped before the pyramid and hammered on the door. A sleepy priest admitted them at last and sent them up on the primitive lift to Mager's lofty apartments. Mager himself appeared in the end, blinking sleepily with startled eyes when he faced Croft and Robur himself. Croft explained. Mager balked. Shall the garments of Zitu be used for deception? He exclaimed. Shall not the garments of Zitu serve to guard a clean shrine of life from pollution? Croft snapped in return. Can the cloth of the source of all life be put to better end? Mager gave him a glance little short of admiration. Ye speak, as always, with the words of Zitu himself he returned. I am convinced. Wait, and this matter shall be arranged. He turned away. In five minutes he was back with a dark brown robe and hood, not unlike a cowl, also a pair of leather sandals and a cord with which to belt the robe about the waist. These he placed in Croft's hands and raised his own. Zitu, go with ye, my son, he spoke in a formal blessing. 
Should he favour ye on this mission, what shall ye do with the maid? Her return to Himira would cause a clacking of tongues. I have thought of that, Omega, Croft replied. The maid shall go to Zetra so quickly as she may. There, Zood himself shall see her in sanctuary in the quarters of the virgins, until this thing has passed, unless you have better to suggest. Thus, it is Zelaria plans to hide their unclean calamita in Skira. I am minded to turn their own trick upon themselves. Nay, Mega smiled, thy plan is worthy of one of your mind. Go then, and may Gar, the pure mother, use you to guard the maid. The galley lights glared red in the night at the quay as Croft and Rober drove back across the bridge which opened behind them, span by span. All was now ready save the arms and ammunition. Working in haste at the palace, the prince and Croft collected those and took them down to the ship. You shall win, my friend, said Rober as he clasped hands with Croft at parting. Croft smiled somewhat grimly. I shall win, Robe, he returned, or you need not look for me back. Then he was off, dropping down the Nar, passing the high reared barrier of the walls, and once past those, opening the motor and speeding down the mighty yellow flood to the sea. A day passed, two days, and night came down. Far to the front, the lights of Skira lifted above the waters. Croft called his crew and gave them their instructions in detail. They were to stay by the ship, were to be ready to start at once. Then, to their amaze, he slipped on the priest's robe over his cuirass and sword and appeared before them thus as they approached the harbour gates. The standard of a fur broke out at the galley's stern. They passed inside unchallenged and moored at the quay. To the harbour master, a huge Cathurian captain, Croft said merely that he was a priest come on a mission from Magur to the pyramid and stepped ashore. And knowing Skir as he did, he set off in the right direction without delay, arrived in due time and without incident at the pyramid portals and rapped for admission, asking for Abu as soon as he was inside. Then he was in Abu's cell fumbling with his robe and casting it from him, to stand in gold and silver harness before the monk's staring eyes. My lord, my lord, faltered the priest. Hold, Croft lifted his hand. Strange things are forward in Skira. What know you of them, Abu, who have acted as a fur's eyes? Yesterday the prince returned from Nera to greet the Afurian maid he is to wed, Abu replied. It was a holiday occasion. The streets swarmed with people. Think you Kaiphalos intends to lead Nia to the throne? Croft snapped. Zitu! Abu lifted his hands in the sign of the cross. Is it not so pledged, Jesor? Aye, by the lips, yet not by the heart, said Croft. Swiftly, he told the staring monk those things he had learned. Zitu would not permit this, Abu mumbled at the last. Nay, hence I am here. Listen, Abu the priest, what I do, I do by the grace of Zitu, and with his consent. I am come to overthrow this most foul plot. You who have sworn to help me in Zitu's name must gain access to this maid. Say to her what is to be. Say to her thus, when you have told her all else as a sign. Jasor has not forgotten. Hearing this, she will believe. Say to her then that, on the night after you have spoken to her, she shall desire to speak with a priest from the Holy Pyramid to receive a blessing before she is presented to Cthur's people. She shall prefer her request of Kaiphalos himself and insist that it be granted. She shall specify the priest Abu, whom she knows. I shall then go to her in the palace. Instruct her that her father shall be with her when I arrive. Thereafter shall we contrive a way out of the palace and to the boat I hold waiting for her escape. Say not to her that I shall come in your place. That she will learn when I appear. Now, give me a place to sleep, 
and when you see her, state these facts concerning Kyphalos's plan as things of your own knowledge, confessing to her that you have acted as a fur's eyes for well nigh a whole cycle past. Abu bowed. Indeed, he said. I believe you speak truth, O Jesor, and with Zitu's help I shall do all you say. Take my pallet for your slumber. I shall pray through the night for your success to Zitu himself. Throughout the next day, Croft lay hid. Abu brought him food in the morning and disappeared. He was not disturbed during the day. What Abu was about, he could not know. Only late in the day when the monk returned was he to learn how he had managed his task. My lord, there was a pageant in honour of her, of Afur and her father, he explained. The civic guard and that of the palace marched before them, while the people watched, and you know that it is a custom for the lay brothers of the pyramid to solicit arms. So, with my little earthen jar, I passed among the people, and after a time I approached the raised station where a first princess sat, and lifting my little jar, I cried to her as Cathar's queen to be, that she give freely to Cathar's temple. This I did for a purpose which fell out as I desired. A guard about the noble party angrily bade me be off. I lifted my voice in protest, crying again to that beautiful woman for arms. She heard me, my lord. She has a gentle heart. Hold, said she to the guard. Let the priest approach. Thus, my lord, I gained her side, and she gave me pieces of silver enough to fill my jar, compelling all her party to contribute freely. And when that had been done, she asked me of our temple, and I told her concerning it, and called a blessing upon her, and contrived to whisper that I had an important message meant for her ears alone. The maid, my lord, is quick of comprehension. She turned to the prince himself. This priest finds favour with me, she said. I would speak with him further. It may be that I shall select him for my own spiritual instructor once I am Cathar's queen. Kaiphalos smiled, my lord. As you will, my princess, he replied, and I think he suspected nothing. Then the maid turned back to me and set a time for me to come to her at the palace on the morrow in the morning. Is it well, my lord? It is well, said Croft though the delay of another day did not please his impatience to know Naya safe. Yet there is more for you to do. Provide me a second robe, such as Mago gave me, which I wore here, and arrange for a carriage to be waiting tomorrow night on the street from the palace to the harbour. Do this in time that I may know the driver's name when I shall come upon him, and so calling him, identify myself as the man for whom he is employed. Here. He drew a pouch and placed silver in Abu's hand. Pay the man well, and tell him to look for as much beyond what you give him if he serves me without fail. Also, provide me a standard of Cathar's colours, such as I used on ships. The latter request was due to a sudden thought which had popped into Croft's mind, and evoked a tight-lipped smile. He had conceived a way to throw consternation into the camp of his foes. He set about planning it out that same night and the succeeding day. End of chapter 22